I would like to call the meeting to order. Um, perhaps we'll start first with our Indigenous land acknowledgement. Uh, actually, Aretha, did you want to go over some of the particulars first? Oh, sorry. And maybe before I turn it over to Aretha, maybe I'll more formally introduce her. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud and want to take this opportunity to introduce to Council Aretha Adams, though she really needs no introduction. Aretha will be clerking the Regional Council me meeting while Catherine is in the Interim Commissioner of Corporate Services role. Aretha joined the region in 2011. Her home position is Manager of Access to Information and Privacy. Some of you may know Aretha from her, role, from her work in that role and her presentation on privacy during council orientation. You may also recall that council appointed her as a deputy clerk in April 2018. She is currently in the role of Acting Director of Clerks. Aretha, welcome, and I really look forward to working with you in this role. And with that, Aretha, why don't you introduce yourself and go through some of the protocols that we will be following for this COVID-related meeting. Thank you, Chair Anika, and good morning, everyone. We have been having electronic participation meetings for a few months now. So I'm going to provide a shortened review of the protocols for electronic participation in this regular council meeting. With the increase in public gathering limits, the gradual reopening, reopening of facilities, and the recent amendment to the procedural bylaw that allows for electronic participation, members of council now have the option to participate either in person or electronically, subject to occupancy limits in the council chambers and the masking bylaw. This meeting is being streamed live, both audio and video, from the Region of Peel website. Some members are participating in this meeting electronically, and some members are present in the chambers. In-person attendees will be identified at roll call. If participating electronically for an optimum meeting experience, we ask that you please take the necessary precautions to avoid feedback, interference, and confusion with members speaking over one another. The recommended WebEx meeting display view is active speaker thumbnail video view. So you will have a full view of the presentation slides and other meeting materials. During the presentations, the slides will be visible on your screens. If you have difficulty viewing the slides, a copy of the slides were provided to you prior to the start of today's meeting. If you are experiencing a poor Wi-Fi connection, please disable your video. If you drop off the meeting, please rejoin, and if you have technical difficulties, please contact your local IT department first for assistance, following the same process as you do for your local council meeting. As required, your local IT department will reach out to regional IT staff for further assistance. Because of the nature of this hybrid meeting and to ensure equitable participation for members attending both in person and electronically, the request to speak system in chambers will not be used. Instead, if you are attending in person and wish to speak, please raise your hand physically and you will be added to the speakers list. If you are participating electronically and wish to speak, please raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon located to the right of your name in the participant list. Your hand icon will turn blue when engaged. Members who connect to the meeting via the dial-in dial option can send an email to council at peelregion.ca and you will be added to the speakers list. Clerk staff will manage the speakers list and provide the chair with the names of members wishing to speak. If participating in chambers, when called upon, please press the speak button to unmute your microphone and proceed. When you've concluded your comment or question, please mute your microphone by pressing the speak button again. If participating electronically when called upon, please unmute your microphone and proceed. When you have concluded your comment or question, please mute your microphone and lower your hand by pressing the blue hand icon to the right of your name in the participant list. Voting will be conducted verbally. For procedural votes, that do not require a recorded vote, I will call for any objections. If you have an objection, please unmute your microphone and indicate your name and objection. If no objections are stated, the motion will be deemed to be adopted. For recorded votes, I will call upon each member in alphabetical order based on last name. 
Once called upon, please unmute your microphone and indicate your yes or no vote. I will confirm the vote for each member. If you do not respond when called upon to vote, I will call your name a second time. If you do not respond to the second call, you will be recorded as abstaining from the vote and your vote will count in the negative as a nay vote. If you are participating electronically and are leaving the meeting, please send an email to council at peelregion.ca to indicate that you are leaving the meeting. If you leave the meeting for any votes thereafter, you will be marked absent. We have two delegations on the agenda this morning. Delegates, when you are called upon, please unmute your microphone and begin your deputation. At the end of your presentation, please mute your microphone. If there are any questions, they will be directed through the chair. Please unmute your microphone to answer any questions. And mute your microphone once you've completed your answer. We shall now commence the meeting with roll call. Mayor Brown? I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Carlson is present in chambers. Thank you. Mayor Crombie? Present. Thank you. Councillor DeMurlo? Present. Thank you. Councillor Dasco? Hi there. Present. Thank you. Councillor Dillon? Here. Thank you. Councillor Downey? Present. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Fonseca? Good morning, here. Thank you, good morning. Councillor Fortini? Councillor Fortini? Councillor Groves? Present. Thank you. Councillor Innes? Present. Thank you. Councillor Kovac. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning, thank you. Councillor Mahoney. Good morning, present. Thank you, good morning. Councillor McFadden. Good morning, everyone, present. Good morning, thank you. Councillor Medeiros. Here. Thank you. Councillor Pileshi. Good morning, present. Thank you. Councillor Parrish, here in chambers, thank you. Councillor Raz? Here. Thank you. Councillor Sato? Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor uh, Santos? Good morning. Good morning, thank you. <coughs> Councillor Sinclair? Present. Thank you. Councillor Starr? Present. Thank you. Mayor Thompson? Present. Thank you. Councillor Vicente. I'm here. Thank you. Madam Clerk, thank you. And now we'll have the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. Thank you. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather and which the region of Peel operates is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, indigenous peoples inhabited and cared for this land. In particular, we acknowledge the territory of the Shinanabek, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples. Land that is also home to the Métis and most recently the territory of the Mississaugas of the First Credit Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land and by doing so give respect to its first inhabitants. Um, other piece of business that I want to deal with, I really want to acknowledge and thank Councillor Parrish and Councillor Carlson for making the effort to be here in person along with uh, our acting uh, Commissioner Catherine Locklear, um, the acting CAO Nancy Polzinelli, and uh, our Commissioner as well. Granger, Kathy Granger, but you're not at your name. That's what threw me because we're social distancing. <laughs> and we are appropriately, though you may not see us on the screen, we're all trying to keep appropriately apart. I, when I'm not speaking, which is far too often around this table, will try to keep my mask on as well. And one other point of information for my colleagues and for the public at large, um, when we dealt with the issue of putting up screens in this uh, in this body in this building in our council chamber. Um, we dealt with it on the 24th of June, I believe. Later that day, we ordered the screens on the very same day. And I've been following up on it, and I, I regret to inform you the challenge that we've had is 
the plexiglass that we've ordered that's custom cut and only takes a day to install got caught up in the Montreal Shoreman's strike. So it's sitting on the dock in Montreal and we haven't been able to get it because of the strike that you may have heard of. Uh, we're anxious for it to arrive because it's all custom cut and fit so it's not an arduous exercise to put it in place. We would certainly hope to have it in place for the next council meeting. So I wanted to deal with that bit of business and just one more before I go to declarations of conflict of interest and, and a really good news story regarding our own Peter Dundas. I would like to share some wonderful news with members of Peel Regional Council regarding our own Peter Dundas, Director in Chief of Peel Paramedic Services, who has been elected by his peers as President of the Ontario Association of Paramedics Chiefs. He will serve for the next two years in this very prestigious role. The Ontario Association of Paramedic Chiefs is a leading voice in the emergency services community and represents leadership from 52 designated delivery agents across Ontario who oversee 8,500 paramedics. On behalf of Regional Council, I would like to congratulate Chief Dundas on this important and well-deserved appointment. He has 40 years of experience in paramedic services. 18 of those years has been as the Chief here in Peel. In that time, he has been a strong advocate for paramedics and those they serve. Congratulations, Chief Dundas. And how apropos I get to read this today because in the weekend press, I don't know if any of you saw it, a paramedic in London, England gave a piece on what it's like to be a paramedic today. And it is God awful what they have to deal with under the best of circumstances. And it really brings to light the great work that our paramedics do. So Peter, you should be very proud of that team as are all of us. Okay, that brings me to declarations of conflict of interest. Are there any declarations of conflict of interest? Seeing none. Approval of the minutes from the July 23rd, 2020 Regional Council meeting. I have a motion moved by Councillors Parrish and, and Councillors Carlson that that be approved. All those in favor? Seeing none in, uh, opposed, that is carried. And I will now turn to the approval of the agenda. On to our, con uh, are there any, do I need a motion for the consent agenda? Or go right into consent, I think. Let's approve the agenda again from Councillor Parrish and Councillor Carlson. And there's one amended item with regards to official plan amendment 34 to be dealt with under bylaw item 23.2. And further that the agenda for the September 10, 2020 Regional Council meeting be approved as amended. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Very good. Let's get to the consent agenda. We have a couple of deputations. We have presentations on COVID from staff, which brings us to communications under number 9. 9.1. Is there any request that it be held? 9.2, 9.3, also on consent, 9.4, on consent, 9.5, 9 9.6, 9.7, 9.8, 9.9, 9.10, also on consent, 9.11, 9.12, 9.13, 9 and 9.14. Uh, item 10.1 is the staff presentation that we will deal with uh, when we are dealing with the deputations, so I'm sure we'll be receiving and dealing with that. Under items 11, items related to human services, 11.1, .1, do I have consent? 11.2. Uh, hold. Asked to be held. Is that Councillor Vicente? Yes. Very good. To be held. Uh, communications item 12, none 13. Items related to planning and growth management. Item 13.1. On consent, 13.2. 13.1. Oh, well, the clerk's just reminding me with regards to 13.1. Yes. Um, and I, actually, we have to deal with it because we need a resolution coming out of it. So my apologies. No, no we that do can go on consent. That can go on the consent. Okay, so if everybody's satisfied, I'm happy to have it go on consent. Okay, the clerk is confirming that. Very good. Thank you. 13.2. Also on consent. 13.3. On consent. 13.4. On consent. Very good. Uh, 14, no communications. Items 15, items related to enterprise programs and services. 15.1, budget policy and reserve management. 
on consent, 15.2 vacant and excess land subclass reduction. On consent, 15.3, bold, asked to be held by Mayor Thompson, 15.4. On consent, and kudos to Chair Parrish and the very good meeting we had with regards to policies and procedures on a lot of those issues, uh, very well done. 15.5. On consent, 15.6. We need consent, to hold that? 15.6 to be held. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Oh, sorry. Okay, so we're clear for 15, 4, 5, and 6. All on consent other than 15, 3. Moving on, 16, communications item 16.1 to be held. Yes, Councillor Parrish, thank you. 16.2. On consent, though, I can't let the opportunity pass to say I, I did read Moody's report on our credit rating, and what an excellent report that speaks to the marvelous work the team here is doing under very challenging times and how much faith they have in the future of Peel. Just the front page synopsis of that report is, I'm just so proud on behalf of staff and the team here, we run a pretty good enterprise. So well done and our thanks to Moody's on that. Received on consent. 17, items related to public works. 17.1. On consent. 17.2. A hold. Asked to be held. 17.2. Was that Councillor Sinclair? Star. Councillor Starr, sorry, Ron, you sit next to him. Okay, thank you. 17.3, water meter hardware installation. Is that on consent? Thank you. 17.4, on consent. 18, communications item, 18.1, message from Metrolinx. On consent, 18.2. On consent, 18.3. 18.4, 18.5, and 18.6, all on consent. Thank you. Items related to health, 19.1, Peel Regional Paramedic Ambulance Service Review and Certification, on consent. Communication items, 20.1, on consent, 20.2. On consent, 21, other business council inquiries, 21, one. Summary note, new amendments to the land need assessment methodology for places to grow. On consent, 22 notices of motion. Um, and I know we're dealing with 22, two directly. Waving of Sir Councillor Groves, you're going to want to speak to 22, one. I'm, I'm thinking that's a request to hold, just to be clear, 22.1, would we like it held? If not, on consent, 22.2 is being dealt with, and then we're down to the bylaws, et cetera. Okay, very good. So, Madam Clerk, I need a motion now for the consent agenda. Oh, sorry, yes, the camera items. No, sorry, let me just, one more item, then I'll acknowledge it. I, I assumed um, we'd be going directly into camera, but of course there may be items that we don't need to deal with and staff can get back to work. So let's deal with the in-camera matters and see what can be dealt with on consent. 24.1 is the approval of the uh, previous minutes. Uh, 24 point, which I'm assuming is on consent. Very good. 24.2. On consent, 24.3. On consent, 24.4. Ian Sinclair, hold. Holds 24.4. Thank you, Ian. 24.5. On consent, and 24.6. Also on consent. So staff can get back to work other than knowing we're going to want some information on 24.4. Okay, with that, Aretha, do you have a motion for me dealing with... Mr. What Chair, is really quickly... Is there an inquiry? Go ahead. I'm, I'm My not apologies. sure. What... Mr. Chair, 17.4, uh, the detailed design. I don't need to hold it. It's not Ward 6, if that can be changed. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. So you're just a point of correction. Item 17.4, under items related to public works, it is in fact not Ward 6 in the city of Brampton. Can somebody shout out while I'm at it what it should have read? Councillor Pelesh? I think it's 1 in 5. Um, one it is 4 in 5, yes. Okay, there we are. Uh, thank you for the correction, but does not need to be held on consent. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do I have a motion to deal with what was dealt with on consent? I need a mover and a seconder. So moved by Councillor Pelleshi. I see Councillor Starr's hand as a seconder. All in favor of the consent agenda. 
Hearing no objections, it's a, that is it's carried. It's a recorded vote. Sorry. Oh, a recorded vote through the clerk. My apologies. Yes. The motion that the following matters listed on the September 10th, 2020 Regional Council agenda be approved under the, be approved under the consent agenda items. And I'll call the vote. Mayor Brown? Yes. Mayor Brown in favor. <laughs> Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie? Mayor Crombie? Oh, sorry, yes. Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor DeMurla? Yes. Councillor DeMurla in favor. Councillor Dasco? Yes. Councillor Dasco in favor. Councillor Dillon? Councillor Dillon? Councillor Downey? In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca? Yes, in favor. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini? Yes, in favor. Councillor Fortini in favor. Councillor Groves? Yes. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes? Yes. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac? In, in favor. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney? Yes. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden? In favor. Thank you, Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi? Yes. Councillor Pileshi in favor. Councillor Parrish? Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz? Yes. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. <coughs> Councillor Sinclair? In favor. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr? In favor. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson? In favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente? In favor. Councillor Vicente in favor. It carries. Very good, Madam Clerk. The consent agenda carries. That brings us to delegations. The first item I have under delegations 7.1, Ivana Kluza-Shimko and Anthea Tagadu, members of the Applewood Hills and Heights Residents Committee, Applewood Hills and Heights Residents Association, regarding the rat infestation problem in the Applewood area of Mississauga and the region of Peel and related items that I think we should bring forward and deal with at this time, related items 10.1, and my motion is 22.2 from, uh, from Councillor Fonseca, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge before we go to our deputants two things. Number one, um, the remarkable amount of work and effort that Councillor Fonseca has brought through on this file. Uh, that's even involved me at times, much of the staff here, the community. It was a busy summer for everybody because of the leadership Councillor Fonseca has shown on the file. And we've had a couple of sessions with the residents, and I'm glad they're here to delegate further. I am going to suggest that after the deputants have spoken, that we have our staff presentation at that time as well. I believe Anthony Parente is, is ready to give us an update on the file because staff, I see, has done a great deal of work after which time we can open it up to questions and discussions. Of course, if you have questions or clarification from the deputants as they're speaking, I will allow that. And my last point is I remind everybody and our deputants that we have a five minute time limit on your presentations. So with that, I welcome Ivana Kluza Shimko and Anthea Tagadu to speak. Ivana and Athena, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Athena, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you sound clear, but very faint. So we need a little more volume from you, if that's possible. Okay. Um, How is it now? Is it better? I, I think that's a little better, but I still see some head shaking that it's still not ideal. Still Mr. Chair, there's also an echo. Yeah, perhaps some people who otherwise are not speaking, if I could ensure that only Athena 
has her mic on and everybody else is muted because that tends to help a little bit because as Councillor Fonseca said, I was hearing an echo as well. So um, Athena, I, I hope you've done all you can. I'm going to turn it over to you and please proceed. Oh, and staff here advised me that she may have just dropped off of the meeting. So let's give Athena a moment to come back. Athena, have you rejoined us? And I do have clerks monitoring it, and they still can't acknowledge that she is back yet. Mr. Chair, happy to move that we go on to the next delegation and come back. Hello, um, I am here. Can you hear me? Oh, there, Athena, you're welcome back, and you sound bright and clear, so this is perfect. I'm so Thank sorry. you. It's no, not I not at all. I was, I'm so sorry. I thought that I my mute was um, accessed by you, not by me. I did not realize oh. that I had to be mute. Well, I'm so sorry. Well, two good things. Welcome back. And number two, you sound crisp and clear and loud now. <laughs> Athena, please proceed. Thank you. Sorry about that. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Mayor Crombie, Mayor Brown, Mayor Thompson, all councillors and attendees. The Applewood Hills and Heights Residents Association is a ratepayers group registered with the City of Mississauga's Community Groups Program. As with all such homeowner groups, our common goals are to work together for the best interests of our members and residents on issues that impact our daily life and well-being and the enjoyment of our homes and properties within our designated boundaries. The Applewood Association is in the central east area of Mississauga with boundaries being west of Dixie to Cothra and from Burnhamthorpe south to Dundas. What has brought us here today? In late May 2020, a member of the Applewood Association addressed her ongoing concerns about rat sightings on her property on Avernia Road in the Applewood Hills area of Mississauga. After her efforts in addressing this ongoing rat issue with staff from the Regents Department of Health, City as, City's Animal Services and the Counselor's Office, unfortunately she was being redirected from one office to another and in her frustration came to the Applewood Association feeling desperate and asking if there were other members who were also experiencing rat problems on their properties. Upon learning this, an email was sent to the Applewood email group, bringing awareness of this problem to all members, as well as asking for members to reply if they too are experiencing the same rat problem. Within two days after this one email, 24 other residents replied expressing the same ongoing rat concerns for several years. Similarly, more residents stated that they too had contacted the city, the region of Peel, and they were told that nothing could be done for, their, for this particular issue. They were advised to follow certain guidelines, maintain their properties in good, clean order, and nothing could be done further for them as this was rat infestation on their own property. After learning this on June the 4th, an email was sent by the AS Applewood Association to Director Louise Aubin outlining the above concerns and asking for action to be taken by the region of Peel to address and resolve this rat infestation problem for the Applewood residents. In this letter, it was also stated that the problem of rat infestation began in the Applewood area when the region of Peel's Hanland water project started at Lakeshore and Dixie going north to Eastgate. And when it reached the Applewood area, Acres area, which is just east of, uh, just west of the this Dixie Lake, Lakeshore, Dixie Road. This is when the problem started in Applewood Acres, then to Applewood Hills and Heights, which is just north of Applewood Acres, which was around 2015, when the first sightings of these rats began for these communities. In addition to this, other construction projects followed in this area on Flagship Drive in 2018, Bloor Street, there were two construction projects in 2019 and other um, projects which were brought to the attention of uh, Director Aubin. From our understanding, the region and the city 
did not use any pre-baiting measures or did not have them in place in order to address um, the rat uh, problem of you know, spreading into the community. And pre-baiting measures were not taken for any of these construction projects that have been noted. And most recently, a notice was received uh, by residents on Bloor Street that another construction project is beginning around September 22nd. And the question is, have pre-baiting measures been taken for this particular project by the city of Mississauga? Athena, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the clerk's made it clear. We need to be clear on how we keep revolving the slides. So to the clerks, to, we wish her to acknowledge when the slide needs to be changed and we will do it for you. So Athena, with that, at the appropriate time, if you would say change slide or tell us which slide we will be looking at, we will facilitate that here. Sorry, I should have said that at the outset. Please proceed. Yes, if you can please go to the next slide and just gradually move the slides. The slides, as you will see, are photos which have been sent to the association by residents who have caught rats uh, for the past two, three years. And these are the photos of the dead rats. Unfortunately, I'm sorry about this, but the site is not that wonderful of the pictures you will be viewing. It's only because um, we felt this is very important for everyone to understand the impact this is having on the community. You know, there's now over 70 people who are affected by rats in this area. Um, a number which started with one or two, then to 24, has now increased to over 70 people who are experiencing rat issues. And this is a common sight for many residents, for most that is, seeing these rats and having to kill them and dispose of them. So this is a real concern for our community. And so please, you can go on to the next slides um, that show um, the rats that have been caught. And there's a small also explanation of the date and the street that the, the rats have been found on. So as we progress, and the, uh, you can maybe keep them there for just uh, a minute or so as you go through. And the very last slide is the one that uh, addresses moving forward. So please do show the slides because it's important, I believe, for, um, for everyone to see these slides and what the residents are actually seeing when they, what, and what they have to deal with. All right, so it was confirmed. Um, I will continue now with, uh, and it also was confirmed by animal and pest control companies that when there's construction in the area, rats are more likely to be displaced. And as a result of this displacement, rats are looking for new areas to borrow, breed, and to multiply, which is exactly what has happened in our uh, and the Applewood areas uh, identified. Now, on June the 8th, a reply was received from Director Aubin, which included information on how to stop rat the infestation in our properties. And um, there was a commitment made to us However, it did not address how the residents would receive immediate support for the rat problems they were and are continuing to have. Um, further to this, email communication happened with Mr. Hennings, who spoke with Hawkeye Animal and Pest Control for a questionnaire to be completed by impacted residents, which would be followed up by uh, inspection and um, interviewing with the residents who were impacted, and then from then, steps will be taken to address the issues on their properties. However, for some reason, this whole um, process changed, and then we were told that we would not follow this process, that it would be a change for some reason. So this is what we then accepted. However, we were um, persistent and addressed it on several occasions that we needed answers. We needed something to be done so people would not be in the position to constantly have to catch these rats and, um, and be in this position of, of all the summer because it was a very difficult summer with COVID and having to deal with this even made it more difficult. Now, um, what happened after that was that the association asked Director Aubin and Ward 3 Councilor Fonseca for a meeting for the community to speak with them and to address this problem in a meeting forum um, and how, what can be done and how it will be done so the impacted residents will see, receive relief on this constant problem happening in the community. This virtual meeting was held on August the 11th, and uh, we had asked for this meeting to, to an announcement to be made on what action will be taken. However, at the meeting, and unfortunately, there was no action um, that was presented, um, but we were told that today's uh, presentation with a motion would be made by Councillor Fonseca, uh, which would be seconded by uh, Councillor Dasco, who is the Council for Ward 1, where Applewood Acres is located, 
we Applewood Hills and Heights are in Ward 3, and we were, you know, very grateful that this opportunity is made available to us to address this issue. And we really look forward to moving forward on this matter. And we really look forward to having immediate relief available to the residents who are definitely being affected by this problem. And as you will see from the photos, and one of the slides shows some of the holes there are. I personally visited this resident's home on Schaumburg Avenue, and there are seven holes on her property, such as those, that just every time she fills them in, they just keep on popping up somewhere else. And there were two of those soles which were on her property. And Schaumburg Avenue is just north of Bloor Street and Cawthor area, where there was a lot of construction with the Silverthorne uh, water project that has been happening there for a few years now. Okay, this ends my part, and I will continue later. However, Ivana will continue from this point. Thank you, please proceed. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chair, Mayor Crombie, Mayor Brown, Mayor Thompson, all councillors and attendees. My name is Ivana Kuzashenko, and I'll be continuing this presentation by further discussing the rat problem. And please do let me know if you're having trouble hearing me. But you sound quite good. Go ahead. Thank you. So as Athena, um, as Athena has indicated, what started with 24 households affected by the rats on their properties um, in June of 2020, this number has increased to um, 74 households by August 11th meeting who came forward with the rat infestation on their properties. These residents feel that if the region of Peel and the city of Mississauga had acted with diligence and promptness as early as 2015, this infestation would not have been widespread as widespread as it is, and it still pertains um, and is impacting the residents and the property owners in Applewood. And at least of the identified um, owners, it is important to note that there's um, a minimum of 20 um, affected residents who are seniors. And so telling them that they are to dig into their savings and pay for those exterminations um, of these rats <clears throat> on their own, it, it's quite impossible and wrong. And so this option is not acceptable. If the region of Peel and the city of Mississauga have the authority to through their negligence of allowing construction projects to take place with no measures in place to address these release of rats into the private properties, where for years we have never experienced a rat problem, then the region of Peel and the city must have the responsibility to also clear those rats from those same properties without delay. The region of Peel cannot do one thing, which is socially unacceptable, and then wash their hands off by stating, and I quote, we do not have the authority to deal with private properties, end quote, as one of the senior residents was told when they called into support for support into the region. So upon further research conducted into this rat infestation that we're having, we've, we've learned the following. So we know that the city of Mississauga is the second largest rat infested city in Ontario after city of Toronto. From 2017 to about August 8th, 2020, 294 recorded rat complaints have been made to the region's health department. Um, note that this amount is not the actual amount of the calls made into 311 by the residents because many residents may have been redirected to other departments and the record is not provided in that amount of number. The first media story that we know of a rat infestation for the area was in Apple in Mississauga's Ward 1 on December 15th, 2015. And then more media coverage was made in 2017, 18, 19, and then 2020. On October 17, 2018, an opinion letter by Applewood resident addressed to Mayor Crombie was printed in the Mississauga News urging for action to be taken for this ongoing rat problem. And then to date, we have not seen any real action being taken by the region of Peel, nor the municipalities for this real and ongoing problem that we're having. So this rat infestation has only grown and spread and continues to remain in our backyards and on our streets with rats searching for food and water and burrowing wherever possible at any time of the day, be it day, um, late evening, or uh, into the night. And so this past spring and summer, some residents have caught up to three rats per day. I also have heard in my neighborhood six rats per day. Another resident on flagship um, has caught over 100 rats in the past two years. Another one, 30 rats in the summer of 2019. Me personally, I can tell 
all of you that I no longer enjoy retreating into my backyard with my family and my two small children because having seen and caught numerous rats in our backyard, it's disgusting and it's quite frankly disturbing to experience this. <clears throat> and it has definitely left a negative imprint on all of us. So we, the impacted residents in the Applewood Hills and the Heights um, and Acres communities need your immediate support and are asking um, for support in dealing with this rat infestation problem. Um, not only is this a problem in Mississauga's East Area, but it's also a growing problem in other areas of construction and development, such as in Mississauga central downtown areas, as well as the Northwest part of Mississauga, as were identified in Dr. Lowe's presentation. So where the greatest number of calls uh, which were placed into the region were also found. Councillor Fonseca's motion, seconded by um, Councillor Vasco, and item 12.2 on today's agenda is greatly appreciated, immensely appreciated, and hopefully it will be supported by you today. And so in summary, what was made known to the AHHRA in late May of this year from one resident's rat problem on her property has really resulted and grown for over 74 that we know of, and it's absolutely increasing. Um, we have come forward from the Apple area. Um, those 74 or over that we know of that have come and, and, and notified um, of the rat problem, surely there are many more, I know that, in my neighborhood, we have individuals that have not come forward that I have spoken to. Um, and for some reason, people are not voicing their experiences, whether it be language barrier or um, intimidation. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much to Ivana and Athena. And a couple of things. First of all, I was remiss in not acknowledging also the work that Councillor Dasko has on, done on the file. But more importantly, Ivana and Athena, to you, the Applewood Hills, Applewood Heights, and our friends in Applewood Acres, I, I mentioned the work the staff and the councillors have done as paid public servants. Let me acknowledge all the great work your Ratepayers Association have done as volunteers on behalf of your community. I should have acknowledged that as well, and I'm happy to do so for the great work you've done as volunteers on behalf of your communities. With that, I will now go to Anthony Parente for a staff presentation and report of what has transpired and the state of affairs, and then I will open it up to questions. Anthony. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, members of Regional Council. Um, I'm Anthony Parente, Acting General Manager, Water Wastewater. I'm here with my colleague, Luis Aubin, Director of Health Protection, Peel Health. And we're here to give you an update on rodents in Peel and the measures that staff from Public Works, Water and Wastewater Divisions, Waste Management, and Public Health have taken to address the community concerns. These concerns have, of course, been heightened recently in Councillor Fonseca's Ward 3 in the Applewood area where there are currently five active water and wastewater construction projects. So in response to the concern, staff retained a pest controlled company to complete resident surveys in the area. This work was done in consultation with the community group. Staff also retained an urban rodentologist from the US to assist with assessment of the surveys and provide recommendations to staff and advice to the community. Additionally, a virtual public meeting was held with residents on August 11th. Staff, including Public Works, Public Health, and retained consultants provided an, updated, provided an update on our efforts. I'd like to add at this point that pest control and monitoring have been standard practice on major Public Works water and wastewater facilities for many years. We have not experienced a major infestation problem on water and wastewater facilities or construction projects. Specific to Applewood area in Ward 3, pest control companies have been retained to install traps on public works construction sites. Capital Works staff are working with the companies to monitor for rodent activity. For the five projects where traps have been installed, no rodents have been observed and are trapped to date. Enhanced cleaning and weekly monitoring of construction sites is also taking place. We will be starting additional pest control at construction sites in other word, wards sorry, where complaints have been received. Furthermore, Public Works is developing a standard for all construction projects in consultation with subject matter experts to, where possible, place traps prior to and after construction to observe potential changes. Public Works Waste Management has also been assisting with this issue. 
In the Applewood area, waste management addressed approximately 14 homes that set out bulky items before their collection day. Waste bylaw officers issued notices for open garbage container lids and a few locations that had missing lids or messy enclosures within multi-residential units. Peel Waste Management also monitors for overflowing public litter containers and excess curbside garbage across the region. In addition to Peel Waste Management measures, the City of Mississauga Parks Department also services 3,600 garbage and recycling units seven days a week. A capital investment is already in place for new receptacles. I would like now to have my colleague Louise Aubin give an update from Peel Public Health perspective. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, we can't hear Louise. Can you hear me now, Mr. Fonseca? Louise, is that you? Can you try again? I think you're coming through. Try again, please. Can you hear me now? That's it. Please proceed. Thank you. Good morning, members of council and representatives of the Applewood Hills and Heights Residents Association. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Peel Public Health, in response to uh, rodent complaints from residents, inspects private property for evidence of rats. We also inspect uh, food premises such as restaurants and grocery stores and enforce the pest control right provisions of the Ontario Food Regulations. It's important to note that if there are rats, there are a source of food in Harbour Ridge. In order to prevent rats, the source of food and water must be eliminated. In responding to a, a rat complaint on private property, a public health inspector does a site visit. Both the property itself and the surrounding land uses are looked at. As part of the site visit, a public health inspector provides education and advice to the resident of that property, but also to surrounding properties. The education is focused on dealing with uh, preventing rats, including removing food sources and areas where the rats may reproduce, as well as um, messaging that rodent control is the responsibility of the homeowner. As well, if necessary, the inspector uh, will refer the property to the local municipal uh, property standards and bylaw staff. As was noted in the presentations earlier, uh, between 2017 and as of August uh, 8, 2020, Peel Public Health has received 294 rat-related complaints in residential settings. Uh, this breaks down to 138 complaints in Brampton, 10 complaints in Caledon, and 146 complaints in Mississauga. And the numbers varied from year to year. For example, in Mississauga, there was a high of 94 complaints in 2018 and a low of 54 complaints in 2019. So far this year, we've received 74 complaints in Mississauga. While rats can transmit diseases to humans, the incidence of reportable um, rat-related illnesses in Peel are extremely low. There have not been any human cases of bubonic plague in Canada since 1939. There have been no reported cases of rat-associated diseases like viral hemorrhagic fever, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, which is a rodent-borne viral disease, or tularemia in the last 10 years in Ontario. Summarizing recent investigations related to rats on private property, on many of the properties that we have seen, we have observed bird feeders, fruit trees, vegetable gardens, and improper storage of composting or waste all of which provide a food source for the rodents. The education uh, part is, a is an important component of the site visit. The presence of rats comes down to the availability of food. To quote Dr. Corrigan, the urban rodentologist from the public meeting, no food, no rats. So th thank you for your time today and the opportunity to provide an oral update. With that, I'll conclude it. Thank you. Anthony, that concludes your presentation as well. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Very good. So that concludes all of my presentations. Thank you, everyone, for waiting patiently. I now have a list of questioners, and I remind my colleagues I'm bringing forward the report and the motion at this time. We will deal with questions at this time before my first speaker to the motion is Councillor Fonseca. My list of questioners is Councillor Sato, then Councillor Starr. Councillor Sato, please.
questions. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Anthony, I, I wanted to, to comment because, you know, this has been going on in my ward uh, since we did all of the Meadowvale uh, replacements, which was probably, what, about 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, it's been going on. And that was really when the major rat um, infestation took place. Then there was the Aaron Mills Parkway major work, which um, I think set them all out of there. Your comment that you set traps at the construction areas and um, you, you weren't seeing an infestation. I, I'm sort of thinking that the reason you weren't seeing them at the area, at the construction site, is that they were moved into the neighborhoods and they were in people's backyards and under their decks because that, that's where I got the complaints from, not around the sites. So, um, you know, I, I can understand that, yeah, you, you, you got rid of them out of there because they all came up from <laughs> from the dig. And that that's what I think we've all assumed. It's been very frustrating because I've been sending my residents to Peel Health, to animal services, and, and they get the same answer, um, you know, that there isn't any infestation. And, you know, Louise, I don't, I don't want to make light of what you said when, when you said that there's been no bubonic plague since 1939. Um, I'm not sure that's a good example. We haven't had a pandemic since 1920-something either. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, this year that's a good uh, uh, that's a good example to use. But um, I, I guess you're saying that it, you, you don't seem, and I'm, what I'm hearing from Peel Health, because I've got the, the emails back, um, is that there is no infestation noted. There's, uh, there's no concern. You know, I had a resident email me this morning and she said that just this week, um, she has caught 100 rats. Um, and that's in the Aaron Mills and the Britannia area. And the only construction going on there is the basement of a Peel Living Building, the underground garage. And since that started um, just recently, I've been getting inundated with uh, with complaints. Now, I mean, when she said, well, we've caught 100, and they're doing it themselves. They've got traps and bait. My big concern is, and this is a health question, some of the bait that people are using, and I did a lot of research on this myself because my next-door neighbor, um, we had rats on our street in under my neighbor's uh, deck, and they had the exterminator come out and... Um, it's not fun when you open your front door and you've got a dead rat lying on your porch. And the ones in Applewood look awfully small. We have, we have bigger rats in that open. It was huge. It was absolutely huge. And I didn't see any live ones, but we did see a couple of dead ones around after the treatment. But I spoke with the exterminator because I have dogs and I'm very concerned about the, the health aspect of that. And, um, I did a lot of research on it, and I was learning that a lot of the bait that you buy, that people can buy, is poisonous to pets and children. So it should be done by a professional. So, you know, some of my residents are telling me, well, I'm putting this bait out and I'm having trouble buying it, um, you know, because of the blocks and stuff. And I'm thinking, like, this is poison that people are putting out. So where, where are we? I, I mean, that is a health concern. So how can we deal with that from a Peel Health perspective? Thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Sato. You're absolutely right that the bait in and of itself is poisonous. When the public health inspector goes out to do the site visit, part of the education um, that I've mentioned includes messaging around the need to make sure that uh, bait is, is handled properly, that it's kept out of the reach of children, that it's kept away from dogs or, or other um, pets, cats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we make the recommendation strongly that it should be a professional uh, company that uh, that does the extermination for those very reasons. So you are you are correct. The bait is poisonous and it does it does potentially pose a risk to to children and, and animals. So my big concern was that if if a rat ate the poison um, and, and just from doing the research that I did, there were different kinds of poison and some were um, absorbed by the animal if it was eaten by, uh, by a pet, whether it was by a cat or a dog, which some animals will. If they see something running across their backyard, they grab it, they eat it, it's gone. Um, 
thank God mine haven't, but <laughs> but I, I'm I know many that do is the impact and the poison going into the animal, even though they're not touching the direct bait. Um, I would have information in terms of whether animals are being impacted in that way. Um, I would have to reach out to the veterinary associations around that. I do know um, that um, baits that are commercially available to the public to buy from Canadian Tire and so on, those risks are assessed. But I couldn't give you a sense of, of to what degree it's impacting animals um, within peel. Okay, no, that's fair. That's fair. And, you know, I, I have to say, I mean, our, our peel health, you guys are amazing. You go out, you talk to residents. But, you know, at the end of the day, the, the message to the residents has been from every department that I've sent anything out to. And, you know, from talking with Councillor Fonseca, the same thing, and listening to that, to her rate payers, um, is that we can't do anything. And that's where the frustration is, that it's up to the individual homeowner. The, the individual homeowner doesn't always know where the rat nest is. I mean, my, my neighbors saw where they were. I hadn't seen any. I hadn't seen any droppings, so I didn't know that my neighbor had rats. Once I found out about it, I looked along my fence line, and I saw all these holes along my fence. So they probably were coming into the yard. I just wasn't seeing them. And, you know, so it, if, if you don't actually have them in your backyard, if you don't see them a lot, then you might not know where to put the bait or, you know, um, and, and that's where the concern is because with not knowing where they, where they are living, and that, that's sort of what I learned from the from the exterminator. I had a good conversation with them because of the issues that I've been having. So, I mean, I've asked my residents now, because a lot of them don't report it. Um, when the resident said that there were 70, uh, you know, I, I mean, I could, I could say there are hundreds. And I'm sure your 70 is a very small number because, um, you know, I got one, I have one street that I've had multiple complaints from, and I know I didn't hear from everyone. So, you know, there, there are probably thousands right now just in my ward that, uh, that, that have the issue and have the concern. So it's not a small concern. Um, and I, uh, I, I won't speak to the motion. I will speak to it after Mr. Chair, because um, I do have some requests about the motion that I discussed with, uh, with Councillor Fonseca, but I, I just don't think we're doing enough on it. And, and Anthony, I really do feel that the construction, you know, it, it really, I started getting the complaints as soon as the Meadowvale water mains were going in. And, you know, I'm sure there were some before that, but that was when the really big thing happened. And I know I raised it at regional council and I got the same answers that, you know, that we're getting now. Um, and I appreciate that we're doing, you know, you're now putting the effort in on the construction sites. But I think we all need to recognize that, you know, if you're dealing with it on the site, the rats are getting displaced from those sites and they're getting displaced into the neighborhood. So treating on the site, I don't think is the full answer. It's part of it. It's part of the solution. But once they're in the neighborhood, they're not going to go away. And we're never going to get people to remove bird feeders. I mean, that, that's just a given, um, you know, especially over this past year, I think it's been even worse. People are going to grow vegetables. We encourage them to grow vegetables from a health perspective. Um, so there's a lot of things that they're even, you know, even if their yards are clean and they, you know, they fill the holes in, we do all that stuff, you use the steel wool and, you know, do everything you can. If they're being displaced, they're still going to be in the neighborhood. And once they're there, they multiply, you know, they multiply like rats, really, <laughs> and uh, are like rabbits. <laughs> um, so, you know, I really think we need to do more on it. But I'll, I'll leave my my comments on the motion. Uh, Councillor Fonseca knows some of the changes that I was going to ask to be made, so I'll speak to that later. Thank you, Councillor Sato. Councillor Starr. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, um, I, I, I certainly talked, had a great discussion with uh, Councillor Fonseca the other day, and and the problem is that the rats are there. They're, they're there 
uh, and they're hidden in many cases. And when we either cut off the food sources or we displace them or they decide to multiply in numbers, they have to have that food and they have to wander the, the, the whole region. And uh, it's not as if these rats weren't there. They're there, and now we've seen them. And I think uh, what we really have to do is put a concentrated effort between the city and the region to say, how do we solve the problem? This is a problem. Uh, and it's not only a problem for the residents, by the way. I mean, we've forgotten totally about how do we deal with the businesses? I have a business that, after he heard yesterday um, our discussion on at the region, he said, I've caught 19 rats behind my uh, business. And he's not in the restaurant area. He's in an industrial area uh, uh, sitting on the Wolfdale Creek. And I think what we have to do is go and, and see how the, the, these rats travel. And it's through the easiest course. They're not going on Mavis Road or heading up Britannia. They're going through the water courses. They're going through the bush. They're going through uh, other areas. And, and basically, they're in hiding. And I think that's part of a fulsome study, uh, Mr. Chair, that we need to, 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 to do first. I mean, I'm not sure how putting money and, and placing all these traps, that's, yes, that's very, very necessary. I agree with the residents that just spoke. But we really have to get to the bottom of the problem, because otherwise, all we're doing is putting a Band-Aid on it uh, in, in the interim. And that's not going to work, because we're going to have construction, we're going to have more new construction, and we're going to be displacing these animals. I think it's incumbent upon us to do a better job uh, with those uh, areas that are the food sources, the, the waste bins, the garbage bins, uh, behind the plazas, behind restaurants, behind uh, even all the industrial areas. The industrial areas, by the way, are a repository for the excess garbage that people can't put out on the street. So if they're involved in any sort of a business, where do you think some of the garbage and food waste goes? It goes into the bin. So therefore now it's behind an industrial area. And I think, uh, you, you know, we're, we're not addressing the big problem. The big problem is what is the source of the problem? And the problem uh, is that they are there, they're hidden. And uh, unfortunately, with all the construction that's going on and probably with COVID-19, there's a lack of food sources. I hate to say it from the normal food sources that they've come, the rats have come to experience through the uh, uh, businesses and yeah. I don't want to say restaurants, but uh, any any food source, uh, supermarkets, for instance. Um, and I know if you drive behind any supermarket, you'll see rat traps, mice traps, you'll see other things. But I think we, we have to have a, a spot uh, that it's one-stop shopping and where a resident can call in and say, I have a problem, where a business can call in and I have a problem. Uh, the question I do have of Anthony is, or uh, with, uh, uh, with Louise, is you talk about the uh, formal complaints. Now, is a complaint the same thing as somebody calling in and saying, what do I do about a rat problem? Or are they actually having a physical uh, um, complaint that is recorded, or how, how do we know what how big the problem is? When you say we had 297, is that a formal complaint that somebody's filled out a form, or 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 what about all the all the other people? And we've heard that before, where people are just calling in and say, "What do I do about these uh, uh, rats in 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 my business or my home?" So, in answer to your question, the 294. Um are, district, are discrete complaints where um, a public health inspector has gone out to a site visit. Um, we do have information up on our website, animal control at the uh, local area um, municipalities also have information up. But the 294 complaints that I talked about um, are discrete events where a public health inspector went out on site. Okay, so then uh, that kind of follows along with my theory that there's many, many more out there that don't say anything. 
uh, you know, it could be thousands. I don't, I, I, I don't know the number, but um, I really think that's why we need uh, one-stop shopping. Maybe it's got to be a temporary department. I'm not sure, not department, but an area or somebody that's a rhetologist uh, here that becomes a, a little bit of an expert, and and uh, so that we can uh, uh, guide uh, our residents, businesses to. Um, to an area that they can get the results rather than being bounced around. And I agree, I, I from the residents uh, speaking and also with Councilor Fonseca and, and Councilor Sato, you know, call in and see, well, how bad is the problem? Is it a rat? Is it a possum? Uh, okay, uh, did you put traps out? I mean, I've had the same problem, you know, I have a problem in my place, I got squirrels, and those are tree rats. And I, you know, I got so many squirrels in my place. I don't know what to do with them. Every morning, I look out and I can see three, four, five, ten of them out there. And I'm, I guess I'm fortunate that it's not, it's not the rat problem. But at the same time, uh, the food source is the problem. The rats are there. That's the problem. Let's get at the problem. And and I support uh, helping the residents somehow. I'm not sure how we do it. I know that there's uh, ideas out there, uh, but just to. Um, say, okay, if, you know, I'm not sure how we do that, and I'm looking for answers, and I'll wait to make further comments, but do we just call an exterminator in, and then we send the bill into the region, or do we have it uh, analyzed in some way? Is there a form? And, and I know that other municipalities uh, do, uh, do uh, say, more formal presentation, or a way of doing that, and it's presented to them. And I think we need a, a good game plan there, uh, but certainly, uh, this is a problem. We've got to get rid of it, but start right at the base. What is the problem, and let's uh, let's get it done that way. So um, I'm I'm in support of some form of remediation and also a long-term uh, uh, plan so that we don't keep seeing this. And yes, I read the report too. I was I was so surprised when I saw that Mississauga is at the top of the rat list. Um, so let's do something about it. But it's got to include both the uh, residents and, and the businesses, because that's just as bad. And uh, uh, not only once, I, over the last few years, I just thought it was maybe a, a minor problem in the... Uh, anyway, thank you. Councillor Starr, thank you very much, and you've covered it very well. I think within your presentation and Councillor Sato's, there's one or two questions pending, um, and Councillor Francesco will be aware in the team that's been dealing with it. We had, if you can imagine, a rat expert from New York City speak to us. And I guess if you want a good rat expert, you get the guy from New York City. And uh, Councillor Starr, he spoke to your point. I want to refer to, to staff because I think there's a question there. And it was, you can spend all the money in the world that you wish, once you've eradicated, if you don't get rid of the food source, so if the fall comes and the trees fall off the apple, uh, the apples fall off the tree and you don't pick them up, you know, they'll be back again. But Anthony, perhaps, and Louise, perhaps you can speak, because that was a big part of the discussion that just sending the exterminator isn't necessarily the solution. So much of the conversation revolves around what Councillor Starr has said, and I think we should get some clarity on that. The second one, Councillor Starr, you're right. We have local municipal bylaw enforcement our agency at the region is a health agency. When it's been declared that it's not a health risk, there's a jurisdictional issue there that the residents don't want to hear about, we have to get past. So well pointed out again, Councillor Starr. But to Anthony and Louise, can you speak, and any other staff, can you speak to those two points? Because I think Councillor Starr has quite rightly raised them. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And and yes, you're, you are correct. The, uh, Dr. Bobby Corrigan is the urban road intelligence that, that staff actually retained to assist us and and um, his recommendation is consistent with that which Councillor Starr actually men mentioned is uh, you know basically what he said is no food no rats is you really need to do a bit of investigation um, and, and perhaps the recommendation should be something which comes back to staff to provide a recommendation on how we go forth with that type of recommendation. Thank you. My next speaker, Councillor Fonseca. Thank you, through Mr. Chair. First off, thank you very much to Applewood Hills Heights uh, uh, Residents Association, specifically to Athena and Ivana for being here today with the deputation, um, and also residents of the Applewood Acres um, and their contribution 
uh, throughout the, the the summer months leading up to the meeting that uh, was hosted virtually in April and to Councillor Dasco um, for all of your uh, support and um, contribution as well. Um, also to you, Chair, and to um, Dr. Lowe, who attended the meeting, to Louise, um, to um, also Jeff Hennings, uh, other members from Public Works, uh, to Sam Rogers, who attended the meeting, Animal Services. Uh, the list goes on of, um, of staff members, as, as the chair uh, and uh, Athena pointed out, uh, and also Ivana in the presentation. Um, all Virtually every single department, I think, has been contacted on this issue. Um, uh, over not only the past, um, over the past couple of months with the particular issue in Applewood Hills Heights uh, and Acres, but also as uh, other councillors, and thank you to all the councillors who have spoken to me over the past uh, uh, weeks with regards to this issue and sharing your unfortunately very, uh, uh, inter uh, very um, disgusting, frankly, stories about rats in uh, different neighborhoods. Um, but I, I think what is very clear uh, in doing all the research and as my motion reads um, is that, number one, there needs to be, uh, to Councillor uh, Starr's point, there needs to be a comprehensive uh, and collaborative approach to uh, dealing with um, uh, rat infestation. Um, and number two, as was explained uh, in the presentation and uh, Councillor Sato pointed out, there is a frustration because it's like actually uh, whack-a-mole. Uh, a resident goes to one department, they file a complaint, uh, they are uh, bumped to another department, they file a complaint, they get bumped to another department. Um, and uh, it's very frustrating. And at the end of the day, um, uh, a resident on their property could be spending a great deal of money on um, traps or baiting um, and to no fault of their own with uh, a, a perfect storm of other of other flurry of activity, whether it's construction, whether it is um, not proper cleanliness on construction sites, whether it is a demolition site that uh, doesn't have the right protocols or pre-baiting in place, whether it's an abandoned property, whether it is um, businesses, as Councillor uh, Starr pointed out, whether it's multi residential. Um, at the end of the day, if uh, everyone is not collaborating together, the issue cannot be, the, the issue will not be taken care of. So as my motion reads, um, there, uh, what I am requesting uh, happen is that um, uh, under recommendation A, na uh, or one, sorry, recommendation one, uh, residents such as Applewood, uh, Hills, Heights, and Acres that are experiencing rat infestation right now uh, be provided uh, support uh, by the, by the uh, region um, to, to, um, to, uh, pay for um, uh, trapping uh, or baiting on their residential properties uh, to that, um, that, um, that that obviously be reported uh, in some sort of a form um, and monitored um, by public health. Um, I think public health and property property standards in combination, uh, or animal services in combination, and three that uh, at the same time, to Councillor Starr's point, that a longer term strategy uh, be put in place and brought back to council. But in the short term, um, uh, I, I've, I've received uh, many pictures, videos, and obviously to um, the presentation here today, um, uh, there is an increasing um, 
there is an, an increasing issue in the in the Applewood community, and uh, obviously, uh, as other uh, in talking with other councillors in other communities as well. So. Um, one of the in, in doing research and looking at what has been happening, uh, what other municipalities are doing, um, the city of uh, in Niagara, St. Catharines, Welland, Windsor, Durham, Sault Ste. Marie, Ottawa, Toronto, they are all in some phase of dealing with this. Uh, dealing with this issue over the past number of years. Uh, everyone is slightly different in their approach based on the issues that they're experiencing in their communities. Um, uh, and what I can tell you is that all of them uh, have committed, all of their councils have committed to um, uh, a program that includes support on residential properties. And I know that um, uh, Louise, and Anthony, um, you referenced that this would be this is not done currently, and uh, uh, you you don't currently have the authority uh, to do this. Um, but that is why this motion is here today. And as Councillor Sato was saying, you know, ten years ago, eleven years ago, this was this was happening, and this frustration is still occurring. Um, but it's time that we we. Um, we uh, remove that loophole or that, uh, like, end the, the whack-a-mole game <laughs> um, and ensure that we're providing uh, residents with um, support on their residential properties. In the city of Niagara and St. Catharines, uh, they, they have gone with the approach and it, it has been working over, I've tried to get specific data on this. I have um, made the request to get it and I, I will at the time, when I do have that, I can share it with staff, but the process, what they chose to do was do pretty much what I am saying, what I have proposed in my motion. Uh, immediately provide support to residents um, uh, that are calling in. Um, and to your point, Councillor Starr, there is, uh, there, they call into um, public, uh, public health. Um, they filed a complaint. Uh, enforcement and public health go out to the site. Um, the homeowner, um, uh, there's a form that they must fill out. Um, and they must hire um, a regionally, uh, or sorry, a municipally appointed um, uh, uh, certified pest control uh, uh, company to come out and properly exterminate uh, or deal with the issue. Um, but at the same time, uh, the public health uh, inspector and the property standards uh, inspector work through with the resident to ensure that they've checked off, that they have um, uh, they have met other terms and conditions uh, with regards to eliminating the food sources on their properties um, and um, and uh, water sources, and and made sure that their properties are kept clean. Uh, at the same time, this goes hand in hand, as Louise, you have pointed out. Um, and, and uh, Councillor Sato uh, and others have pointed out that there needs to be a fulsome public education uh, in the neighbourhood and, and that, um, that, that this then continues to be monitored. So uh, this has seemed to be working over the last three years from what I can find in Niagara and in St. Catharines and in Welland and Durham quite effectively. It's not perfect, um, as as uh, a number of people have said. The rats are there. The rats will be displaced. Construction is going to continue to happen. Uh, but at the end of the day, I know that we can do better in terms of supporting residents in our community uh, when it comes to addressing this issue. And um, I think with that, I'll leave it at that. Um, but that is what I have tried to, to uh, reflect in my motion, that we need to provide residents experiencing rat infestation 
as soon as possible, immediately, with um, with funding to support them on their own properties. At the same time, um, have a, a collaborative uh, report brought back on um, addressing a strategy that can be put in place for the region of Peel. So. Um, one final thing, some residents, uh, uh, sorry, some councillors asked me, would this just apply to Applewood Hills Heights uh, and Acres? And of course, you know, um, as I try to reflect in the motion, it would be for any community experiencing this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fonseca. Councillor Sato. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm I'm very supportive of moving ahead with a rebate program. I've I've looked into the Niagara Falls one, and um, they they rebate. Uh, they they have a, it's quite a strict program. So it's not just that somebody can go out and buy some bait and uh, throw it down and send the bill into the city. Um, they have to go through a process. They have to apply. They have to use a proper exterminator. Um, and uh, so it, it's it's all quite documented. And then they get the rebate, which is 50% of the cost. So in Niagara Falls, they're not covering full 100% of the cost, um, but they're covering up to, uh, up to $200 maximum. And it's once a year per household. So if they have to do it again a year later, they can... Councillor Sato, you've frozen on me, if you can hear me. Sorry, sorry, um, sorry. I know other Count cities are doing some different types of rebate uh, programs. I, I personally... Yeah, Councillor Sato, if you can hear me, I'm, I'm losing you. The rats that shoot are communications line. Sorry, am I back now? That that's better, Councillor Seda. We missed the last forty seconds or so. If you wanted to repeat yourself, please. Am I back now, Mr. Chair? Yes, you are. Uh, uh, I think it's going again. Am I still on right now? I'm Looks okay. good. Go ahead. Okay. All right. I'll talk while I'm still connected. It looks like the city modem's having an issue. Um, okay. So I was saying about Niagara Falls, um, they do up to uh, up to $200 once a year, which is 50%, maximum 50% of the cost of an exterminator. Um, I would really like regional staff to look into um, the region having um, uh, going out and getting bids for exterminators that are approved by the region and that those are the only ones that would be used and to see if the cost could be reduced down because uh, I think if we get a contract with exterminators, then um, it's going to be a lot less per application than if a resident paid and then got a rebate. Um, you know, I think individually uh, they're going to charge more to go out to a single household. So I don't know. Uh, I'm just sort of surmising that from past experience. But I think um, in the meantime, I would like us to go ahead with the rebate program, um, whether we do it as a pilot right now, but it would have to be region wide, not just in one area, um, because I will be having a list of residents that would want to take advantage of this that have already been putting a lot of money buying their own bait and traps, which concerns me. Um, I, I'm really concerned with people going and buying these because we don't know where they're putting them. They're not experts in dealing with the situation and they could be causing um, a more serious issue with, uh, with other animals in the neighborhood, uh, whether it's other wildlife or pets in the neighborhood. So, um, I think we, we would only rebate those that are using approved proper methods. But I would like the program to be implemented immediately. We could call it a six-month pilot while staff um, comes up with a more comprehensive program. Um, we could emulate it on one of the existing ones, which would be a 50% of the cost. Um, at least that's what the Niagara Falls one is set a maximum dollar amount for each one 
But I also feel that it should be retroactive because this has been going on. We haven't been meeting over the summer. Um, the summer has been a really bad time because of people being at home. Uh, I think they've sold more bird feeders, and of course that attracts them as well. And we're encouraging people to do all of these things outside. Plus, the construction has been starting back up again. And um, so I, I would like to see some kind of a, um, uh, a grandfathering on that. Um, you know, we, we only meet every two weeks at the region. And sometimes it can take a really long time for us to get programs up and running. But, uh, you know, this has been going on. It's not a new it's not a new issue. It's been going on for many, many years. And I thank Councillor Fonseca for bringing the motion forward. Um, I, I just think it's time that we, you know, literally bit the bullet and um, uh, put it in place now so that the residents that are struggling with it. I mean, when I hear that one of my residents just caught in the last week 100 rats in her backyard, and this is in an area, this is new area in my ward, and it has to be, the only thing I can think of is related to a Peel Living project um, in one of our apartment buildings because that's the neighborhood where I'm getting brand new complaints. So, uh, you know, that nobody should have to go through that, and uh, we need to do something about it. And we need to do it today. Thank you, Councillor Starr. Yeah, uh, the the other thing I'd like to have included, uh, Councillor Fonseca, is uh, uh, to include businesses also. Uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, implicit in the motion, but it should cover that. And uh, further to Councillor Sato's uh, comments, I, I have no problem supporting whatever we do, whether it's a 50% rebate. Maybe 50% is a good idea because then we'll have residents and businesses pushing their neighbours to uh, clean up their uh, properties also. And it's just not uh, that we're handing out money. And uh, for those people that don't uh, agree with our our uh, approach, then uh, at least then we're we're doing something uh, that's progressive and and in nature. And as long as we get our study done, I think that would uh, work out well. So, Councilor Fonseca, um, you know, if you want to change the motion to something like that, depending on what other folks say, uh, I'm 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 happy either way. But make sure that uh, it's all. Uh, residents, businesses, uh, um, multi res that you know, anybody that has a problem should be able to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Raz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, good conversation. I would just uh, like to see a, an actual corporate report. I know everybody likes pilot projects to get it off the ground quickly. Um, but uh, as we've been talking about at uh, Mississauga Council, this is this is a year where I am hesitant to make any new funding commitments before we uh, understand what the parameters are. Um, is it an open-ended fund? Is it like what, there could be a lot of people that take advantage of this. So I just wanna find out what the financial situation is on a program like this before we uh, proceed even with the pilot. I'm hoping that maybe staff can get back initially um, with a, even a preliminary report next council meeting. It just, I know that other people have done research, but uh, I certainly wanna know more before we commit to a program like this. Um, you know, I've been dealing with rats um, on and off for the last six years since I've been a counselor. Uh, it, and uh, a lot of it is education. Um, but uh, certainly having lived in Toronto for a good chunk of my adult life before moving to Mississauga, rats are pretty much a, um, um, a, a common occurrence. So I just want to strike a balance between not being reactionary and making sure that we're making a good uh, financial decision going forward as well. So um, I would uh, like to um, um, perhaps make a referral back to staff, Mr. Chair. Councillor Rass, thank you. I hope you'll allow us to continue to speak to the matter, recognizing yes. you referred it. Um, to your point, and I have one of the staff members that would like to speak, but perhaps Councillor Fonseca, I think there is a question, Councillor Rass, several questions in what you brought forward um, with regards to and I'm very careful because Councillor Fonseca and I have had very good conversations on the file. I'm very careful not to say, let's refer it back to staff and get a policy around this because we won't hear back from them until after Christmas. So 
I hope, though, that at a minimum, my word, we need a framework or some roadmap so that at the other end of the scale, it isn't, Chair Unique, I showed up today, here's my $372 bill, are you going to pay it? And I need authorization, authority, a, a reference so that I can say, yes, this is what we're paying and why, uh, so that it is transparent and understandable by all other taxpayers who otherwise um, don't have to fund it themselves. Out of an abundance of caution, let me just throw one more thing in. I didn't know it would go this way. Uh, let me declare a conflict in that the pest control people rolled up to my house last week to deal with our mice and rat problem, but I assure everyone I will under no circumstances be asking for a rebate, but God forbid my one neighbor's watching the show and says, you see what happens, Nando brought the matter up. <laughs> but it is widespread throughout the city. So with that, I think Patrick O'Connor and I think some other staff, I think what they're, my word, pleading for is they need a framework or some guidance, I think, and as Councilor Fonseca and I said, we're not waiting till December, Jan hopefully in two weeks time that staff can come back with a framework all the points councillor Starr has raised about what about the um the industrial units the restaurant unit, the ones that say i don't have any problems but i have restaurants on either side of me in the strip plaza there there's a lot of moving parts and as i say i won't use the word policy but at a minimum i think we need a framework that has to come back to us that i would hope on behalf of these long-suffering residents could be here in two weeks' time, because we also have to deal with the local municipalities, but I think that may be where Patrick and my other staff may have some questions or comments. I do want to acknowledge our solicitor, Patrick O'Connor, because I think he may want to speak to some of that. So through to Patrick O'Connor, our regional solicitor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, staff have been asking me some questions of a legal nature. There are some legal questions underlying this, which uh, the conversation has actually touched upon in one way or another so far this morning. And there are three primary ones. Uh, the first is, is the region creating a nuisance so that it's essentially ob obligated to do something here? Uh, the second question is, is the region's regulatory role engaged? And the last one is, does the region wish to provide a service uh, in connection with this problem? And the focus, I think, has come to the last of those questions, but let me touch on each of them very briefly. Um, is the region creating a nuisance? That's the question of, uh, you know, are construction sites causing rats to flow onto other people's property? And uh, from what I've heard uh, described, I think that's a pretty uh, uh, difficult case to make uh, on, on the fact uh, this is a problem that is acknowledged to be widespread. And I think it's doubtful that the region would be found to be obligated to act here. Is the region's regulatory role engaged? Councillor Fonseca, I think, touched on this briefly. It isn't primary here in the sense that public nuisance under the Municipal Act is a matter of local municipal regulatory authority. Property standards are a local municipal uh, area of jurisdiction. Animal control services are uh, uh, traditionally provided primarily at the uh, local level. Um, with that context in mind, then, the question arises, does the region nevertheless wish to provide a service uh, in the public interest, which it has clear jurisdiction to do, uh, should it choose to do so. Um, that service here, I think, it, conversation is tending towards prov provision of a rat extermination service, essentially by funding private sector provision of those services. Um, my suggestion would be, and I think staff are, are motivated to recommend this, is that there be a report back before you choose to enter into a new line of business in effect. Uh, this is not a service that has been provided previously. It's one that you may wish, and I, I sense do wish, to provide in what, some shape or form. My suggestion would be that you allow staff to come back with uh, how that could be done, what staff's recommendations would be done, rather than trying to craft the outline and framework for such a service in the context of, of a resolution, uh, which uh, to give it credit is quite extensive, but has, has been prepared, I think, without the benefit of that staff input. So Councillor Raz's suggestion uh, for a report back before looking before leaping, so to speak, 
is one that uh, the legal perspective tends to support, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Councillor Fonseca. Through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, Patrick, for the clarification on uh, those three points. So, uh, in in hearing this, and uh, to you, Chair, the uh, suggestion of a corporate report in a two-week time frame. Um, if I put forward that we move. Like it, the big concern is that as quickly as possible, uh, pro, uh, residential homeowners have support, um, funding support on their properties to deal with this issue in the short term. So if I were to, if we approve in principle today that in that framework that will come back in a two-week time period, um, a a um, some sort of a residential, for lack of a better, I don't know what else to call it other than rebate. Or if could we approve in principle today that that will be included? What I don't want is for two weeks from now a report to come back that says we don't recommend funding uh, a residential rebate program. That is not what um, I've spent the last, whatever it is, six months, and obviously other councillors have uh, frustrated that this is, this, is the very, this is at the very heart of the issue that um, uh, the residential homeowners continue to have to uh, fund a, uh, an extermination on their own properties where it's out of their hands to deal with it. So is it possible to just based on what Patrick, you just said, or are, are, am I able to approve in principle today? Um, or I don't know if I have to look to council for that. I'm not sure if I need to look to council. Uh, and I, I also understand and appreciate that there has to be some sort of process or framework um, for residents to apply uh, for this and businesses. Uh, so if we can approve in principle today that in that framework, there will be a uh, support, financial support for uh, residents to uh, uh, control rats uh, on their, their, uh, their properties, uh, then I would be willing to put that forward. If not, then I will let my motion stand as it is. Okay, thank you. Um, I have Councillor Raz, then I have Councillor Parrish. Councillor Raz. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, to uh, you know, when I, I spoke to Councillor Fonseca originally, I was very supportive of, of your motion. Of your motion, we do have a lot of work to do before we go down the work of a pr starting to approve uh, rebates. And I also have questions, perhaps, of uh, Patrick or City or Regional Solicitor on the commercial um, piece. So I know that that we've said that this should be a residential program, but in a lot of cases, especially uh, houses that abut grocery stores, um, which is, was one of the causes in my case, how, you know, we have to take a look at that too. If, if, a, if a commercial entity, whether it's the region or, um, you know, a grocery store could potentially be the cause of this rat problem, I mean, maybe there are other things that we need to do. So I'm just hoping that that we, I, I know Councillor Fonseca is very eager to get on with this, and, and so are the residents, but we've, th this rap problem did not appear overnight, maybe for some individuals, uh, but it's certainly been here for a while. I would be more comfortable with just taking that time and, and your original motion. It was very, very thoughtful uh, in terms of what we need to look at before we put a big program in place. So that, those would be my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. My list is Parish Sato Star Dasco. Councillor Parish. Well, just as a compromise, um, I, I understand, and I've been listening carefully, I understand Karen's uh, need for some regulation and some order. It's the same thing that went on 
at the city of Mississauga for giving um, rent to some of the city owned properties. And after they worked, staff worked on it for a couple of weeks, it came back with a good solution. So um, I'm wondering if Chris would accept that when they do come back with a framework in a couple of weeks, bills as of today, in retrospect, would be covered. Um, Chris, would that help you if we just set the day as today, because we're agreeing in principle, but we're waiting for a staff report or an outline as, as, as the chair uh, described, but any bill as of today, even if it takes a month to do it, would, be, would, be quali would qualify as long as we approve it in principle today. How's that sit with you, Chris and uh, Karen? Chris, you, you, Chris, you've been named. Why don't you respond, please? Okay, thank you, three, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Parrish. So when you say as of today, residents in Applewood Hills Heights acres have through the summer been, been um, purchasing traps on their properties. So would that mean that they would not be able to apply those. To me, if we're going to go retroactively, to Councillor Sato's point, uh, we could go to uh, March, when the, the pandemic was declared, which would be March 12th, I believe, and then uh, residents, but also businesses or grocery stores, as you've referenced, uh, Councillor um, Rast, those could all be, would all be able to apply as well. Um, but to say as of today, I mean, the, the residents of Applewood, Hills, Heights, and Acres have definitely um, spent a great deal of uh, a great deal of their funds on traps and um, sealing up uh, the burrow holes throughout the summer. So, so if we could go to, if we could say retroactively to the start of the pandemic, uh, I think that would cover off, um, that would cover off businesses, um, commercial, industrial, residential, private properties. But only if it's to, if we're approving it in principle and the framework is to come back in two weeks. Well, if I might address that, um those people were buying those traps and doing all that to protect their own property. They had no idea at the time that there was going to be a rebate at all. Uh, I think I'd be more comfortable if you want to go back to June the 1st, but uh, going back to March seems a bit far-fetched to me, a little bit too far, because if I, were buying some, if I was buying something in March and I knew there was no program, then I'm making that investment and I've made that choice. So if you want to make it June the 1st, I'm good with that. Okay. Councilor. Okay. Um, I believe Councillor Ras wanted to. Uh, she's wa she was waving frantically. Um, if I could, before I carry on with my list, Councillor uh, Parrish, a very valid point. But I must say, in fairness to Councillor Fonseca and to the residents, we were duly seized of this issue back in March, April, May, and it's not the residents' fault that the only meetings we had in July were emergency meetings related to COVID. We had our session several weeks ago. If I had a council meeting the next week, we would have brought it to council. So I have yes. some sympathy for acknowledging through no fault of the residents who have been on the file for six months that this was the soonest we could get it on an agenda for ourselves. But with good reason, staff had to do work, and then we got caught up in the, the July meeting for COVID, brought us through August to September. So I am sympathetic in acknowledging that point. And Councillor Parrish, you have June, might it be May, but I think that needs to be stressed in fairness to the residents. The delay was not of their making. I will carry on with my list. A Sato Dasko Rask, Councillor Sato. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and my, my recommendation was to go retroactive to July 1st. So, I mean, we're hopping all over the place here. Um, and I, I'm not sure we need to set that date today. I, I do agree with Councillor Raz that we need we need to have a firm framework in place to, uh, to approve so that we know exactly what we're telling our residents. But I also agree that um, I would like to see us approve in principle today um, some form of financial assistance program uh, don't call it a rebate because it may not be um, some form of financial assistance program for residents to 
deal with rat infestations in their neighborhoods. Um, and that staff, I think staff should be able to bring it back in two weeks. I mean, it didn't take me very long to do a lot of research on it, um, on what munis other municipalities are doing. And I think we could take one of those programs and uh, there are quite a few of them that are very similar, not just in Canada, but um, in other countries as well, and, uh, and put that in place. Um, I, I think the retroactive, I, I did say grandfathered, um, you know, I'm not going to ask you to go back 10 years when the problem existed in my ward. But, um, you know, I, I, I think we need to have that as part of the framework. Um, I don't think we can set that date today because we've already heard three, four different dates. Um, and, you know, I, I think staff would know, as, as the, uh, the chair said, you've been dealing with this particular one. But, you know, you've got to stress it's not just an Applewood Acres issue. It's uh, it's much much larger than that, and quite frankly, I think it's uh, it's larger in in some other neighborhoods than it might be um, in in the one that we're dealing with that you've brought forward today. Um, but I, and I think it's going it, to it's going to go all over. I mean, depending on what's going on. Um, so I would I would support approving in principle um, that a program be established and that staff bring to the next regional council meeting the framework for a financial assistance program. Um, I, I think the educational part of the program is going to take a lot more work, but by approving it in principle, then staff will have a little bit more time to develop that program from both a health and a public works. And it is going to involve our city staff, so we can't commit to that for a two week pro, uh, um, period, but we could within two weeks get at least a financial assistance program in place and that would be part one of um, of the steps that we're going to take. So I, I would ask uh, Councillor Raz if you would, um, I know you moved a referral, straight referral, but it, I think it's always better if referrals are worded to be very specific as to what um, what is expected and when it's expected. And uh, I, I just think council today should be showing that we wanna do something and approval in principle would do that. Thank you, Councillor Dasko. Thank you through the chair. And I wanted to just start off with um, thanking uh, Athena and Ivana for all of the work that they've done. And I've got to say a, a significant uh, uh, congratulations, or I shouldn't say congratulations, but thank you to, uh, to Councillor Fonseca for all of the work that she has done on this because it has been extensive. Uh, and and to everybody at the region as well uh, for what they have done. Um, I agree that um, at least in principle, uh, we should be passing something today. Um, if, if, if something gets referred back, it needs to have a timeline to it. And also the takeaway needs to be, in my opinion, that residents need some assurance that, uh, that some assistance is gonna, going to be there uh, for them, and um, so I, I, I'm, I, I, I put myself into uh, into either having something in principle if that's acceptable for Councillor Fonseca or or sticking with uh, the plan. But I, I do believe that something needs to come out of today that will be in the interest of anybody that's having this issue. Uh, because it's not one that, uh, that anybody uh, wishes to be in a situation that people wish to be in. I'm going to make a note of this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Raz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm fine with approving a program in principle, but here's the nub. If one of the residents has spent Five thousand dollars on this, and and uh, you know, hold on to your bills or wh however how much they spent. Usually, when you call in a professional, uh, it's it's not exactly cheap. Maybe you know, Cherry and Nika can can uh, enlighten us on that one. But at the end of the day, they might get twenty five or fifty bucks back. 
I mean, if this is a widespread problem, we do need a framework around it. So I'm happy to approve something in principle, but I don't want to um, over-promise and completely under-deliver for, for residents across the region of Peel, because we know this isn't just a specific Applewood problem, because I've got, gone door-knocking in the Sheridan Homelands a few years ago to do a rat education program with the region of Peel. So this is a widespread problem, and is it is it going to be a program up to a certain uh, amount of money, so everybody else is out of luck. So that's that's my concern. That's my issue. So happy to approve something in principle. I don't want to leave the residents disappointed if we come back in two weeks saying, you know what, this isn't going to work, or you're only going to get twenty five bucks back. So that's why I thought the original motion was a good one. I'll, I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Razin. Just because it's fresh, you make a very good point. Uh, just the truck showing up in my case was $275 plus tax, which I'm told gets me 90 days of coverage. And after that, it's about another $150 to discuss what needs to be done afterwards. Edited. So it's not cheap. Again, I'll be absorbing all of that myself. I want to make that clear again in my wife. But you make, a, and, and I think that needs to be understood. The only other point before I go to Councillor Ponsake and Crombie is I want to be clear because the solicitor made it very clear. And I apologize for wearing the one hat I wear around this table. There's a big jurisdictional issue. And are we saying it is the region and the region alone for these reasons that's doing it? Are we saying it's the municipality and the municipality alone? Are we saying it's a combination of the two? What is the threshold of amount? Councillor Starr spoke to it as well. What's the upset limit we want to budget for the whole city and region? I think we have to turn our attention to that as well, uh, as the solicitor spoke to. Um, so it's not a cheap proposition, and I think it's an ongoing one. Councillor Fonseca, then Mayor Crombie. Councillor Fonseca. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I will let uh, Mayor Crombie go before me. Mayor Crombie. And thank you, Councillor. And uh, I want to thank the deputants for coming forward today. You know, it's it's not a pleasant issue. We've spent an hour and a half on it already. But the, the reality is uh, the rat problem is widespread and it's there everywhere. They're in Toronto, they're in Mississauga, they're in Brampton, they're everywhere. Um, so we would need a region-wide solution and it is more of a health concern, I think. And that's why I'm sure Councillor Fonseca brought it to the attention of the region. But at the same time, we're, we have to decide what amount of budget we want to put towards this because as Councillor Rass has rightly said, they're all going to realize about $25. Um, so I'm not sure that's going to be a solution for anyone either. And if we do have a budget set up, is it first come, first served? Is there a sunset on this or is this an endless um, and then those uh, funding or, or rebate program that we're about to implement. Um, and then the, I would say as well that with any large construction project, we always see the influx of uh, rodents. Uh, they do rear their ugly heads uh, in, uh, in our residences as a result of the earth being shaken up. And so, you know, very soon we will have the build of the LRT and we will have more of that throughout the entire spine of the city of Mississauga and into Brampton as well. So, you know, I think we have to really give this some careful consideration because it is a widespread problem and, and we have to decide how much money we are prepared to put against it uh, to assist the homeowners. Like it's, it's, I'm thinking this is not like the sump pump problem, right? which is about what, what's that rebate worth, $25, $50? Like, and will this make a difference to the residents or should it be something that we need to tackle as a city in our own way? I mean, there are some really important considerations here. Um, and I think we do, the staff do need some time to benchmark. I'd like to know what other cities are doing as well. What does Toronto do? Do they have a rebate program? Perhaps there's uh, some benchmarking that would give us some perspective. Because let's not forget, we're also in an era of COVID and it's not particularly a very good time to be adding uh, a new pilot project with a big budget allocation next to it um, in this year or next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And, and to sort of bring it to a head and a conclusion, I have Councillor Fonseca, who I will allow to speak now, of course. But then, Councillor Raz, I will come back to you as my final speaker to be very, very clear on what is the intention of your referral and what it will cover. Councillor Fonseca, then Councillor Raz. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I will ask my question again, if, if it can be written into the motion that in principle, there is an assurance of some sort of financial assistance to the residents and the businesses, the, the property owners, uh, to be brought back into the report. I don't know how that would be worded. Um, in two weeks, and if staff can give the assurance that the report will be brought back in two weeks, I would be willing to accept that. If not, then I will let my motion stand as is. And procedurally, I'm not sure what happens next because I think procedurally a referral or a deferral uh, prioritizes over over the motion. So uh, those are my comments. If I could have clarification on, and also to the seconder of my motion, Councillor Dasko, I'm not sure if he's, it sounds like he would be okay with that. So what I need clarification on is a reassurance to the residents uh, that in two weeks that there is a, um, that there is a built into the framework that there is a residential uh, and business rodent control rebate program built into the framework. Um, and that I have reassurance from staff that a report, a corporate report will come back in two weeks, then I'm okay with that. If not, if I don't have those reassurances, then I will let the motion stand as is. Thank you. Councillor Fonseca, thank you. Let me tell you on your behalf, on behalf of my colleagues as chair, I would hope that with the best efforts of staff, we will have something back in two weeks. I think we owe it to you and I think we own it to the community. So absolutely, I and a lot of work's been done on it as well. We've had a very good conversation today and I repeat, a framework, not the definitive policy, but a framework to come back in two weeks to say these are all the moving parts. The other thing I've heard in the conversation as chair is there is a willingness here to try and work towards a resolution for the community to some degree. I've heard that in the conversation as well. So I hope the residents can take comfort and back that we're gonna get something hard and fast in two weeks time and the direction we're moving in is the flavor, follows the flavor of your recommendation. That's what I'm hearing. But with that, the CAO might like a clarification and then I have Councillor Dasko on my list and then I will go to Councillor Raz. Uh, CAO Polzinelli, please. Thank you, through the chair. And this may be a little bit different than you've just described, chair, um, but I completely understand and appreciate the conversation that's happened today and the situation that we're dealing with. It's not a good one, it's not an easy one. I'd like to suggest, however, based on what Mayor Crombie has outlined, and she did a great job outlining the considerations that are required in order for us to really figure out how do we support the residents, the businesses, and uh, deal with the problem. A framework will, certainly I will say that the staff, I'm already emailing with them, we are looking to retain the rodentologist, which may need council's approval as sole source uh, to get through procurement as fast as possible. We will work actively on that framework with our colleagues at the municipalities, all three. Um, we will definitely look at, fr at a framework as to how we develop a rebate, not called a rebate, but a rebate program that would be equitable, um, as well as the financial implications, understanding that COVID is still with us and we will require some resources. Not, not a huge problem, but a consideration. That may take a little longer than two weeks. What I'd like to suggest, and I leave it to council for um, you know, your consideration, is that staff bring back a report on October 8th. So that will be four weeks from now. Um, and truly allows us three weeks to work on it so that we can get it to council in advance of that meeting. Otherwise, if it is in two weeks, we will have to walk that report on because count staff will not have time in one week to pull the necessary information together, even at a high level, so that council can make the best decisions for this, for this um, issue, 
for our residents, and for the community. I will leave that for Council to um, consider. Nancy, thank you. Councillor Rass. Uh, Councillor Dasko, I thought I saw your name. Did you wish? Very good. You're clear. Uh, Councillor Rass, for your motion before me now. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I would like to um, refer Councillor Fonseca's original motion back to staff um, with the, uh, with the uh, provision that a full report is coming back on October 8th for consideration. I'm not prepared to um, give the residences, uh, residents at this point a financial guarantee or assurance that um, something is actually going to happen until I have the information. That's, that's the way we do business. That's the way we need to do business. So that's uh, that is my referral, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And not requiring or needing more speakers to that referral, just a point of clarity for staff and the council because the CAO raised a very good point. Um, I would hope that the CAO and the staff don't have to come back to us and say, yes, this road intelligent expert is single source, it's $1,500. Now, we, I would hope that that leeway within reasonable grounds to not clog up the works more. Staff should do whatever they need to do uh, within reason. Um, and if you'll trust me to approve $1,000 or whatever the case might be, because I don't want that holding it up if it's single sourced because that did come up there aren't many experts in the field. And so I don't want that to, to be held up if it is meant to be for the 8th of October. Councillor Pileshi, then Councillor Fonseca. Is um, Councillor Fonseca the only one on the board? Yes. I'll go after her because I'm going to call the question. Thank you very much. Councillor Fonseca, to you. Thank you, and I appreciate all the time that's gone into this discussion. I think it's a needed discussion. So again, for clarification, in the referral, I guess I'm speaking to Councillor Ross, will it, can the wording include agreement or, uh, yeah, agreement in principle that included in the, in the referral to staff and included in the framework, can staff include in that framework uh, a um, some sort of financial, not giving it a specific name or a specific amount, not putting a threshold on it, but in looking at what's been done in other municipalities, put in, it, can we not approve in principle today at the same time as we refer it to staff that what comes back in uh, in the corporate report is a reassurance or an inclusion of a residential and business rebate program? I'm still not clear if that... Sorry, um, if I could speak to that, Mr. Chair. Um, in your motion, it says, uh, therefore, be it resolved that the region of Peel develop a residential road and rebate program to yes. assist residential property owners. So I'm just, if we refer the motion to staff, that's that's what that's what they're working on. So in, in essence, we're approving it in principle. Okay. And if you want that ex explicit, then, but we're approving it in principle pending the work that comes back from the region. And I just wanted Fonseca. to be clear that that yeah, wasn't being removed from... No, it's from, not being removed. It's, it's still there, and it's worthy to look at, and that we just need a, a, a framework and some parameters around it before we approve it, because we don't approve things without understanding all the work involved and the cost. And if I could help Councillor Fonseca, uh, Councillor Rass makes a very valid point. It's very hard for a council, and I would rule out of order to approve an expenditure we haven't seen yet and haven't quantified. So um, in principle that we'd like to move in that direction, but we can't pre-approve a number that we don't know. So I, I don't think I would let that get past the chair as part of a motion and council could deal with that as it wishes. So uh, Councillor Rass, I think you've made it as clear as I can hope. Um, do I have the actual motion right here? The motion I have before me, my apologies, uh, just, which a straight referral is the more appropriate way. Uh, Councillor, I, I think that 
I think that's good on a couple of fronts because I think we've had a great conversation and the necessary latitude would be part of a straight referral. The motion I have is one of referral from Councillor Ras and Mayor Crombie. Uh, Madam Clerk, I don't have a recorded vote for a referral. I'm going to turn the vote over to you, though, in any event, just to be 100% clear. It does not require a recorded vote, but I'm going to call the names just to make sure. Okay. Mayor Brown. Yes. Councillor Carlson? Yes. Mayor Crombie? Yes. Councillor Demerla? Yes. Councillor Dasco? Yes. Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor Downey? In favor. Councillor Fonseca? Yes. Councillor Fortini? Yes. Councillor Groves? Yes. Councillor Innes? Yes. Councillor Kovac? Yes. Councillor Mahoney? Yes. Councillor McFadden? Yes. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Pileshi? Yes. Councillor Parrish? Yes. Councillor Raz? Yes. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Sinclair? In support, yes. Mayor Thompson? Mayor Thompson? Oh, Councillor Starr. Oh, oh yeah. sorry. <laughs> Councillor Starr, sorry, I skipped over you, apologize. Uh, Mayor in favor? Councillor Starr? You gotta ask me again, yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and Mayor Thompson? Mayor Thompson? Councillor Vicente? Yes. It carries. And that carries. So, uh, first of all, excellent conversation. Ivana and Athena, thank you very much. Thank you to the staff. And Councillor Fonseca, I have to tell you, I've been at this 32 years. I don't know that I've dealt with a tougher issue as a local councillor in all that time. And I don't know that I've better dealt with an issue than how you've dealt with this. Your residents really should be proud of the effort you've brought forward in getting it this far, hopefully working towards a resolution for October 8th. Thank you to all. With that, I go to the, oh, sorry, Madam Clerk. Oh, yes, and we have to have a motion to receive the presentation and, and the delegations. Um, a quick show of hands, all those in favor. I don't see anyone opposed. That is carried. Thank you very much. On to 7.2, Jutvinder Sondi, and thank you for your patience, Mr. Sodi, and members of the Homeowners Welfare Association and con residents concerned of Brampton regarding road and public safety. And I am advised also, and I think my colleagues on the police board know as well, this matter will be coming to us at the Police Services Board as well. So with that, Jutvinder, welcome, and please proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair and the members, uh, council members, and Mayor Brownie, uh, as well as Mayor Brown, Mayor Thompson, and all the council members, I really appreciate your time. I patiently learned that how the debates go for the different issues, like including the rats today. But looking forward, this delegation has been on behalf of Homeowners Welfare Association and concerned residents of Brampton. Uh, myself, Jyotaminder Sodi, I've been in a in a community service for 20 years. I was in Mississauga as a council chair member in a public school board. And then in Brampton, of course, we run Homeowners Welfare Association for the community initiatives and uh, including the safety. The, the moving forward, we are looking forward to have the support from the council members and the chair on this important issue. Of and Jot Vinder, and Jot Vinder, I will just interrupt for clarity because I miss a, wanted to be sure that between you and the staff, we know when we want the slides changed. So through the do we need Jot Vinder to let you know? So Jot Vinder, as you're going along, tell us when you want us to keep please. moving forward on the slide packet. You'll let us know. Please. Thank you. Please Second proceed. slide, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And road and public safety. A recent incidents, uh, four angels lost life in careless driving and when police was chasing uh, a, a rash driver and we can't forget for longest period of time it's heartfelt incident three daughters and mother in Brampton. Ajaz Chaudhary uh, has been killed in a way and daylight robbery at gunpoint in Brampton East car was robbed from a woman at gunpoint. Uh, it happened in Brampton East. 
and heavy traffic on Mayfield Highway 50 and Steels, especially uh, Mayfield and Highway 50, where we don't have any uh, on Gore and Mayfield. I think Caledon councillors also understand there is no right merging lane, no left merging lane on both sides of uh, Gore and Mayfield Road. Same thing every day we hear accidents on all over the map, but especially on Highway 50, which is a regional road, and uh, uh, Mayfield is also a regional road, heavy traffic, uh, illegal uh, truck yards. I think Caledon can speak better on that. Let's go on the third slide, please. Let me uh, give you a shot of, like, say, uh, Mrs. Saga mom says she was tasered, shot while on ground, argument police, a mother. That's one incident happened in the past. There was a mother and three <laughs> angels. You could see the picture, and not forgettable ever an incident. There's another incident on Mayfield where a car has been taken out from the ditch. This recent uh, video I shared on my page, uh, where we run a lot of uh, safety initiatives. 580, more than 580 people shared this video. And the, the, from the driveway, two young children came in and they steal the car, they throw the lady on the ground, could be a child in, in the car, and could have been more damages to it. So this is the safety. I, 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 so many incidents, we are not first time uh, delegating from last 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 again. Almost every year we come in and bring bring up the attention of the council, regional council, and the city to attend, have an attention on the public safety. People are not saving, feeling safe in Mississauga, Brampton, and Caledon, especially I'm speaking on, on behalf of the Brampton side. These are the few incidents. And uh, next slide, please. A young man, he was coming from a religious place three around 3 o'clock midday in the residential area. He got stabbed just for a phone. Has no fault, an innocent international student. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Next slide, please. And some of the incidents I'm going to record, like July 24th, 27th, 8th, 31st, August 4th, August 6th, 13th of August, 13th of August again, 13th of August again, 14th of August, August 21st, September 1st, September 1st, September 1st. So these are the glimpses of it, because most of the time, Peel Police, I'm not sure whether the resources, they say, oh, uh, contact your insurance. If it's, a, uh, if it's a theft or if it's a small issue, or they reach out three, four days later, people, and sometimes people don't know what to do. Every resident is not fully aware of what what the rights are, what the uh, what the system they can approach. They could do anything. I I'm not listing all those because uh, you had a long discussion on rats. I don't want to uh, take a lot of time from the council members. And uh, in, in this particular all the incidents you have hear it. Can you go for the next slide, please? Unfair distribution. I have to use the word unfair. Unfortunately and newly developed areas. If you see in Brampton, uh, from downtown slowly, it start developing out. Highway 50 and Mayfield is around, let's go for the next slide, please. So going back, uh, it's down 19, 20 kilometers. And we appreciate the city, uh, region, Peel region, between all the council members, they have opened another police station. One is in Bramley uh, city center, another one is on Ontario street. Third one recently opened in Brampton, Brampton downtown. But if you see demographically how the, the spread over the years, uh, just 19 kilometers is from Peel Center to the Mayfield and Highway 50. And similarly, Windsor Churchill and Mayfield and same south. So Brampton has dropped. So we need more resources. We need more police. And residents are willing to support, willing to work with the, with the region of Peel and lobby with the province and federals for funding. Recently, provincial government has released uh, quite a few funds for the police improvements, but we need to, and cameras too, safety cameras. Highway 50, a lot of accidents, a lot of people are losing life, and same thing, regional roads. It's on internal roads. Uh, cameras have been installed. We are looking forward to have addition, uh, more cameras on the major intersections. Patrick Brown, thank you. You have took the initiative last year to have cameras on highway and which provincial government has released the funding for that. 
And having said, can we go for the next slide, please? Our asks are very simple. Increase police presence to control the criminal activities. Police station in Brampton, East and West and South. And reform new police uh, policies to assure public road safety. Right now, the condition is in Mississauga, Brampton, Caledon. People don't feel safe at home. I, when I'm working, today I took a time off. I thought I'm going to finish my delegation faster. But uh, there was other delegation took longer time, like two hours almost. But having said that, we don't feel safe at work because what happened? My, my young children at home, my mom is at home, and anybody can break the door and enter and, and take away. And this incident's not only one time recorded, this is hundreds of them. For example, in June, uh, January to June 2019, 1491 cars are to have stolen as per the police records. How many are not recorded, we are not counting. In the same period in 2020, 1649 recorded incidents. So these, these gives us an, an information that there is a problem. And strict enforcement against criminals. I, we understand sometimes police catch uh, the criminals, but same, and due to the, the weak justice system, they get away on the road and ultimately they do another crime, another crime, because justice system is not strong. For that, we will definitely go to our MPs and uh, in Brampton and Peel. So that way we can raise the flag with the Ministry of Justice and whoever is uh, ultimately responsible. And we are always in touch with our provincial partners uh, MPP uh, uh, Pramit Sarkaria and uh, Majot Sandhu to have more resources, whatever Brampton needs. We are a lobby group. We're going to continue our lobby and also public engagement on advisory board. We don't know what the advisory board does it, what the suggestions are. We have so many good suggestions on road safety and uh, other uh, initiatives where, where we could contribute as a resident, as a as a concerned citizen who who does care about the city, uh, we need a proper coordination between the residents. And when you ask for for an initiative and ideas, you have tons of ideas from the residents, which doesn't cost a lot of money, but still serve a lot because more brains, more ideas better we could do a service to the people. Again, uh, I'm thank you, everyone, for your time. But this is a serious concern which requires an immediate attention of our regional councillors, our councillors, mayors, and chair of the board, uh, Peel board. So and we are coming back, as, as chair said, uh, we are coming back to police board where, where we have, we will not be able to speak the, the system they have is somebody else going to read on our behalf, our concerns and asks. We're looking for a sport. We are looking for a shoulder where we say, hey, Brampton is safe. Not only for residents, it's also the businesses too. Jewelry shop robbed daylight because police is not, was too far. It took me 11, 6 to 11 minutes to reach there. By then, easily they can go. They go very fast. They steal cars every day. They knock doors every day. We see in camera, but I'm not sure what else can be done collaboratively, collectively, together. It's not regional council's responsibility. It's not mayors. It's not a chair. It's everyone, including our our uh, federal and provincial partners and the residents. And I'm thank you to Sukhjot Naru, Sukhvinder Dillon, Harinder Singh Chima, Sukhvinder Samra, Adel uh, Ranchers, and so many other people who are part of our team, we're going to be coming in, uh, back to region, to city under Safe Brampton. We're going to en enhance our initiatives under the banner of Safe Brampton for all of us. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to open. The floor is open. If someone has a question, please. Mr. Sodi, thank you very much, and thank you for your patience. And please know that your words are, are listened to, and they touch our hearts and our minds. And you seized an enormous issue for all members of council and the mayors and the police services board. As you've mentioned, I know this is being referred to, and you're already on the queue for the next police services board meeting, appropriately so. So I wanted my colleagues to know that. I do have a speaker. Councillor Fonseca, are you on my list to speak? Sorry, Mr. Chair, 
there seems to be an issue. I cannot remove my hand from the board. I'm trying. Okay. Well, then, if not, um, I think Mayor Crombie and Mayor Brown are happy to refer this to our police yeah. services board, where we will be hearing from you, uh, and it's been acknowledged accordingly. If I have actually, no others, actually, uh, Mayor I'm Brown, trying to, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to add my hand, but it's not working. You're up. Go ahead, Mayor Brown. Um, so some of our hands are working, some of our hands aren't working. I just want to thank Jovinder. Um, he's been pa a passionate uh, Brampton resident for uh, public uh, safety um, and um, appreciate uh, the fact that he's got a bunch of citizens uh, focused and interested in, um, in, in public safety. Um, and um, I guess the question to um, uh, Javinder Sodi would be, um, is there anything that you can see that we're not already doing? Um, I, I know you mentioned our advocacy for the CCTV cameras. We're hoping that comes uh, soon. But in terms of the additional officers that have already been allocated to the focus on guns and and gangs, um, we got a great chief of police, uh, Nishan uh, Derapa, who I think is uh, really changing um, uh, the, the, the Peel Police. But is there um, anything in particular that you wanted um, us to do on top of the efforts that are already uh, underway? As you know, we've are, I've, I've been in the media about bail reform and changes to the Youth Criminal Justice Act, but a lot of this is within provincial jurisdiction. Is there anything additional that you'd like to see Peel Regional Council uh, publicly pushing for to our, our Attorney Generals? Thank you very much, Mayor Brown. Uh, we know you are advocating. You are also a passion person. Uh, we know that uh, you have been raising so many flags with uh, as a as asking criminal justice to for 16 year or, or or older for bringing them back to the justice system so that way criminals can feel that uh, there is a penalty. But same time, uh, a lot of things are being done. We, we don't uh, deny that. But same time, we need to have a collaborative effort. We need to have our MPs uh, on board. We need to have a collaborative meetings between the council, mayor, and the team, and the residents uh, with uh, it could be a Zoom meeting. We know uh, this is a crisis right now. Uh, we can't have a physical meetings with the residents. So that way, it, it's more engaged. We understand uh, Mayor Brown is passionate to do some town halls, and we request you next time when we do the town hall, when we, everything is normal, join our town halls too. Um, along with, uh, so there was uh, last year we did in September on public safety. I, I, I believe you recall, and we have submitted the documentation, five of the council members joined from Brampton, some MPPs, and uh, that's election year for the federally. So none of them were represented because that was the peak of the election time for them. So there are initiatives can be done, collaborative meeting, collaborative brainstorming. Uh, always we could do more, especially safety. I personally feel uh, safety is a topmost priority. If we are safe, business is going to come in. Brampton will be more prosper. Peel will be more prosper. Uh, but we need to have a, a open door policy and open minded. It's not the gaps. We are not pointing our fingers on the police or on on our councillor or on anyone in particular. Our focus is to address those concerns which we are raising from last many several years. If, if, uh, if effectiveness is there, then we should see the results on the paper. As I just state the data, and we have uh, delegated several times, even Patrick Mon, before you become a mayor, we were raising those flags with our regional councillors, with our uh, city councillors, and most some of the old members are aware of it. We have been a passionate, uh, positive lobbyist but so, not every time I would say that sometimes you get frustrated. So many issues we face, not only the, the safety, which is a top priority, employment opportunities, uh, transportation, so many things we always lobby. And uh, you're positive. You are uh, come back on social media. But that's one thing I appreciate you. You come back on social media. You speak your brain out. So that way, that way people hear your voice. We may not agree on some points. We agree, and uh, we always uh, work together on so many issues and looking forward to working together. Thank you. And also, thank sorry, you. I have to say thank you to the staff. I see different. I, I do delegate uh, to the region, not regularly, but to the city of Brandon, I'm a regular uh, delegate. 
I see uh, the staff, I have to appreciate entire staff. From last three days, they were completely uh, in touch with me to ensure that my video, my audio, and I understand the wait uh, the, when the delegation was getting longer. They were sending me emails, wait, we, you are in next in line. This is a communication which I see. I appreciate the staff and the technical or IT area. They have done a wonderful job always, not only this time, always. Thank you. And thank you for that. You're absolutely right, Sodi. Moving on, my list is Councillor Pileshi and then Councillor Medeiros. Councillor Pileshi. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I, I, I thought I had re removed my hand, but I, I'll, I'll just jump in. And, and Javinder is, is a huge advocate for safety and, and has been coming uh, to the city of for, for a while now. You know, he was one of the reasons why I had put forward a motion to establish the uh, Community Safety Advisory Committee. And, um, you know, sitting on the Community Safety Wellbeing Plan at the Region Appeal, um, we're working with uh, all uh, aspects around and, and stakeholders in in the Region Appeal to, to uh, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about many things that are on on residents' minds and and what we can do, and, and Chief Nish is uh, is right there with Nancy uh, uh, leading the charge. So um, we we hear you, Javinder. We understand. Um, you know, we're we're working. You know, some of the restrictions that uh, that we have with uh, when it comes to to police, but we have a, a really good chief that is is looking at different ways of of doing things and not just throwing more police at uh, at the problem, but you know, looking for uh, different ways in, in trying to uh, to combat this. So uh, I welcome the referral to the um, Police Services Board and, and look forward to uh, seeing some results come back from them. Thank you, Judge Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sodi. Uh, always for uh, advocating for the city of Brampton. Uh, just touching a little bit on what Councillor Palachi said, uh, this reminds me a little bit when uh, Councillor Parrish is advocating for Malton. Not only does she advocate for uh, more police presence, but also when she advocates for the community hub. And I know Councillor Dillon has been a champion and uh, Councillor Singh uh, in terms of trying to get more community services, uh, more regional services, more city services into the area. So the only suggestion I would make, Mr. Sodi, is, um, you know, what would, be, you know, I know you're focusing on the the crime and safety aspect, but I think a large part of it, are what are the supports and government supports you're getting in the area, and uh, I think as part of a report back, and I'll leave it to uh, Councillor Dillon to uh, make that request to staff, is looking at all the sort of interventions and and social supports that are in the area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes my list. Uh, Mr. Sodi, thank you very much for your presentation. We have receipt of the delegation moved by Mayor Brown and Mayor Crombie and referral on to our friends at the Police Services Board. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Uh, to my colleagues, it's almost thank 12 you. on the nose. You're, you're welcome. Thank you for your thank presentation. You. Just, uh, I would uh, really appreciate and thank you. We were looking for, we're moving forward working on youth engagement, to seniors, and uh, like uh, homeless areas. We got, our focus is going to be on public safety along with so many other initiatives engaging the youth in there so that way we are tackling the issues and we need a support from our region and the city so that way we could proactively do those initiatives. I took a time off today from work to do this delegation. Yesterday I did it to the city. So our team is dedicated and willing to work and, and the sport we have seen today, we're looking forward to working together as a team collaboratively. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, and thank you for the time that you've taken. Okay, with that team, we're at 12 o'clock. I'm going to suggest a 15-minute bio snack break, if you will, to come back right at 12.15. We have three quick staff updates on COVID and then just four lingering items. So I think we'll get out here in a timely way. So with that, I'm going to call for a recess between 12 and 12.15. We will see you back in 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, everybody, we're, uh, we're going to get ready to reconvene. And as we're just calling everybody back, I thought what we might do, because I think it'll flow a, a little better, 
Uh, item 8.3, the update on COVID-19. I think we'll start with an oral presentation from Nancy Polzinelli, Interim Chief Administrative Officer, then go uh, to Dr. Monica Ho, and then uh, Norm's presentation. So with that, um, on the assumption that we're slowly getting there, and we're in a couple of minutes past 12.15, Nancy, over to you. Thank you, Chair Unica, and through the Chair. Good, oh, I guess it's good afternoon, members of Council. As the Peel community cautiously takes further steps towards a new sense of normalcy this fall, I'd like to share some of the work related to COVID-19 that has happened over the summer months. Staff, together with community partners, continue preparing for reopening and recovery while continuing in a response mode and, just as important, maintaining readiness for changing pandemic status in Peel. Reopening and recovery encompasses the resumption of services for residents and businesses, as well as opening of our own regional buildings. Starting September 21st, more of our employees will be working at regional work sites with physical distancing and other safety measures in place, including active, active self-screening digital technology. For other employees, the re region's remote first approach will remain until January 1, 2021. Regional buildings and three access peel counters will reopen to deliver in-person services on September 23rd. And visitors will continue to be actively screened when entering regional facilities and signage, directional decals and clear barriers at service counters are among the safety measures. Building occupancy will not exceed 40%, and this includes both staff and any visitors accessing services. So ongoing service delivery through online and phone options will continue and have been quite successful. Further, planning is underway to reopen adult day services to support the frail seniors living in the community who can't manage on their own and who have experienced and often experience isolation. This will provide much needed care and social supports to over 300 clients. Virtual and telephone programming will be offered in the early fall with a modified in-person adult day programming planned to begin later in this year. To support healthy childhoods and support parents, early on centers begin reopening in September once safety protocols from Peel Public Health are established and communicated to all providers. By September 28, staff expect that 27 of the 66 early on centers will be open. For licensed childcare, the region has released updated COVID-19 enhanced health and safety protocols. This is building on lessons learned and practices established in providing childcare to essential workers throughout the recent crisis. And as of September 8th, 513 licensed childcare centers, or about 94%, have reopened with enrollment slowly increasing. The remaining 13, or the remaining, um, sorry, the remaining 6% continue to work on safe opening protocols. Now, trans help requests have been slowly increasing since reopening. While overall demand continues to be down, this service adapted and became essential in supporting the homeless isolation or recovery programs and long-term care during the crisis. In addition to service changes, there have also been financial impacts that are being worked on through recovery. Senior levels of government have helped manage financial impacts of the pandemic on municipalities through the Safe Restart funding. Peel is rece receiving $27.3 million to address COVID-related operating pressures and $550,000 to address regional trans health pressures from COVID. This, along with cost avoidance initiatives, will help manage Peel's financial pressure in 2020. And as these governments proceed with their own recovery initiatives, the region will be ready to leverage any stimulus funding or partnership opportunities to build critical infrastructure and support and enhance human and community health as we build back better. The financial implications of the pandemic will be presented in more detail by Norm Lum. And although work on the majority of council priorities has continued, 
Those that were paused or reduced will also be brought fully back online over the next few months. As reopening gets underway, many regional services will remain on a crisis response footing. In public health, the COVID-19 data dashboard continues to provide statistics on outbreaks in long-term care and retirement home settings, and is expanding this week to include statistics on outbreaks in school settings. Since early summer, the region, led by the Commissioner of Health and Medical Officer of Health, have been collaborating with the local school boards and post-secondary institutions to, to promote student and staff safety. Details on safe reopening of the schools under public health guidance will be discussed by Dr. Howe later in the agenda. Paramedic Services has resumed some regular programs to support increase in call volumes, but others remain on hold to focus on essential services. One example of that is since mid-April, paramedics have conducted more than 10,000 COVID-19 swabs in congregate settings and in the community, and they continue supporting community testing for vulnerable groups. In long-term care, response continues. Enhanced protocols remain in place, including directing staff to only work in one location until further notice, and strictly following public health and provincial guidelines for the use of PPE. Based on guidance from the pro provincial government, I'm happy to confirm that indoor and outdoor resident visits are now being accepted with visiting protocols in place. And regional long-term care leaders continue to provide guidance as requested by other homes in the region of Peel. The region continues to support Peel's homeless population as part of response through our outreach program and the isolation and recovery program, which remains available for those who require self-isolation or who have contracted the virus and need a place to isolate and receive the necessary health care in one spot. During COVID, we served almost 300 homeless clients through these programs and permanently housed over 460, which has been amazing. As part of ongoing pandemic response, the COVID-19 Community Fund continues to respond to the growing needs in Peel's non-for-profit sector. Through this program and provincial funds, we have worked with 139 applications and granted a total of approximately $4.4 million, which is helping to support vulnerable people across Peel. We're all aware and we've all heard of the risks of a second wave. However, predictive models indicate that any second wave will not necessarily be like the first and very well may mean multiple waves of varying lengths. The region will be flexible and agile in our response and we will be ready for whatever may come. To manage the ongoing response and to ensure the region is ready to ramp up as necessary, the Regional Emergency Operations Centre and partners continue to meet regularly each week. Public health IMS structure remains intact to support case and contact testing. And as we learned in the crisis, readiness relies on partnerships. The Community Response Table has proved valuable in understanding both current and future human and community needs as recovery takes hold. The community partners have asked the region to continue to lead key areas of importance as together they prepare to support readiness and protect the, excuse me, protect the, the vulnerable. As part of readiness, we are continuing to work with partners through the integrated response planning table for congregate settings to support outbreak management in long-term care and retirement homes. And, addition, and in addition to testing within congregate settings, this table is planning the community testing strategy involving multiple health and community partners along with the region. And the region is also working with the three Peel Ontario Health Team partners and community stakeholders to discuss and plan for procurement, warehousing and distribution of PPE. In closing, 
We know much more about this pandemic and this virus than we did 185 days ago when the Regional Emergency Operations Centre was first activated. We will rely on this higher level of situational awareness as the pandemic continues. We will build on the community resourcefulness and collaboration we experienced in the crisis. And we will apply that knowledge and experience to continue building a community for life in Peel. And just before I close, I do want to thank all of Council for their continued support during COVID. And a big thank you and shout out to all the staff across the region for their exceptional work, their compassionate care, and the perse their perseverance during this most interesting and challenging time. And with that, I thank you and back to you, Chair. Thank you, Nancy. And there are some questions. My list is Demerla Medeiros Pileshi, Councillor Demerla. Thank you, Chair. And Nancy, thank you for that update. And I also want to extend uh, my compliments to you and your team throughout the uh, COVID uh, so far. Uh, my question is actually, Chair, a little, it's on COVID, but maybe not. Um, directed to Nancy, uh, but more to public health. I've been getting some calls and emails from parents who are going, who have kids obviously going into uh, elementary school. And there's this question around masks. And the, I know the province has said no masks required from uh, JK to, I think, grade one or grade two. But uh, parents have been asking, can the region, uh, and, and I know the school boards are looking at it as well, but the question is, do we have any jurisdiction in that area? And does public health have any feedback in terms of the viability of masks? Uh, I know they're little kids, but what's the science? And, and parents are, some parents are quite concerned and would like to see the masks. Nancy, through to you or Dr. Oh, you let us go ahead. Yes, I'm actually going to pass that question to Dr. Howe, who I know is on the call right now. So back to you, Dr. Howe. Okay, great. Thanks very much for the referral and thank you for the question, Councillor. So um, back in the summer, uh, earlier in, in the year, uh, we had uh, corresponded with um, our school boards through Dr. Lowe to discuss our recommendation for school boards to consider requiring masks in grades one to three. We recognize that this is above and beyond the provincial guidance but took into consideration a few factors. This included uh, the higher incidence of COVID-19 in Peel region, as well as uh, coming into alignment with local municipal bylaws that uh, indicate that for this particular age group, they are also um, required to mask indoors. So for those uh, reasons, we, we uh, made those recommendations to our school boards, which they subsequently adopted. So is, is it mandatory now, grade one to grade three? The masks? Correct. Correct. So both uh, both Peel School Board and Death Room Peel Catholic District School Boards have adopted that as a requirement for their schools. So it's just the JK and SK then that's... Yeah, as JK and SK, we can uh, continue to strongly recommend, um, but okay. recognize that um, uh, developmentally it may be more challenging for, for them to consistently wear a mask throughout the day. So that's where the confusion is. Okay, so it's just the JK and SK, and it's just a practicality issue. Is that uh, what it is? Yeah, um, um, yeah, and this is consistent with um, with our own bylaws as well. That say for children between the ages of three and five, if they cannot be convinced to wear a mask by their parent, um, that they are are not uh, forced to to wear a mask either. And also consistent with recent recommend recommendations from the World Health Organization around masking around children as well. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Cool. Councillor Pileshi. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Nancy, for your presentation. Um, Nancy or Monica or whomever, Brampton is having a spike of COVID cases more than anybody else. The National Post called Brampton the epicenter of COVID. What are we doing different? What is different about what Mississauga is doing? What is the region, if anything, is doing differently in Mississauga as opposed to Brampton and or Caledon that you can tell me 
the issue that we're having in Brampton? Or is it related to, we only have one testing center. Um, our tests uh, results don't actually happen in Brampton, they happen elsewhere. Um, but from what I'm hearing from residents is the testing center that we have in Brampton, the one, <clears throat> is a four hour wait. And people really aren't interested in going and sitting in line for four hours. Now you could go to Mississauga, from my understanding they have three. But what is Brampton doing wrong? What are we as the re as Region Appeal, um, what are we doing differently in Brampton as opposed to other municipalities? So th through the chair, if I may, um, I'm, I'm happy to speak to this and give a bit more background in my remarks and then address Councillor Pileshi's question at the end. If, so if, why, why if don't I do it? Why don't I do this? The question is pending. I, I believe we've concluded the questions for Nancy. So Dr. Howe, why don't you give your presentation and at the conclusion, you'll directly address Councillor Pileshi's question, which may be included in your presentation in any event. So over to okay. Dr. Howe so for I, her. I might, have, I might have one more question then that Nancy may want okay. to answer or we can move it to Monica, I'm not sure. But the question relates to um, the company in Mississauga that recently had the outbreak, has that company been named? Uh, what I will do, I know the answer is no, but what I will do, Michael, you are first on my list after Monica's presentation, and we will go from there. Is that okay? So right before her presentation, then I would like to know why, when Maple Lodge Farms had an outbreak, they were named and why this company hasn't been named. I would like to know that because I need to let Maple Lodge Farms know that a company in my area. Thank you. Okay, Monica, you've heard the question, if you can speak to it as part of your presentation. Otherwise, your question still stands, Councillor Pileshi, we will come to it. Uh, Monica, please proceed, Dr. Ho, Dr. Howe, please proceed. Thank you very much and, and good afternoon, Council. It's my pleasure to be here today on behalf of Dr. Lawrence Lowe, who's taking a very well-deserved vacation this week. Um, so today, I'm going to be giving you an update on the recent increase of COVID-19 in Peel and speak about Peel Public Health's collaboration with schools in Peel Region for a safe reopening. To date, Peel Region has had 8,100 cases of COVID-19, of which around 800 are active and around 7,200 are recovered. There have been 326 deaths in total. Over the past week, from August 31st to September 6th, we've had 350 active cases in Peel, of which 23% reside in Mississauga and around 75% in Brampton. This is an increase of cases in Peel at levels we have not seen since June, since the latter phase of one reopening. Overall, in the last week, we have seen a large range in the daily case numbers from the low 30s to the low 70s. We had our peak on September 6th at 73 cases, and in the last three days, September 7th, 8th, and 9th, they've come back down to the low 30s. Another notable trend is the age breakdown of cases as we continue to see younger age groups make up the largest proportion of our cases. Our cases in Peel um, include 73% of those under the age of 50, with those in the 20 to 40 year old age range making up around 40% of cases and those less than 19 eight years of age making up 17%. Since stage two reopening, we've seen a steady proportion of cases that are community-based and from large social gatherings, but also an increasing proportion of cases in the same households, an increasing proportion of cases due to travel, as well as a number of workplace outbreaks. With this increase in cases, it's even more important for everyone to continue practicing the core four behaviors. Um, such as keeping your distance and uh, continuing to socialize outdoors preferentially while maintaining physical distancing if people are not in your social circles, washing and sanitizing your hands, masking, and getting tested if you have symptoms and staying home until your test results are back. Now I'd like to focus on the reopening of schools as this is the first week of school and I know that many parents and students are excited and perhaps um, a bit concerned about the rise in COVID-19 cases as well. And so I'm going to update council on our collaboration with school boards as well as our post-secondary institutions. 
This is certainly a different school year, and we have been following the provincial guidance for reopening schools and supporting our school board partners throughout. So for elementary students, this might mean look something a little bit different, such as class bubbles that are maintained throughout lunch and recess, something known as a cohort. For high school students, this is alternating between online and in-person learning to stay within a small cohort as well. And this week in particular, our school boards have both focused on a limited attendance throughout the week to focus on teaching students uh, health and safety protocols. Peel Public Health is hiring at the moment and using existing school health nurses to assist schools with infection prevention and control measures and to rapidly investigate cases of COVID-19 in schools and contact those who may have been exposed. To date, we've had two lab-confirmed cases uh, in Peel schools and we're able to work with our school board partners to quickly notify close contacts and recommend testing as needed. Any confirmed cases of COVID-19 in a school will be communicated to the school community. And as uh, Nancy alluded to before, both um, uh, we are both uh, posting cases on our website shortly, as well as uh, cases within each school's uh, particular website. In addition, we will be hosting a tabletop exercise with our hospital partners and both of our school boards, along with our school bus transportation partners and before and after school providers to uh, run through um, uh, an outbreak exercise to help with preparedness activities. Um, we've also done uh, some parent engagement to date with two public presentations uh, to walk through the school outbreak protocols so that parents are able to, and students able to anticipate what to expect should a case occur in their school. And we've em emphasized um, the prevention measures, particularly around uh, parents and students needing to screen on a daily basis for any symptoms for COVID-19 and to take their temperature at home. Um, and also encouraging them to practice wearing masks and having a backup supply. As well, we've uh, engaged in joint conversations with all three of our post-secondary institutions, uh, University of Toronto Mississauga site, Algoma University Brampton campus, as well as Sheridan College and both of their campuses to prepare for any outbreak scenarios as well that may occur on their campuses. We have also been involved in reviewing their quarantine plans for their international students, all of whom are required under provincial um, under the uh, Ministry of Colleges and Universities to be tested for COVID-19 prior to um, uh, at the end of their quarantine period. Lastly, I know that preparing for the anticipated second wave of COVID-19 is top of mind as we prepare to enter the fall and cold flu season as well. Most of the population is susceptible to COVID-19, so it will continue to circulate. Over the next year, we can anticipate fluctuating increases and decreases, a scenario known as peaks and valleys, as we relax and increase restrictions in response to the virus transmission patterns. Peel Public Health is working to build capacity in case and contact management and collaborate with our hospital partners and primary care to coordinate responses. We will continue to have conversations with provincial partners about rising case numbers in Peel, and strategize with regional council, our local municipalities, about the need for any additional public health measures that need to be applied should increases continue. Um, thank you so much to council for all your support during COVID-19. And I'm happy to take questions, although I will uh, proceed to answer uh, Councillor Pileshi's questions first, if I may. Yeah, yes, please. And Councillor Perleshi, you're still first up. I don't think you need to rephrase it. Uh, Monica, why don't you speak to the question that the councillor asked? Sure. So I believe there were um, three questions posed by Councillor Perleshi. I'll take them in turn. The first one is, what is Brampton doing about the testing centre? And is having only one testing centre um, a barrier to uh, diagnosing and quickly um, getting these uh, COVID cases diagnosed? So Monica, just sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. It's not particularly what Brampton is doing, what re the region is doing. Oh, sorry. That's um, okay. okay. 
sorry, I thought you meant to, talking about the Oslo specific testing centers, but um, I'm, I'm more talking about the fact that so we're at the region, and I would ask that question if what Brampton is doing for Brampton in in Brampton, but oh, okay, not sorry. At the region, yep. what what the region's doing for Brampton, right. So uh, throughout COVID, we've uh, really focused on um, both uh, trying to do uh, the kind of proactive pieces, but also um, uh, really focus on case and contact management and control. So uh, whenever there is a case, regardless of wherever it is in the community, uh, in Peel region, we quickly act to, to interview the cases and contact trace them. Um, in, in particular, I, what w the patterns of transmission that we've seen, including large household transmissions, we do find that uh, there are particularly um, uh, some larger households uh, within the Brampton region. And so that makes, uh, if it does get introduced into a household, then it can spread um, easily. Um, and so that is certainly uh, perhaps one of the reasons for for higher higher cases. Um, the other one is around uh, particularly around travel and we do know that um, uh, travel is also uh, an increasing proportion of cases. Um, workplace outbreaks, we, uh, we, we, we do certainly try to do some proactive measures with workplaces. And over the summer, we had a series of webinars with both the city of Mississauga and I believe the city of Brampton to try to reach out to um, Peel Industries and workplaces to optimize their infection prevention and control measures. We do know that people in the region work and live um, qu quite fluidly across borders. And for example, um, the uh, particular um, outbreak that you mentioned, uh, the recent to large one that we had, which was a Mississauga workplace. Uh, however, the majority of the people actually lived in Brampton. So we have been working with our workplaces to improve their infection prevention control measures and to bring people on site um, to help out with, with those um, measures in conjunction with our partners at the Ministry of Labor. Um, we continue to work with our hospital partners as well um, to establish very rapid communications about any cases and have recently set up a communications cascade so we can get um, quick notification of uh, any cases in schools. And so we're trying to focus on um, uh, those, those top um, uh, reasons for, uh, for transmission. Okay. Um, so I guess the, I, and, and I'm not saying that we need to name the company. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but I, I just kind of wanted to know why um, the company wasn't named, why it is um, uh, confidential, and and why Maple Lodge Farms was named when they had an outbreak. And then I'd also like to know um, <clears throat> the outbreak that happened in Mississauga do we know if it was like where was that traced back to? Was it traced back to one of the workers that li happened to live in Brampton that brought it there and and infected? Um, it caused the outbreak. Um, I don't have that level of detail of information on me right now in terms of where the first person who brought it in, um, but certainly can can get back to you about that. Um, with regards to to workplace outbreaks, certainly we've learned a lot throughout COVID. And um, the, the particular workplace, uh, Maple Lodge, was one of our earliest ones that we dealt with. Um, and I believe that um, they were, you know, we've had great collaboration with them throughout that outbreak, and they've been uh, fantastic to date um, in terms of implementing the control measures. And um, I believe they were very clear with their communication to their staff about every single COVID case that happened. And I don't recall uh, at the moment what exactly how the communication came out, but I do believe there was an element of, um, of, of communication to the public from perhaps one of the workers as well. So I think once, once if, if something is um, out there in the, in the media, um, I, you know, I think at that point, um, it is in the public domain and it's out of our hands. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. And okay. Um, yeah. so I, and I, 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 I'm okay. I, I agree with, you know, it's, it was early on and, and they were one of the 
probably the first outside of um, outside of Edmonton, I think, that uh, um, a company like this had uh, had an outbreak. So, um, so maybe it was just it was a little bit early on, and maybe there was um, a potential risk to uh, to other people outside of the uh, the company that you know we don't know and 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 I don't know and um, I guess um, the other question that I had and and it it more relates to um, what more we can do in Brampton that essentially will help all of the region appeal with uh, with infections and you, you had uh, mentioned that um, some of the um, cases are because of travel does that mean um, they brought they brought the uh, infection in from um, from outside of, of Canada outside of the region appeal outside of uh, Ontario like is that yeah. Yeah, so generally the uh, travel-related cases are considered to be those outside of um, Ontario, but largely internationally. And we do have a large good, good movement sector uh, within Peel. And so some of our cases have occurred within the trucking industry. Um, in addition to uh, further afield, um, we did do a travel analysis um, a few weeks ago, and the top two um, international countries were from India and Pakistan. And okay, so goods movement. Um, are we talking? Are we talking people? Or are we talking um, um, materials? And have I haven't heard, ever heard much of somebody getting infected from um, from a material coming from outside of outside oh, of Canada? Right. Is, that what, is that what you're referring to? No, no. I'm sorry. I'm, what I meant was. Um, uh, through transportation, through the transportation industry. Um, we do know that, the, for example, in the U.S., uh, COVID rates are quite high, um, and it does continue to pose a risk to our, our um, workers who do work there and our cross-border workers. Okay. Um, so, okay, so back to the um, international travelers that are coming in, and in, in the newspaper it had mentioned that uh, mainly international students that were coming in um, that live in Brampton. So what outreach have we done to the airport to ensure that they're not bringing anybody in that's infected? Because ultimately this is where it started, right? The airport didn't act that the government didn't act fast enough to stop this virus from coming in. So I I had recently talked to somebody that had come from an infected uh, country uh, with a lot higher numbers than, than we did, and he had indicated to me that the whole process from start to finish is completely flawed where it's on, they're only asking questions. From my understanding, the airport is still only asking questions. They're not, they're not testing, which I think they should be doing. They're not decontaminating, which I think they should be doing. They're not, they're not even checking temperatures. They're asking questions, and then they're giving somebody a little package with a glove, with gloves in it, with a mask in it. Um, and asking them to quarantine. And then if you go to the airport and look at the garbages just outside of the airport, you'll see the garbages are filled with a bunch of little packages that have masks in them, that have gloves in them, and a little how to quarantine package. So what what are we doing? The, the airport is in the region appeal. Yes, it's federal regulated land, and, and um, there's probably not much we can do other than we we stop all taxis going into the airport. We stop shut down the roads going into the, in and out of the airport. Like if you're international traveling, you're not welcome because you you may be infected. Yeah, it, unless they're unless they're going to start properly testing. Right. We've shut we've shut down our borders. So. So. Um, so, Councillor Pelleschi, I'm happy to speak to, to kind of the federal quarantine process, which, as you as you're correct, um, is a federal process, but also to the great efforts that our post-secondary institutions have made with trying to ensure the safety of of international students. 
So uh, with regards to the federal quarantine program, they are, um, you know, asking travelers and, and ensuring and doing an interview at that time to ensure that they have a safe place to quarantine. If they don't think that their quarantine plan is adequate, then there is an airport located, I'm sorry, a hotel located close to the airport, which is deemed to be a federal quarantine site. Um, and they are then uh, escorted there if they don't uh, have a good quarantine plan from the airport. Um, I believe that uh, uh, checks, uh, phone checks are also made. I'm not um, sure about the frequency, but I believe there are checks made. And as well, there is an ability to enforce the Quarantine Act through, um, through uh, Peel Regional Police. Uh, any complaints that are made there are, are uh, sent to our local police. Um, so certainly there, there is that process in place. I think if it was of interest, um, we could certainly bring back more information to council around the exact um, program and, and measures that are in place. Um, okay, so I'm going to, I'm just going to go into one little story, and that's just the fact that I know of somebody that is, um, has recently traveled and, and didn't travel for any other person purpose and this is in this last month and he said it was a joke getting over the border and then coming back and he didn't go over for work and he didn't go over for anything else so when i say international travels and stopping that i'm not referring to you know canadian citizens i'm not referring to international students that are that are that are coming here that are 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 legally allowed to come here through, you know, whatever work visas or student visas um, um, that they have. Is I'm just I'm just saying that the border right now is, even though it states that it's closed, it's a little bit of a joke. So um, maybe if there's a possibility that I I can ask for. Um, more information on what the what the airport um, is doing, uh, what communications and advocacy we're having with um, with the feds and with the with the airport in terms of what they can be doing, if they can be doing anything better, um, and also what I'd like to uh, see come back is, um, and I don't think anything anybody would disagree because uh, effectively it affects it affects. Brampton with the numbers, but it, as the latest case, you can see um, with a company in Mississauga, the outbreak with the majority of those workers coming from Brampton, it also affects uh, everybody in the region of Peel and surrounding areas. So what else can we be doing in Brampton to for people to better understand um, that they need to be social distancing they need to be wearing masks when they're when they're out when they're in groups when social distancing is not it's people i think people seem to think that okay we're allowed 50 people a 50 person party outdoors that's great but then when they're so close together it's they're throwing that out the window because there's another rule that says you need to be six feet apart but they're not doing that they yeah. just know that they're allowed to be you know or so it's 50 people indoors 100 people outdoors so they're not getting they're not getting the fact that the main thing here is that social distancing so you can be here with 100 people you just can't be within six feet of them and i think that's well, that's kind of where we're losing touch here and and maybe or people maybe just seem to not care but if um if you can come back with something like what what more can we be doing here in brampton because this spells second wave to me um coming and coming fast and it, at the worst possible time um you know i just heard that i think we we now have two teachers in the region of peel that just tested positive and school barely even hasn't even started i'm at the end of the orientation for my three kids that are going to school tomorrow and i know only a few things i know that I'll get a call if there's a problem at the school, but I won't know or I won't have any other information. I won't know if the school that happens to be right next door has has transferred anything. I won't know if that school ever had has an outbreak. So there's there's a lot of you know unanswered questions. Uh, I think the government has done what they can do for for the kids, but you know I'm still I'm a single father of three, worried about sending my three kids. Uh, to school tomorrow, um, and that they're not going to see their 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 nanny for for like four weeks because she's afraid that something's going to happen. Right? There's going to be an outbreak. There's going to be a second wave. 
So it's unfortunate, but if we can maybe just look at Brampton and see what else we can be doing and any suggestions will be great. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Michael. On that, uh, Commissioner Granger may have some thoughts. Kathy? Yeah, through you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Pileshi, for your fulsome questions. With regards to the airport, we just recently went on a tour of Pearson, and we were quite impressed with the uh, enhanced infection prevention and control measures that they put in, but we're happy to bring a report with some further information. We were, we were quite impressed with their enhanced cleaning, their temperature checking, their, uh, the way they isolated um, uh, people when they had con a higher temperature. So we're happy to bring a report back with some further details. As uh, our CAO mentioned, in, in terms of your, your uh, question about schools and outbreaks in schools, as our CAO mentioned, we're enhancing our, um, our, our database. So that information will be uh, regularly available to you. So you'll have that information. Um, so I hope that will alleviate some of your fears about schools that are close by. And in terms of your question with regards to enhanced communication, we totally agree. We have to continue to work together with our community to get the message out that, we, that we're not, this is not over yet. And we have to continue to practice the core four and work together so that um, we don't end up in a large second wave. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I appreciate it. I appreciate um, knowing a little bit more of what's coming back and, and whatever we can do to help. Can you please, uh, I know, I know the region has been great in getting the information out to us, but if there's anything else that you think that we can help as, uh, as counselors to uh, uh, spread the word instead of spreading the virus, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. My list is Demerla Sato Crombie Raz, Councillor Demerla. Sorry, I forgot to uh, lower my hand. No uh, problem. Now. Councillor Sato. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Monica, for uh, for the report and answering the questions. Um, ju just before I, I make my three question comments, um, I just want to follow up that I agree with Councillor Pileshi that I, I think now that we're getting into the school season in particular, that we need to really start pushing those messages of the distancing again. Um, I think we've got the message of the masks indoors. Um, I think people have uh, have understood that because when they go shopping, when they go anywhere, it's a requirement or, you know, they're not allowed in. Um, but the the distancing, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that as well, that, you know, if you're outdoors, it, people think that it's okay. And... You know, we saw um, videos of, of high school students, and I got some reports from uh, from my own residents saying that, you know, when they go into the school, they're being checked, they wear their mask. But before they go into school and when they come back out, you've got groups of teenagers hanging around, no masks, close together, talking. So um, I know we're bringing in more public health nurses, but I would hope also that the schools are doing a lot more messaging of what the kids are doing outside the school and not just thinking about what's inside the building because it's the outdoor, it's the, the outdoor congregating that, that I think is, uh, is probably going to be more of a problem than the indoor um, when it comes to, well, com when it comes to any people. So I, I'd ask that that be stronger. Um, Councillor Pileshi raised the issue of the testing centers and, uh, the four hour wait in Brampton and the complaints I was getting at the beginning, uh, the end of August was that the wait at Credit Valley has been consistently two hours. And I had a uh, discussion with Dr. Lowe on that and he agreed that, um, you know, people, they're not gonna go and wait for two hours so they're not necessarily going to get tested and they probably should. And he did, did tell me that, um, I guess there, you were in conversation with the province to increase um, accessibility to testing within the region of Peel. I haven't seen any of that happening. I think they did add some in Brampton. But, um, you know, get, with everything starting back up again, our community centers, um, programming and everything, we should be really having easier access to testing. So is, is there any progress on that? 
Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Councillor Seda. I'm happy to speak to it. Um, with regards to the uh, congregation of teenagers, I'll take that back to the school board. So uh, we do meet with them regularly. So I'll pass on your message and comment. With regards to um, increasing testing capacity, the lead agency for testing is Ontario Health right. and the Central Region. And they've worked really hard with our hospital partners, but they're also trying to work with primary care and expand access to other modalities, recognizing that um, hospitals can't be the only place to, to do testing. I do know that there's provincial discussions with the Ontario Pharmacists Association, for example, to try to increase pharmacy testing as well, though a clear timeline for that is not, not known yet. So um, alternative modes of, of testing are being um, looked at, but um, uh, the progress on that uh, it lies with Ontario Health, but we can certainly check in with our partners and see how that's going. The other key consideration that we're trying to figure out is should there be um, an outbreak in a school that we will use our mobile testing team, which we, as you know, have used in long-term care home settings uh, when there's been an outbreak. So that includes both a small swab team from Ontario Public Health, but also a great partnership with our paramedics. And so we're trying, should, should there be a case um, then uh, we, we're in the process of working on those logistics with our school boards to be able to try to um, do some community-based um, faster access. So plans are certainly in the works, but in general, um, the testing capacity is, is certainly being looked at to be expanded. Well, I, I think we need to, um, and maybe it needs to be the mayors and the chair, to um, be pushing the province. Because, I mean, when you look at the numbers in Peel, um, it is very worrisome to us, but it's also very worrisome to our residents when they see those numbers. And, you know, these are the questions they're asking, well, what, what is Peel Health doing about it? And, you know, I'm saying, well, that's up to the province. And, um, but, but I think, you know, we, we do need to be pushing it. And I know Dr. Lowe said that those conversations were going on, and I'm sure he is pushing it and you are pushing it to the province, but, um, but they, they I, I haven't, you know, it's been several weeks since I had the discussion with them and uh, and just listening to Councillor Pileshi, I mean, the same, the same issue and probably even a little worse up in Brampton. Um, with the going back to school, what, what advice um, are we giving families with regard to their bubble? Uh, you know, I, I have two grandkids, and uh, they're they're in halt, and they're not starting school until next week. But um, basically, as of next week, I said to them, "You're kind of out of my bubble," <laughs> which um, which you know, which is sad. And uh, listening to Councillor Pileshi, who was saying that you know his kids won't be able to see their their grandmother. Um, now that they're going back into school. So should we be, because I haven't seen much on this, I actually haven't seen any advice. Um, should we be giving advice to families that have school children or, or um, adults who are working in schools, whether they're teachers or, um, or other professionals in schools, what should they be doing with regard to their family bubble? Thank you. And that's a great question. We have certainly posed it back to the province because we recognize that it would be a point of confusion for the general public if your bubble is supposed to be 10. And how does that happen now that you've expanded your cohorts um, in, in school? I, I, I understand the conundrum. Absolutely. Um, so whenever you expand your contacts, you will be expanding your risk of exposure. And that is generally, um, you know, particularly around visiting grandparents, probably an individual decision that you need to make that will depend on, you know, a person's health status um, and the degree of contact that you can have. I imagine your interactions with um, an older grandchild versus a very young one might be different in terms of the amount of physical contact that, that needs or could, could happen. As in general, if people are at higher risk of COVID, you would want to take some extra precautions. And I mean, you know, you can have your outdoor visits, your physical distancing, and still right. see people, but just taking that added layer. Um, so uh, I, I think it's a really good point and something that we can continue to message, particularly to, um, to parents as we continue to do these uh, engagement sessions uh, throughout. Okay, well, I, I would like to see some messaging on that because I haven't seen okay. any. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to depend on the province to do it because yeah. they don't seem to be. So, 
you know, at least if we can take care of it within our bubble of peel <laughs> um, and, and get that out. Um, flu, flu season, you mentioned flu season coming up. Should we be encouraging people to go and get the regular flu vaccine? Absolutely. You know, we want to be able to decrease um, the number of cold and flu or other kind, any other kind of viruses that could be confused with COVID-19. As we know that in general, like uh, anyone then who comes down with any cold-like symptoms will, should go get tested. And that will, of course, impact our, like increase demand on our testing capacity as well. So I believe, um, I haven't heard any firm timelines from the province, but it's usually sometime in October. Right. Okay, and one final question. Um, I, I have just learned, which I learned recently, that um, there was an employee at Aaron Mills Town Center who is potentially positive. I don't think they've got the actual results yet. Um, but my concern was that the mall management had sent a memo out to the staff saying that there was an employee who had been sent home to isolate. Um, this was just yesterday. Okay. Um, but there was no information on where the employee had been, what store, if it was within a store or if it was a general employee. And uh, I, I can understand when you have a workplace, you can contain that. But this is a public access facility. And um, I know I've already seen some comments coming to me that, well, you know, should we be worried? I was shopping at the mall over the last couple of days. Um, you know, why is there no information as to where that employee worked within the mall? Um, so when it comes to, and this, I guess, follows up again with Councillor Pileshi when he was talking about the businesses, yeah. um, I can understand an outbreak in a business. You're going to deal, you're going to contact, you're going to deal with everyone. But when it's an outbreak in a public setting such as a large mall that over the last two weeks with um, back to school shopping has been absolutely jam-packed with uh, with people shopping should there not be a requirement for more information to be given as soon as there's a suspected case so um, are you talking about more information from people entering stores or, uh, sorry, I No, just... from more information from the mall as to, you know, instead of just reading it in the media, which, you know, gets everyone upset, saying that an employee within what is a very large mall um, has been isolated and no, no, de no details as to where the employee worked. So you have all of these people who have been in the mall over the last, you know, week or whatever, starting to worry that, oh God, you know, was I in contact? Was it, what store was it? So mm -hmm. it's, it's the information um, sharing instead of just throwing out one little snippet of information mm -hmm. without details. Yeah, and, and certainly, um, so that's helpful to know. I, as you mentioned, it just happened yesterday. So we can follow up with Aaron Mills Town Center about their communications and, and what would be helpful. It, it, I, I think they're trying, probably trying to be transparent while protecting an individual's privacy, which is very, yeah. um, you know, it's the it's the balance, and uh, they. Uh, I, I don't like whenever we give out information, it's probably um, more helpful to have it be actionable so that you know whether or not you were within a particular risk. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you. It's not. It's not that. Uh, more further detail would have been if if they are to disclose, which is their choice, um, then that uh, we can certainly work with them on on better or more detailed communication. Um, in general, though, shopping uh, it, like malls um, have done a great job in terms of capacity limits into their stores. They have. So and they have plexiglass behind their um, cashiers, and people are masked. And they're tra often transient interactions, as you know. Exposure is considered to be 15 minutes, less than two meters. So, um, if uh, yeah, I so so generally those interactions are quite low risk. Um, but uh, but we can um, take that feedback back as we wouldn't want to cause unnecessary worry. Um, exactly. for, for residents and cause unnecessary testing as a result, further burdening the, the testing system. Yeah, make the two-hour line up three hours. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Mayor Crombie. 
Thank you. I just want to make comment on four things quickly. So first of all, the outbreak at the manufacturing facility and why it wasn't named was because it was easily isolated and the contact tracing was done. They knew who the employees were, so there was no need to alarm the public because it was contained and there are privacy issues. And unfortunately, uh, in your meatpacking plant, um, Councillor Pileshi, that was named in the press. So uh, Dr. Howe, I think you want to distinguish, you know, we are not uh, naming, um, uh, uh, um, sorry, businesses w that may have an outbreak if we can contain them. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. So that's the distinction. But I think also we probably wouldn't have named uh, your facility counselor today, but that was early days and it was named in the press. Secondly, with respect to the testing sites, so uh, Trillium Health Partners has three locations and they set up two, locate, two uh, testing sites at Credit Valley Hospital. One's an indoor, one's a drive-through, and the other one is at the Trillium, the Mississauga Hospital location. So that's why we have three, but they're both at our hospitals, and I believe yours are at your hospitals as well at William Osler. So that makes that. Um, I, I also wanted to say that I think you were overstating the travel. I had the same tour of Toronto Pearson Airport that uh, Commissioner Granger had and have a lot of confidence in what they're doing there. Um, but with respect to the travel, the numbers you gave us this week that uh, September 1st to 7th, there were only 32 cases related to travel, which was 8% uh, overall of our cases. And that was travel from the outside. And this was significantly lower than, of course, than we saw in July and August, uh, which were like 12 to 21% at the height of the pandemic. But the vast majority of the cases come through community transmission, which includes both social gatherings, large social gatherings, and workplace. And Dr. Howe, I think it would be useful, and we spoke about this on Wednesday, that we break out which are workplace, if we can distinguish it, because as Councillor Pileshi said, you know, who was case zero? Did that come from a household? Did that come from a community transmission and end up in the workplace? Or did that workplace, you know, transmit out to different households? Sometimes I think that's hard to identify, if I'm not mistaken, but it would be good to know, you know, how many are related to workplace incidents and just community gatherings or, or um, community transmission. And then the bulk of it, and that's 70% of our cases, seven mm -hmm. zero, it only <laughs> and uh, in the balance was institutional, which was in our long-term care home. So with respect of what we can do, don't expand your social bubble. I, I hear Councillor Sato, we're all worried about that too, with kids going back to school. Uh, you know, we, we know that the virus uh, moves seamlessly and it needs us to move them and that people live and work and go to school right across not only the region, but the city. There are many people who live and work here and, uh, and or live here, work elsewhere or the reverse. So that virus does get moved. I've been telling people, keep your social bubble small. <laughs> don't expand your social bubble. Don't congregate in large groups. Don't go participate when there, you know there's going to be a large group and then practice those core four as we know where your face covering, et cetera. Don't feel well, stay home. And, uh, and then as was said, and I was included this in my notes to get that flu vaccine. So at least we can eliminate that because, you know, I'm starting to suspect that as soon as someone gets the sniffles because they're about to have a cold, everyone's going to get very nervous being around them. So, you know, that's the message Mayor Brown and I both have been giving. And you've heard him very publicly say, don't expand your social circle. Circle just because you're allowed 50 people inside and 100 outside doesn't mean you have to. <laughs> you have to um, invite so many people. It's just a bigger risk and uh, we always knew with phase three the risk of transmission would be greater and the numbers have creeped up a little bit so uh, we just have to continue to be very vigilant we just continue to practice those core four and not expand our social bubbles so that you know it's as simple as that councillor fleshy that virus moves and if we don't move it then it won't then it won't be continue to be transmitted so i think that's all i wanted to say i just wanted to comment on those uh four items, the test center, the outbreak, what can be done, and where the tra uh, where the transmission is occurring uh, in the community. So thank you. Those are my comments. Oh, thank and if you. Dr. Howe could comment on maybe 
would she consider breaking out workplace and maybe even schools now that I think about it, right? We should yes. maybe have a category for uh, workplace and then schools so we can track those. Yeah, we'll take your feedback back to our epidemiology team. Thank you, Councilor Raz. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. A lot of good conversation today, and I think uh, a lot of us have many concerns. I'm just going to uh, jump on to some of Councillor Pelushi's points. Um, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to workplace outbreaks, if, if those people from those workplaces go out to lunch in the nearby community, I think if I'm, you know, one of those sandwich shops that gets visited by people from that workplace, I'd want to know. So my question is, are we one of the few jurisdictions that uh, don't share that information or is that pretty consistent across the board? And I think that is something that we need to revisit. So I'll leave that with you. Um, uh, I do have some concerns that by not being as open and transparent that we could be, we might be missing potential cases. So that's my concern there. Um, with respect to the GTAA, it sounds like there was a few people that went on a um, that went on a good tour, but the rest of us are kind of in the dark, other than reading about what may or may not appear in the news. So, if uh, we can formally request either uh, the GTAA or the Feds and or both to give us a better sense in Peel Region of what those um, measures are being, what measures are being done at the uh, airport and how the Feds are protecting our our local community um, uh, from from potential outbreaks when they're not doing their due diligence on on tracking um, people who should be in quarantine or not taking the right measures. Uh, just a little anecdote: last uh, week I was driving by a house in Lorne Park. Here we have some larger properties. It looked like there was at least you know, 50 to 100 people. Um, it looked like some type of ceremony, it could have been a wedding, and um, people were, as I drove by, people were leaving. Um, but there's a lot of hugging and kissing going on, and I just kind of shook my head going, people still aren't getting that message. So maybe we went to the 100 people allowance too quickly, um, and also that the core four still isn't resonating. We have more work to do on that. So we need. I think we need to share info, and I can't remember the phrase that Councillor Pleshi used, spread the word, not the virus. It is exactly that. Uh, we need to get continue to get the message out there, and I know that people are are, are s not sick of hearing about it, but they, they're COVID tired, they're fatigued um, about uh, hearing it. But the problem is we can't emphasize that message enough, especially as we're getting into fall. Um, are there plans to ramp up testing in the area, not only because Peel is more of a hot spot, but um, because as schools are, um, uh, are opening, we know that there's going to be an increased cases. Parents and, uh, and children can't afford to wait in line for three to four hours um, when they need to go get tested. So what are the plans to ramp up testing? Thank you very much for your comments. If I may go back to some earlier ones and then sure. work through your list. So with regards to the workplace um, disclosures, there's a number of factors that need to be taken into consideration uh, into consideration, sorry, in addition to privacy. So obviously there's um, uh, privacy and we have laws under personal health protection act uh, to, to try to protect individuals privacy as much as possible. Should workplaces be disclosed, there's it's, it's easier to try to figure out who may have been a case at a particular location. The other th um, consideration is around, um, and perhaps um, this was alluded to earlier around why um, if, if, if workplaces are named publicly, there may be some detriment to their economic um, business and viability as a result um, because either uh, people may not uh, use their products or, or just uh, have some reputational risk and loss there when that's not necessary to contain the actual public health risk. The third point is around um, uh, also cooperation from employers. We really rely on uh, the use, our, our ability to collaborate with employers to rapidly conduct our contact tracing investigations. And if employers are worried that um, their uh, businesses will be in the public domain, then they are less, they may be less likely to cooperate with us. And often we find that people know that they work with so-and-so, but they don't know their phone number. And so we really rely on getting the cooperation of the employer to do so. 
So can I just jump in there for one yeah. second? When it comes to grocery stores, we hear, do they proactively um, uh, let, uh, through the media, do they proactively let the public know that there's been an outbreak or are they required to report publicly? Uh, no, there's no there's no public reporting required. Grocery stores, as you know, have taken extensive control measures, including plexiglass and mandated masking, and the interactions tend to be brief as well. And so there have been inter or there have been outbreaks in several grocery stores, and they haven't suffered economically. So I, I think it's a matter of public interest, um, because if you're probably more likely as a member of the public to get exposed at a grocery store, yet um, some have uh, reported publicly and they haven't seen any economic decline. They, you know, they shut the store for a few hours, do a deep sanitization, and the store opens back up and people are right back to it. Sure. So it might not always be the case that that will definitely happen, but we certainly need the cooperation of the employers. And in some rare instances, we've had employers actively tell their employees not to tell us that they work there. Mm, so, interesting. Yeah. And that has hindered um, our investigations. So it, it does have unintended consequences, I think, too. Um, and what was the last point? I was the thinking? ramp up for testing. Right, right. Uh, yes, so absolutely. This is a key priority for Ontario Health, and they have um, uh, a few strategies in place, both from the assessment centre capacity, a community arm, and then also a mobile testing arm. And so uh, we do have representation in collaboration with them to try to help to identify from an epidemiologic and a surveillance perspective where it may be helpful to concentrate some of that testing. We did do a lot of um, community mobile testing earlier when case numbers were down and found that the yield was actually quite low. Um, and that was uh, from the cost benefit ratio not as helpful and perhaps that was because the cases were declining. Um, so we'll re-examine that. We certainly provide that surveillance data to them and are working in conjunction with them. But um, I think um, ultimately what we would love to see is to be able to go to your primary care provider and to be able to get tested or through a pharmacy, like just expanding the reach so that people don't have to wait in, in line as long. Should there be a case at school, we will be um, arranging and coordinating um, more catered testing to that particular group and those plans are actively underway to be able to arrange that, that testing because we certainly wouldn't want worried um, students and parents to, to have to wait through a long queue. So we are trying to work with our partners to have a more um, expedited process. Okay. Um, maybe it could be a better use of Tim Horton's drive throughs <laughs> Okay. Um, last question. Are we going to be doing any specific messaging? I, I know that seniors in my area, I represent an area that has a, um, a certainly an aging population. And uh, is there anything that I can share specifically for seniors to take additional measures other than what has already been communicated to, um, uh, to try to protect uh, themselves and those around them? Yeah, um, for seniors, I think uh, certainly the usual things around getting your flu shot, getting your pneumonia shot as well. Um, and uh, if you do, if they do have grandchildren, you know, now that they're entering school to take more of those precautions to try to do the visits outside. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hope, very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. My list is Santos, Paleshi, Brown, Fortini, Councillor Santos. Thank you so much, uh, through you, Chair, to Dr. Howe. Um, Councillor Vicente and I recently had a meeting with somebody who gave us information about mobile testing buses um, and how they've used mobile testing buses, so they've retrofitted traditional buses, and we've worked, and the City of Brampton has apparently worked with um, MTB Solutions before. And they retrofit the mobile testing buses into mobile testing sites. And I would imagine something like that would be super useful because to um, uh, the point of sitting in line in your car for three hours is a disincentive. Um, and we want to make testing as convenient as possible. So it, when we're, if we identify hotspots or if there's a school or a, a business that has an outbreak, we could easily uh, dispatch a mobile testing bus and get tests done right away. Or if in Brampton, one of the biggest problems is um, a number of different uh, people who live in the same household, we could send a mobile testing bus and test that whole entire family so, so that the whole family is not sitting um, in, in, the, in the testing center for so long. So have, have we looked at 
options like that. I know that MTV Solutions is also speaking with the province, but is there a way for the region of Peel to just do it? Like, can we just do something like that? Uh, thank you, Councillor Santos, for the question. And certainly these methods have been tried in the past and we do have a small in-home swabbing program for people who may be waiting, um, who may be more homebound and awaiting, for example, placement in long-term care. So those specific referrals for those unique situations are, are in place. Um, but uh, with regards to mobile testing, we did try to do um, a few uh, uh, for workplaces that were in outbreaks, but we found um, sometimes logistics, and this is found in the long-term care home experience with the different shifts occurring, it's sometimes hard to capture everyone all at once and, and may require more time, but also that um, it really needed to be driven, um, and I think this is just a general message for testing. It really needs to be driven by the epidemiology to, to really be able to detect cases where it's likely to have. There's been a lot of surveillance testing that's happened with very low um, detection rates. If it's not uh, um, kind of informed by uh, uh, by by the epidemiology. So for example, um, one of the workplaces we tried out, we, we piloted it as a first one, one of their um, evening shift tested because the, case, the outbreak was on their other shift and we found no cases. So we're learning over time about what is the most effective use of the resources in conjunction with trying to prioritize at this moment a mobile testing strategy for schools. So absolutely trying to, to, to work through um, all those um, uh, considerations, but uh, these, these methods are in place in terms of having uh, mobile um, community testing at a particular community site, or, or I believe that uh, they've used buses as well in the past. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pileshi. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to um, make sure that nothing goes uh, um, without uh, any inaccuracies. Maple Lodge Farms was named in an email from the region prior to me seeing it in the media. There are no Brampton hospitals that have testing centers currently in the city of Brampton. Uh, Brampton had to open up its recreation facility to have our one and only testing center and it was through Mayor Brown's advocacy that was just announced yesterday that uh, a hospital in Brampton would finally be getting a testing center and ultimately we know that community spread is the highest way to catch it but ultimately everything came from international travel so thank you. Um, but yes, Mayor, bon Mayor Crombie, the core four is very important. And yes, Councillor Raz, spread the word, not the virus. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Michael. Mayor Brown. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, some follow-up uh, questions, um, because we're having some conversations around um, the requirement for transparency on, on, on outbreaks. And given the current one we're having right now, um, uh, is I think the largest we've had in the entirety of the, of the pandemic. I do get lots of constituents who want to know where it happens. I know Councillor Raz was saying, and you know, what if you're the, the nearby um, sandwich shop? You know, do we owe them that level of transparency? I remember us talking about this five months ago, and you know whether. Um, it happens in Caledon, Brampton, or, or Mississauga, and then this one may be a factory in Mississauga, but wherever it happens, um, and I really struggle with the fact that we are um, hesitant to, to share the names, and, and I, I sort of want to know what the basis is for that, uh, what, what the requirement is. Yesterday, I got a call from the Globe and Mail, and they asked me why there's a higher standard in Peel Region for the disclosure of names um, when it comes to workplace outbreaks. And, and frankly, I didn't have much to say other than that I, I felt uh, that we should be as transparent as possible. And they said to me, did you know you have a much higher standard in Peel than there is in York Region where um, the, uh, the, the names are, are disclosed regularly to the media? And so can you help me with this? Um, sure. when, 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 we're, when we're getting media inquiries saying that we have a much stricter uh, standard in, tone, in terms of the disclosure of names. What is our rationale for that? And um, who's? And they were asking me: Is it is it city council? Is it regional council that set this that this higher threshold, or is this a decision by the medical officer of health? And so, um, who sets the standard in terms of the requirements on disclosure? 
Thank you very much, Mayor Brown, for your question. Um, so in terms of uh, disclosure, generally, there are provincially mandated guidelines. Um, so for example, in the recent school outbreak guidance, uh, there is a, a guidance to indicate that all school cases will be um, publicly disclosed and that school boards need to have a website specifically to each school where it will be posted. And as such, we will continue to reflect the cases um, uh, on our website as well as, as another institution is uh, going to be uh, reflected there. But so if, -term care, sorry. So if, if we if we say that when there's a long-term care outbreak or a, su uh, a school outbreak of, of simply um, one or, or two cases, um, could we not have a similar threshold for workplace outbreaks since it maybe doesn't need to be as, as stringent? Maybe it could be if there's if there's 10 um, that, that we, we inform the, the, the public. Like, it, what, what is the downside of being more transparent? I think um, to reiterate some of my comments to Councillor Ross before, uh, we ultimately, at the end of the day, want to be able to get the cooperation of the employers to be able to assist us with contact tracing. And unfortunately, in our past experiences, some employers have been reluctant, even without knowing that the publication of their workplace, to cooperate with us because they are concerned um, that their workplace might be closed and that their business might be uh, suffer as a result. And so they, and, and, and what, what would you say to the um, question posed from the Global Mail that we have a higher uh, standard um, for releasing the name than York Region? So certainly we have discussions amongst the GTA health units around our, uh, our approaches to disclosure. And my understanding from our York Region colleagues um, and uh, from previous discussions in the past is that should any uh, risk to the public be uh, there where they're not able to effectively contact trace, then at that time, then they would, um, for example, uh, disclose. So uh, we I can point to a couple of high profile examples. Um, lately, there was a um, case Cases where there was no poor record keeping at an adult entertainment in, uh, facility in in Toronto, and that re required public disclosure, um, or uh, other other such instances uh, where there are no records, and therefore it is very difficult to contact trace. Should we um, have that? Uh, in in a particular instance, particularly I know in some jurisdictions. Um, uh, uh, they, with those more public settings um, where there is poor record keeping, then we haven't yet encountered that. But should we encounter that, um, we would, and there was a risk, we would certainly, I think, move to disclose at that point because there are provisions under the Personal Health Information Protection Act, Protection Act to be able to do so should it, is, is, if it's required to mitigate public risk. Yeah. With regards to anyone who may be um, eating lunch, certainly we continue to contact trace those peoples and all of their movements within their period of communicability. Yeah, so, you know, and I, I would just put it out there that I, you know, I struggle to um, fully appreciate why we would um, disclose um, a school or a long-term care facility with one case and not um, a workplace outbreak with up to uh, 60 cases. And, and I hope at some point we have a broader conversation on that. But I wanted to focus on um, the travel-related cases for a second. I think Councillor Pleshi makes um, a good point here in the sense that um, are you confident that we have um, the full cooperation um, and transparency in, 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 let's use the 32 cases from the last week, of uh, where those 32 individuals um, went to else they might have talked to. Um, uh, you know, they're supposed to be self-quarantining, right? And so yeah. for them to admit to you that they're not, um, uh, they probably don't want to admit to that. And so are you confident? Are you 100% confident we're getting uh, cooperation and, uh, and, and honesty from the, from the 32 cases? So certainly we, um, every every positive case, not just those with travel, we uh, give them a copy uh, and read out to them their obligations under the Health Protection Promotion Act around their isolation requirements. Uh, so they understand that if we have um, complaints or any evidence that they are not uh, fulfilling their isolation requirements, then we can certainly um, have measures to uh, 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 
sometimes we do visits where we drop off another strongly worded letter and continue to counsel them and follow up with them on a, uh, on a regular basis. Um, cool. It's regards, uh, I think, unless uh, other countries, I believe, have done um, surveillance of their returning travelers, but we this is not um, um, a method that's used in, in Canada. And so we're not sure whether that 32 could have infected many others. Uh, so certainly we we take people's word. Uh, we, for the most part, um, we operate under a, uh, a an assumption of trust. But if we do have concerns, if they are raising red flags that uh, that they might not be honest, um, then we certainly take measures to to follow up more closely um, and uh, remind them of their obligations to isolate. Mayor Any Brown? Yeah. Mayor Brown, is that it? Mayor Brown, can you hear me? We may have lost you. Okay, I'll go on, and if the mayor comes back on, we'll deal with them on the list. My next up is Councillor Fortini. Thank you, through the chair. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, yes, my questions were mostly uh, what uh, our mayor said, Brown and Councillor Pileshi, you know, uh, the 32 students. But what I find is uh, tracing. So I have someone around the corner that was away. So I did see him Saturday cutting the grass outside. Maybe that would be fine. But into Sunday, I go into Home Depot and he's there. So we don't have any tracing, I guess, to follow up to make sure these people stay inside. Now, he did have a mask because when you go to these stores, uh, these big box stores like you know, Home Depot, Rona, they actually supply you with uh, the masks and all, and you cannot enter. But well, you know, he's supposed to be inside 14 days and we have no really tracing or following up. Hey, you're going to be inside or you're going to be outside. Thank you, Councillor Fratini, for this for this question. I think um, certainly when we bring back more information and um, speak to our federal colleagues about what their follow up is, we can uh, round that out with with um, with our information. Uh, because it, I think there's a distinction between the obligations of returning travelers who are not positive and that we do not therefore know of. We don't get those names uh, referred to us. It's a federal obligation and federal quarantine act, whereas those cases that are positive and supposed to be isolating, we do know of, and we do have an obligation to follow up on. So if should you be concerned that there's any, um, or should residents be concerned that anyone is breaching the quarantine act, uh, you can certainly call our number. We'll refer the matter on to the um, Peel Regional Police. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And what else I'm finding out, like, you know, this morning you go to a bakery uh, where I usually go, these little stores, I see people coming in and out with no masks, and there's a lot of people in, into a little store that was like 12 to 1,400 square feet. And mm -hmm. it's not right that some of the stores follow the law and the procedure, and others don't. So, you know, we gotta, we don't have, I think, enough manpower to go around and saying, finding these people, uh, you have, they have a sign on the door, it doesn't mean they just walk in and they do what they want and they walk back out and with groceries and stuff, these small stores. So uh, do we have any measures like our manpower to when there's a complaint to go to these stores and say, hey, we caught you guys with, you know, people inside, there was no masks in and out and so many people. Uh, thanks for the question. So certainly uh, when we do have uh, our public health inspectors do uh, respond to complaints about lack of social distancing um, and we have taken some proactive measures with um, uh, trying to, to remind particular chains uh, that there have been uh, repeat complaints. Um, but with regards to the masking, I think that's, that is a, di a bit of a difficult issue because we don't know if those ma um, individuals have ma a mask exemption. And um, we do know that uh, proof of an exemption is not required and important to recognize that in some of those cases, people actually are exempt. So it's, it's a difficult picture, but should those... Um, those stores could put in capacity limits and should be so that they have adequate distancing markers in place so that even if you aren't wearing a mask, you still have that added layer of protection with the distancing. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. I, I get that point. So we won't have no names when people come from international. We don't have the list of names to go check and say, make it's, sure they're at home. Right. It's a federal responsibility. It's, um, it's not a local. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, um, Councillor. Sorry, Councillor Fortini. Anything further? 
Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Sato. I was going to say, uh, Chair Nika, I, I, I'm back. The internet went out. If I could at some point continue the question. Why don't you carry on right now? Yes, Mayor Brown, go ahead. Okay. The example that I was giving um, was that yesterday I got an email from a constituent who said they had their neighbor who was coming back from international travel and was going about their affairs like nothing had happened. Um, the region appeal and public health said to contact the police. They sent me the response from the police and the police said contact public health um, about it. And so there seems to be a breakdown in, in communication. And so if this is the federal government's responsibility, they're not doing it. And if we have, if we have um, a challenge in Peel region, well, we have one of the most um, diverse regions in Canada um, where travel is common. We heard from on a previous public health uh, briefing that we have Sorry, Mr. Mayor, you've been cut off. It's Councillor Carlson, the temporary chair, for a few minutes. And uh, unless we, if you come back on in the next few seconds, that's great. If not, I'll go on to our next speaker and come back to you. Email response from the Peel Police. Okay, so who, who is going to be doing this? Thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, we'll certainly follow up internally because I understood that was what the process was, but um, I'll, I'll look back with the team and with our partners at Peel Regional Police about this process and get back to you. Yeah, so... This is like my collection of 45s. It skips a little bit. Okay. Uh, Mayor Brown, are you, are you going to make it back? Maybe Councillor Chair Unique is going to uh, fix you up here. There you go. Okay. George, thank you. The mayor's cut off again. So I'm mayor, sorry if we, and, Mayor Brown, your Mayor, we just lost you for a few no. moments again. So if you want to double back on your last thirty seconds. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yeah. I was saying that uh, I hope you can have a conversation, a frank conversation with the Peel Police and the federal government to, so we can ensure who's doing what. Um, but I think there's a breakdown there. And I think this is going to be a particular concern in the weeks ahead. We know we have many international students coming back for, for school. I've had officials at the hospital flag for me that this is a concern for them. Um, and so... Um, I, I would love to know that I can say confidently uh, to constituents if they see examples of where the quarantine is being breached that there will be follow-up because right now I'm a little embarrassed to say when I respond uh, that you know the, that there will be follow-up and, and, and they can show to me that there hasn't been. Um, certainly, we'll take your feedback back and uh, we'll action that. And with regards to the international students, just to give a bit more information around the uh, quarantine um, uh, follow-up, the uh, under the Ministry of Colleges and Universities and through partnership with the Ministry of Health, local public health units and the associated ministries are uh, looking at and being consulted on for the quarantine plans for all the post-secondary institutions. And they have excellent plans in place. They have uh, daily follow-ups, uh, group WhatsApp chats, um, they they are uh, connected and, and concerned about the well-being of their um, students, and some of the institutions have specific kind of like a quarantine hotel uh, set up. So I, I'm confident in the, in the measures that are being taken place through our post-secondary institutions um, around this. And with the mandatory testing, we would be able to know um, prior to them going out to campus uh, if that is their mode of learning, um, whether or not they are positive. So I, I, I think around the international students, we, we do have some really good measures in place. Do you know what the measures are at, at Sheridan? Did they have the largest uh, body of international students in, in, in Brampton? Um, yes, do they sir, have a quarantine uh, hotel? Um, I, I don't necessarily know if they have a quarantine hotel. I know um, Algoma uh, does, but with regard, I think they have a program, if I recall correctly, um, where they've designated some of their dorms uh, in a very uh, uh, safety-oriented, like with all the uh, safety measures in place. And we've been talking to them um, more, sometimes more than once a week on their safety plans and measures. So we, uh, we are really impressed with all three of our post-secondary institutions with the amount of effort they've done um, to support their international student community. 
Okay, so, so you're confident that international students that are coming in are following the quarantine? Yeah, the, certainly uh, the plans are in place and the, and the colleges and universities themselves have obligations to, to do follow-up with their students. So there's more, um, there's, there is that more extra layer of hands-on um, checking in. Sorry, not okay. left, so virtual hands-on, sorry. <laughs> You know, I think it might be of interest if you, if you could send to regional council just a copy of uh, of what the protocols are at our, each of our academic institutions. If someone in your office could share that with us, um, because we do get lots of questions on this. And so, if if you're impressed with the plans, then you know when we get inquiries about this, we we can share um, the practices that are being um, that are being uh, adhered to. Sure, I'll certainly confer with our uh, post-secondary institutions about uh, about that request. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sato. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I apologize for getting back on, but I had a question that I forgot to ask. Um, my, when we post uh, in Mississauga, we get the, uh, the chart, uh, the regional chart from the mayor's office um, uh, staff that um, I posted on my, my social media, and I think other members of council likely do as well. And I get the comments back from residents that um, over, especially over the last week or two when the numbers were high, when the province gives the numbers for Peel and then the media pick up yeah. the provincial numbers, they're not the same. Yeah. Um, so I, I was trying to explain to my residents, you know, why ours were the accurate numbers. And mm -hmm. I did get a bit of an explanation on it, but mm -hmm. um it's very confusing to the yeah. public. You know, I, I publish, um, I think ours said 70 and the province said 72. And residents are saying, well, who do we believe? And I said, yeah. well, you don't believe the media. So yeah. <laughs> rule out the media. Um, and I think part of the confusion, too, was that I guess our numbers, well, someone else went on to the Peel website took a snapshot and said, but on that same day, the number was different. And I was trying to explain, but it depends what time of day. Exactly. So it, it's very confusing for, for the public. And I think, um, you know, I, 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 what I'm hearing is people are trusting the numbers that we're posting. Mm -hmm. um, at least my residents are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but can you, can you clarify that? Why, it, you know, we're getting two or three different uh, numbers. Sure, happy to. Um, so with regards to an update in the system, so we've now moved on to the provincial Salesforce system, which is actually um, one of the great um, accomplishments uh, over the summer is that we've moved from a paper-based system now to an online case and contact management system, which has greatly improved our efficiencies and our response. Um, and the numbers that are drawn um, are pulled, um, can be pulled at, at different times of the day between what we pull. Uh, and usually we post, we do a poll at uh, noon, and I can't recall the exact time the province does it, but it is uh, a different time period. So as a result, because this is live data, you're going to get different uh, types of numbers based on when you do pull the data. The other consideration is we do data cleaning. And so that's to reduce any duplicates. And unfortunately, um, not everyone knows or not all the employers know that uh, repeat testing of previously positive cases is not warranted anymore. It's not required. But because people um, don't know that, uh, they may be pressured by family or by their employers to get tested again. So that, so that person doesn't actually have, it's not another case of COVID, it's just a repeat positive, and we have to clean those out of our system. So that also takes some time. So by the time we clean up our numbers and the cases, and depending on what time the province pulls it, um, that may get come for the difference in the numbers. You will all probably also find this, uh, just as a heads up, that uh, whenever schools post their numbers, because we do it once a day, there might be a discrepancy in the numbers too, depending on when the school boards update their numbers too. So it's not to say that we're not aware, we're certainly very aware of the actual cases, it's just when the counts are posted, they might be different based on the different organizations' time. And I, I think, uh, and I haven't been on the website because I get the, I go by the charts, but um, I think that's, po is that posted on the region's website where the numbers are posted that, that it's a fluctuating number? Uh, it, it, it's, it's not necessarily that we mentioned that it's fluctuating, but that we, we pull it at a particular time. It does say 12 noon every day. So hopefully. So, 
So you're saying the province is taking it at a different time. So I'm assuming um, all municipalities are taking it at a different time. <laughs> um, and so there, it's it's never going to be, probably never going to be accurate. Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't say accurate. Yeah. They're not, never going to be identical. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it, it helps for us to explain that, but... Um, mm -hmm. You know, may, maybe maybe Peel Health could explain that to the media, because um, I think that's where the confusion comes in when the media posted, you know, a couple of weeks ago and last week, uh, some of the numbers. And th because they're large, they're high numbers, mm -hmm. it garners more attention from the public. Mm -hmm. And then they see the difference in the numbers, and then they get very confused and, and don't know who to believe, quite honestly, whether it's... Uh, mm -hmm where they are. So I'll leave that with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Downey. Thank you through you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Dr. Howe, for the presentation. I think the um, conversation has uh, prompted more questions for many. Um, I think uh, over the course that Peel has handled um, the entire pandemic very professionally and diplomatically, but I think ultimately we are just being too nice. Um, we are uh, not taking, we should be taking a more aggressive stance on um, things like gatherings and um, how people are coming together in the community. Um, we all see the numbers um, and I, you know, everyone says, oh, the numbers in Caledon are low, but our, our per capita numbers are the same as Mississauga. Um, it's just we have a lower population, that's all. Um, I think that we also need to be very clear when we celebrate um, our community and our diversity in uh, Peel, we also have to recognize, and we know this to be true in terms of uh, presentations from our CAO and uh, Dr. Lowe in the past, that um, marginalized and racialized communities are more impacted by the virus. And that obviously is going to come into play as well. Um, so I think, you know, we talk about, you mentioned multi-generational multi homes. So what kind of um, supports are we giving to those homes when they have a member of the family that tests positive, but maybe don't have the uh, capacity or the space to then quarantine that member of their family away from the other mem members of the family? Um, things like that. I, I'm concerned about not listing businesses uh, that may have had outbreaks um, due to reputational damage because the health damage to our community is much greater than the reputational damage of their business. Um, I mean, across the board, all of our businesses are suffering. So what makes that particular business any, um, you know, any less immune to, to that, to the, the damage that we're all feeling throughout the pandemic? Um, so as I said, I, I think uh, just going back to taking a more aggressive stand, um, you know, the Premier mentioned the other day in the news that we have, you know, the local levels have the opportunity to, to set their numbers if they so choose. Um, and I think that, you know, when it comes to social gatherings, I'm seeing them in my own community, in my own neighborhoods, and um, actually had a, a resident call me the other day and try to convince me why he should be allowed to host his daughter's wedding with 400 people, um, mm -hmm. you know, through a pandemic. Um, I suggested to him that maybe if you'd like it to be what you really want it to be, not to do it and just to wait. Um, ask Mayor Thompson, his own daughter's wedding was postponed a year. Um, so I think that uh, I think that it's up to us to take a more aggressive stand, and I'd be happy to table it, whatever it looks like, or support it, whatever it looks like. Um, but I'll I'll leave it to the rest of my colleagues to um, to add their thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fortini. All right, Mr. Chair, I'm trying to take my hand down; it won't go down. Okay, thank you. That is my list. Um, I think the, the takeaway, and there's so much work to be done in the interim, but I guess, uh, Dr. Howe, um, a, a fulsome report to come back when we see you at the next council meeting in two weeks' time where we get these regular updates. Um, and the other thought that I had, I don't know what everybody's thoughts are, but we can give this some thought, because um, I agree with the Mayor, Mayor Crombie. Um, I'm aware of a very fulsome, um, detailed, um, well thought out plan that they have at the GTAA, because that was made aware to me from my side. But, but it might be a consideration that we invite our friends from the GTAA to give us a presentation, not just for our benefit, but to give the commuting public more confidence in the stay at home. 
public more confidence. But just thoughts going forward. But uh, Monica, a lot for you to come back with in two weeks' time to speak to and see where we go from there. Uh, with that, I move on to our final presentation, and that is 8.2 of staff. That is, update and management of the financial impact of COVID-19 in oral presentation from Norman Lum, Director of Business and Financial Planning. Norman, you're up. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry, Councillor Paul. On that. Yeah, I just just really quickly, and I, I and I don't disagree with what you're saying about the about the airport. I, I'm just I'm just explaining to you and letting you know what I'm hearing from firsthand people that are getting off of planes, and it's not like they just got off the planes a few week a few months ago. It's a few weeks ago, and that's what they're telling me. So these are people that I know people that were on a plane and what they're saying. So that's all. So I, I think that it's a great idea for to have them uh, come. I look forward to um, the uh, what will come out of staff's visit to uh, to the GTAA and, uh, and, and look forward to hearing what some of the things that they are doing and, and how we can uh, look at possibly doing it better. And, and Councillor Pelleschi... Thank you, Councillor Pelleshian. It wasn't first generation information for me, but similar to yours, I know of friends who have told me they have colleagues, other family members that have gotten off a plane recently, and then they were at the next event or they saw them show. So um, anecdotally and one step removed, I've heard some, the odd similar story I think some of us have. So I, I really think we need that addressed. And I think the GTA is going to want to, because again, I go back to where Mayor Crombie said, I'm, I'm aware that they're being very stringent on so many fronts, but let's have them before us. And I think they would welcome the opportunity to convey that same message to the traveling public. And as a said to the stay at home public. So uh, the chair will, will follow up with that and thank you for your support on that. With that, Norman, you're up. Thank you. Good afternoon, chair and members of regional council. So over the last six months, uh, PLS has moved from response to stage one, then to stage two, and now to stage three of recovery. For stages two and three, Peel was approved about two weeks after most regions due to the number of new COVID cases at the time. Uh, relative to June, 2020, Unemployment rates at the national and provincial levels declined to 10.9 and 11.3% in July. The rates for Peel and Toronto CMA continued to increase during this time, likely due to the delay that both entered stage three of the phased reopening of the economy. Peel's three-month average unemployment rate jumped to 16.3% in July 2020, the highest rate recorded since Peel-specific monthly data became available in 2006. However, labor market conditions in Peel showed early signs of recovery in July, as more Peel residents re-entered the labor force and fewer jobs were lost relative to the previous month. And what does this mean in terms of jobs? And Norm, I know I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you because you're also going to let us know. I think when you need the slides. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, I, I apologize for not reminding you, but I think so. Just make sure you you shout out where you want us to be in the slide bank. Go ahead, please. Oh, certainly. My apologies. Uh, next slide, please. So what does this mean in terms of jobs? Uh, 62,600 residents left the labor market by the end of June, and by the end of July, this number had decreased by half to 30,500 residents. And after losing a record number of 137,800 jobs in June 2020, 21,000 fewer jobs were lost in July. This change was led by the service sector jobs lost in that sector declined from 86,600 jobs in June to 67,100 jobs in July. Um, over the next few slides, I will speak to the new funding that was announced in August and the impact on Peel's financial operations for 2020. Next slide, please. So on August 12th, the region received confirmation from the province that it will receive $27.3 million to assist with COVID-19 costs and pressures. Payments are expected to be received in September, and the region is required to report back to the province in March 2021 on how the funds were used and on the region's overall 2020 year-end financial position. Any amounts that will not be used in 2020 are to be placed into reserve to help fund one-time operating pressures in 2021 related to COVID-19. The Region of Peel was also allocated $553,000 through Phase 1 of Municipal Transit funding to assist with municipal transit pressures incurred between April 1st, 2020 and September 30th, 2020. Similar to the operational funding, any unused amounts are to be placed into reserve to be accessed 
to support transit pressures that people may experience up to March 31st, 2021. Next slide, please. So on August 14th, uh, Peel received confirmation of $17.8 million of additional safe restart funding to ensure that a safe, sufficient, and adequate supply of childcare was available to support the gradual return to work of parents as the economy gradually reopens. These funds are intended to be spent by December 31st, 2020. Uh, as well, Peel also has been allocated an additional $9.7 million from the Social Services and Relief Fund for use as set out in the Community Homelessness and Prevention Initiative guidelines, of which one of the main goals is to support the most vulnerable in Peel. This funding, like the child care funding, also requires they be spent by the end of the fiscal year. The impact on Peel's 2020 financial operations are currently being assessed by staff. A uh, report will be brought to Council at the next meeting to provide details of the funding and the results of the assessment. Next slide, please. Now we'll shift focus to Peel's utility rate programs, water and wastewater. So as previously reported to Council, the economic recession has hastened the impact of the changing nature of employment with movement away from the manufacturing sector towards more service-based companies. This has resulted in a significant impact on water consumption from the industrial, commercial, institutional sector. Peel had previously forecast a 2020 year-end deficit of $14.2 million, but that has shifted positively over the last couple of months. And the driver behind that change is increased residential water consumption due to the hot, dry summer that Peel has been experiencing. So overall, the utility rate programs are now forecasting year-end negative variance of $3.4 million, largely driven by the deferral of the 2020 utility rate increase. Next slide, please. And with respect to the forecasted increased expenditures, cost avoided and non-COVID driven experiences, there have been no material changes to these projections since staff last reported on them to council on July 23rd through the first triannual report. These projections had assumed that Peel services would transition from response to recovery starting in September 2020. And staff are currently assessing the results as of August 31st and will report back to Council through the second triennial report in November. Next slide, please. So overall, between managing costs, provincial federal funding and reserves, and as uh, CEO Polsonelli said earlier, Peel will be able to manage the 2020 financial impact of COVID, currently forecasted at a total combined tax and utility rate deficit of $6 million. And there will also be additional COVID funding available through phase two to support operational pressures that exceed phase one funding. And next slide, please. And thank you. That concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions from Council. Thank you. Councillor Pileshi. My apologies, Mr. Chair. My hand's still up. Councillor Downey. Yes, sorry, uh, my hand was still up from the last item. Okay, if not, that is that, and we are done with the presentations. Um, and now I need a motion actually to receive the two last staff presentations, item 8.1 and 2, and, and we'll also cover Nancy. So receipt of all the presentations, that was moved by Councillors Pileshi and Downey. All those in favour? No one opposed. That deals with all of the COVID-related matters and presentations. Okay, well done. That brings us down to items related to human services. We've asked to hold 11.2, my home second unit renovation assistance program update. Councillor Vincente, you've asked that to be held. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple of questions just on this one. Um, first of all, thanks to staff for putting this together. It it's, uh, reads very positively. I think this is a great way of us uh, leveraging the funds that we have to uh, allow for more affordable housing options to be available within the city. I have some questions uh, just uh, for uh, public record that we'd like to ask. Um, with respect to uh, the eligibility requirements and the follow-up with respect to um, the loan eligibility over the years, uh, how are we going to be administering that? Can staff provide a little bit more detail here? So if I may, thank you for the question and through the chair. Uh, 
we will be collecting and working with both the tenant and the homeowner to obtain documentation each year so that we can verify the eligibility requirements, uh, things such as the income levels, the rent levels, obtain the notice of assessment. Uh, so we will be involved each year connecting with the homeowner and the tenant to ensure that eligibility is compliant with the program. Okay, now, uh, now from the reading of the report, um, you need to have an existing second unit already built. Is that correct? Or is this for also for a completely new second unit builds? So this program is a pilot project and a, a relatively small pilot project. We anticipate that we will be able to work with 57 units. In this case, it is focused at existing second units that are not legal. Okay, and thank you, and through you, Chair. So in the case where uh, someone has an illegal second unit, they would be able to uh, do renovations and bring the unit into compliance, would that be correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, and in terms of the data and information that's collected and how it is managed over the years, what kind of reporting is the region uh, prepared to do to have this information available to the lower tier municipalities? So I believe that we would be happy to disclose all information to the lower tiers. The reporting that we do is essentially around eligibility requirements to the program. The local municipality still has the same role to play. They're out inspecting the unit, they're registering the unit, uh, they're doing the occupancy permit, but we have worked very closely with local municipal staff and we are happy to have the information flow down to them. Okay, and final question, thank you through you, Chair. Um, if you find that uh, the individual or the homeowner, um, if they were to sell the home, for example, uh, midterm, midstream, or if they were to no longer um, qualify because they are not following uh, the uh, particulars of this program, the requirements of this program, what would happen then to that lien that's on their title? So the loan is registered against title, and yeah. it would have to be removed before the property is sold. Let's make the assumption that we are five years into the 10-year affordability period, so 50% of the loan has been forgiven. That's 10% um, each year because the homeowner and the tenant are in compliance. At time of selling the unit, they would have to repay the other 50%. Okay, understood. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, that summarizes my questions and I'm happy to move the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, it is here for information, so that's that. Uh, and it's, oh, sorry, motion to receive the report itself. It has been moved. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Brings us to items related to enterprise programs and services. Mayor Thompson has asked us to hold 15.3 public sector network update and budget. Mayor Thompson. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, concerning the uh, reading through the budget, it is fairly healthy. But where it's uh, concerning is when they talk about traffic accidents in the report that uh, can uh, set off our PSN, this is vital, especially to our hospitals down in Mississauga and Brampton. And uh, so my question is, with the sizable uh, treasury that we do have there, why aren't we burying the fiber? And especially with a lot of the road construction that's taken place throughout Mississauga, Brampton and Caledon, along with the region of Peel, why aren't we burying the fiber to have it in a safe position versus having it exposed to the weather, the elements, and for car accidents to uh, put us in jeopardy? This is a very important integral part of our system for both the region and our healthcare. And I was just wondering if that can be considered going forward we're constantly looking at projects. Why aren't we looking at burying the fiber at the same time? Sean, did you have a thought on that? Commissioner Baird, go ahead. You may be muted, Sean, I can't hear you. I apologize, am I hearing, hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. please proceed. 
Very good. Through the chair, thank you for the question. It's a good one. And we do look for those opportunities when we can uh, to bury fiber as appropriate. Um, the network is uh, largely built out at this point. And so much of our capital projects are around uh, relocating or temporarily relocating fiber as necessary. Um, there are a number of new builds that occur as well. Uh, however, those happen independently by each of the four different organizations. Um, so I guess the, the short answer is we, we do look for those opportunities where they are appropriate. Um, but most of our uh, capital projects are around relocating existing uh, fiber for the time being. Uh, having said that, I'd be happy to raise it at one of our next uh, steering committee meetings amongst all four organizations to look at whether there are further opportunities to help protect, because uh, we certainly agree that this is a critical piece of infrastructure. Uh, and in the current times, we're learning how, how critical and, and how important those technology connections are for everybody across the region. Absolutely, and with asset management for the long term, it's a it's a good way to go. So, no doubt. Thank you. Other than that, it was a good report, Mr. Chairman. I'll glad to move it. It was just one thing that I thought that I wanted to ask on clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vicente. Thank you. Quick question through you, Chair. Um, we passed a motion uh, before uh, in this term of council to have staff look at opportunities to use. Uh, take advantage of unused bandwidth or capacity within the PSN network. I know that there was a report back that we received. Uh, has any other work or has staff continued to look into the, that potential opportunity? So if I may, uh, through the chair, thank you for the question. Uh, there, yes, there was a report that came back uh, at the beginning part of this year to look at uh, potential uh, opportunities for better usage of our capacity. Uh, and the just the gist of that report was that there may be some limited opportunities that are out there, um, but that the PSN and our organizations don't necessarily have the capacity to seek out those opportunities. Uh, however, we will be open to them should they come our way. I'm not aware of any significant opportunities that have come our way since that report, um, but it doesn't it hasn't changed the fact that we're willing to consider those if they if they come up. Okay. Um, I, sometimes I think that this network is one of the best kept secrets in Peel. Uh, perhaps we should make it known to the business uh, community that this network is available, and that there may be opportunities uh, that uh, could be realized and uh, that are mutually beneficial for all parties. I appreciate, this, appreciate the suggestion, and I can I can assure you too that we've had regular conversations with other network services providers who who are aware of the the network, and that's generally where these these uh, opportunities arise from. Thank you very much, thanks, Chair. Councillor, I, I think I know where Mayor Thompson. Mayor Thompson, you have a point on that. Yeah, I got a point. So my understanding, this network is a closed network, that it isn't open, or a week, or has that been changed? That's why so, we can't really open it to businesses because it's a closed network, is it not? So through the chair, the, the network is owned and operated by the four organizations, the region and the three local municipalities. Uh, and the majority of the utilization is uh, from those four organizations. We do have, however, uh, a number of subscriber organizations that work with us. Generally, they're members of the broader public sector that have entered into direct agreements with us to make usage of the PSN. There has in the past been discussions about further opening up the network to other usage, and that was the nature of the report that came out earlier this year, where we suggested we could be open to those opportunities, but we're not pursuing them currently. Like Credit Valley Conservation is a really good example, uh, yes. doing with their uh, tree farm. So, no, thank you. Okay, thank you. That's sorry, all. Uh, Mr. Chair, oh, can I just ask Alan um, to speak up next time? We're, we're barely hearing him. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, with that, Madam Clerk, do I have a resolution on that matter? Moved by Mayor Thompson and seconded by Councillor Vicente. Yes, and I can read it. Please do. Thank you. That the Public Sector Network 2020 Operation Budget attaches Appendix 2 to the report of the Commissioner of Digital and Information Services titled Public Sector Network PSN Update and Budget be approved in accordance with the PSN Partnership Agreement and further that the Director Information Systems and Technology Services be authorized to execute alternate locate agreements on behalf of the Region of Peel on business terms satisfactory to the Commissioner of Digital and Information Services and on legal terms satisfactory to the Regional Solicitor. And further that the Director Information Systems and Technology Services 
be authorized to execute shared structures, agree structures agreements on behalf of the Region of Peel on business terms satisfactory to the Commissioner of Digital and Information Services and on legal terms satisfactory to the Regional Solicitor. And this does require a recorded vote. Call the vote. Mayor Brown? Yes. Mayor Brown in favor? Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor? Mayor Crombie? Yes. Mayor Crombie in favor? Councillor Demurla? Yes. Councillor Demurla in favor? Councillor Dasko? Yes. Councillor Dasko in favor? Councillor Dillon has left for an appointment. Uh, Councillor Downey? In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca? Yes, in favor. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini? Yes, in favor, please. Councillor Fortini in favor. Councillor Groves? Yes, in favor. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes? Yes, in favor. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac? Yes. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney? Yes. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden? Yes, in favor. Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi? Yes. Councillor Pileshi in favor. Councillor Parrish? Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz? Yes. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair? Councillor in favor. Sin Thank you. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr? In favor. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson? Favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. And uh, Councillor Vicente? Yes, thank you. Councillor Vicente in favor, it carries, thank you. Thank you, that brings us down to communication item 16.1, Principles, Integrity, Integrity Commissioner for the Region of Peel, letter dated August 12, 2020, regarding the City of Brampton Integrity Commissioner Report 2020-3, direction is required. Councillor Parrish, you've asked me to hold this. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Yanika. As uh, the Chair of the Policies and Procedures Committee, when this came in with my agenda, I actually called Patrick O'Connor to say he, and we all know we've stopped the review of our code of conduct uh, during COVID. It's rescheduled to start again at the October meeting. I'm going to be moving that we receive this and refer it to the Policy and Procedures Committee. Um, I also asked Patrick if I could, it would be um, appropriate for me to call Principal's Integrity and he said yes it would. So when I spoke to them, they pointed out several areas of the current code which we're still working under that really don't give us a lot of direction. Uh, the Code of Conduct says regional councillors also serve as members of lower tier municipalities that each have their own codes. The Regional Code applies to the activities of the Chair and members of Regional Council in quotes while executing the responsibilities as Regional Chair and councillors respectively. Area Municipal Codes of Conduct will apply to the activities of members of Council in accordance with the role as Area Municipal Councillors. Um, they uh, went on to say in Section E4, should an issue arise that is of joint responsibility for the region and the area municipality, both parties will work together to develop a process to resolve the matter and report the findings to both regional and city town councils. They also pointed out that under compliance, the imposition of penalties as outlined under Section 223.4 of the Municipal Act can only occur following the investigation by the Integrity Commissioner and a code of contravention reported to Regional Council by the Integrity Commissioner. So all this tells us um, that the old code really needed revision. It also tells us this is a very serious matter which we can't ignore. And it also tells us that if we send it back to the um, uh, Policy and Procedures Committee with specific direction in advance for the Integrity Commissioners to prepare uh, suggestions on how we would deal with a problem like this and blending um, the codes that uh, they would be comfortable with that. 
So I am moving receipt and referral to the procedures or policy and procedures committee. Councillor Parrish, thank you. And if I may say from a different path, I too, I didn't speak with the integrity commission, but through our own staff when it came in, I said, what is the appropriate way to proceed? And Councillor Parrish, we landed at the same spot, independent of each other, because there's some questions that need to be answered, some process that has to ensue. I think you've said it perfectly and appropriately. I agree with you to go to, to that very committee that you chair. Councillor Santos. Thank you um, through you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillor Parrish, for holding this. Um, we all know that it's quite a, a serious matter that we're dealing with. It certainly was an incredibly difficult decision for us um, at the City of Brampton. And um, I know that the Regional Code of Conduct certainly needs to be updated. This situation we're dealing with, I think, is probably unprecedented. Uh, in terms of the level of complexity, the level of seriousness. Um, I don't even need to go into the details. I think that if you haven't read the Integrity Commissioner report, which the City of Brampton councillors and mayor had to um, review and make a decision on, I think you would probably appreciate why it was so difficult for us. Um, that being said, I would support a referral to the Policy and Procedures Committee, as it is probably the most appropriate way right now to deal with it. However, I would ask that at the Policy and Procedures Committee, as we are reviewing it, um, to look at how to tighten up what that relationship is between the lower and upper tier integrity commissioner. Um, because, like, if, if the integrity commissioner at the region their opinion is different from the one at the city. It puts each other at, at uh, in very um, conflicting situations, whether that's regarding judicial review or litigations. Um, and also, I think there is one thing that should be consistent in terms of code of conduct uh, at the lower tier and upper tier, and that is the definition of unbecoming conduct. So, like unbecoming conduct, I don't think is captured fully in the regional code of conduct. And I think that in certain situations, um, unbecoming conduct is, is something that should be consistently applied if you're elected as a city councillor or regional councillor. Um, and regardless of where the situation happens, I think we all have a duty to uphold the highest standard and go beyond the higher standard in terms of our behavior. And if there are inconsistencies in that, um, then we have a problem, uh, regardless of if you're upper tier or lower tier. So um, if you could please, um, Councillor Parrish's chair, if you could just pay special attention to those things, that would be greatly appreciated. And finally, just in terms of, of timing, is there a sense in terms of timing um, when any of this stuff will will come back to council or what you're thinking? Perhaps through the chair, Councillor Parrish. Yeah, through the chair. Um, we had a, a quite an extensive review already completed on most of it. And there, it's just a, a bit of a cleanup going on. This is a new twist, which we will obviously look at carefully. But I don't anticipate it taking long, but we won't know until October 1st. And I will be in touch with the integrity commissioners and, and give them your suggestion and some of our others and ask them for their suggestions. The, the one part of the old code that probably should have been adhered to was should an issue arise that is of joint responsibility for the region and the area municipality, both parties will work together to develop a process to resolve the matter and report to the individual councils. I think had that been followed, it might have been a bit easier at this point, but um, I will make sure that if you have any other pointers you want to send through to me, email them to me. I'll be sending it all to the Integrity Commissioner because they'd like to think about it before October 1st. Shouldn't take too long. That was a long answer. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, uh, Councillor Parrish. Very good. Thank you, Councillor Santos and Councillor Parrish. That's my list, Madam Clerk. You need a formal motion. So the motion is from Councillor Parrish, seconded by Councillor Santos, that it be received and referred accordingly. Everybody's good with that. I do not need a recorded vote. All those in favour? Oh, sorry, I... The clerk is, oh, did, oh, Mayor Brown's just come on my list. My apologies, Mayor Brown, uh, you're up to speak. Please proceed. Patrick, I've got you on my list to speak, but I cannot hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Sorry, I, I, I was on the list. Uh, uh, and, I, and I'm, 
My apology, I missed it. Please proceed. I, I was just going to echo anyways what uh, uh, Councillor um, Santos said, that this was a, a very serious Integrity Commission report that we took seriously in Brampton to um, highlight that we want to create a, a safe space for uh, women in our community. And um, um, the, if you haven't read the report, it was uh, um, detailed. Um, and uh, I think what Councillor Parrish has recommended is appropriate um, because this is a little bit of a gray area. But for anyone um, watching, because I know we've had some media uh, inquiries um, into this from the Toronto Star asking what the Region Appeal was going to do, um, I think there were some concerns that we would not be responding to this. Um, but I think this is simply following the appropriate um, procedure and given the fact that there is lawsuits from the complainant, there is a judicial review from the councillor, we have to be extremely careful to follow every proper procedure so that um, everything is done appropriately, I think, um, making sure we're consistent with our own code, as Councillor Paris has suggested, is um, of course uh, appropriate, and that's not in any manner um, representing not taking this seriously, is making sure that um, it's being followed um, to the to the exact detail. Agreed. Thank you. That is, oh, Councillor Rass. Sorry, Councillor Rass. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to uh, say thank you to Councillor Parrish and to uh, Councillor Santos for uh, moving and seconding it. It is the appropriate course of action. Um, I don't think activity and behaviour at one municipal level can negate it at another. So this is uh, absolutely the most appropriate thing to do, especially because of the Region of Peel, where you're responsible and, um, uh, and support uh, gender-based violence initiatives. So uh, it's not something that we're going to sweep under the rug or ignore. So I fully support the action being taken today. Thank you. Thank you. If I have no other speakers, then as moved by Councillor Parrish, seconded by Councillor Santos, to be referred and dealt with accordingly. Um, just, a, I don't need a recorded vote, Madam Clerk. Just a consensus. All those in favor? Do I have any objectors? Seeing none, that carries unanimously. Thank you. Bringing us on to item 17 related to public works, 17.2, residential water and sewer line sorry, warranty. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry. It's, it's Councillor Raz. Um, sorry. I, I do, no. on, on a point of order, should um, Councillor Dillon have not recused himself from that last item? I think, you've, I think he's left the meeting and the clerk made a point of that earlier. Madam Clerk, okay. can, you confer, can you confirm that, please? Yes, um, we did receive a notice that uh, Councillor Dillon had left the meeting earlier to attend uh, to an appointment. So he wasn't present for the last vote. And the record shows that accordingly, but proper point to make to be 100% clear that he wasn't involved in the conversation having already left the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Raz. Okay, back to 17.2, Residential Water and Sewer Line Warranty Protection Program update, Councillor Starr. Yeah, just a, a quick, uh, maybe technical question. Um, uh, and maybe uh, uh, Andrew can uh, answer. We, we have royalties, I see, of $151,000. Is that total for the for the four years? Uh, thanks for the question, Councillor. Starting through the chair, yes, I, that is the answer that you are looking for. It is the total for the four years. Okay, and then with the number of uh, claims and what they've paid out, uh, it appears that the, uh, the average claim is very small. It's like $400. Is that your take on this? Yeah, uh, it, it really depends on what the claim is. If, if, if you'll notice, some of the warranty claims are for internal plumbing in a home, so that might be only a, a couple hundred dollars for them to come and um, like snake a sink or a drain or something like that. And other ones might be four, five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 if they're um excavating and repairing a water line so it's a all over the map yeah i i, I, ju I, I just took an average of the a couple thousand claims eight hundred thousand dollars so it's four hundred dollars roughly so they, they aren't large claims correct a lot of them are small but uh with the real benefit of the program is protecting those that have the really big claims Okay, uh, so this is a this is a profitable business because uh, based on on the numbers, uh, their income uh, on on this because of the 
royalty of 5% uh, based on that 20 times that is 3 million. And over the same period of time, they've paid out 800,000. Pretty good. Yes? I believe your math is correct. <laughs> good. Uh, last last question. Um, uh, did you get? Do we get calls or does anybody get calls on these particular types of claims or it seems like they're 100% they're satisfied. So is there any reaction from residents? From, uh, you know, from uh, yeah, so to, thanks for the question. Over the course of the three years of this program, uh, the majority of the calls, um, I don't want to say 100% because nothing's ever 100%, but the majority of the calls yeah. are more questions about the program, how it works, that kind of thing. I don't recall any uh, negative experiences that a customer's had once they're signed up uh, come across my desk in the three years. Yeah. Well, that's great. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify a couple of things there. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Councillor Raz. No, I think you're nodding that you were on the last item. Very good. So with that, Madam Clerk, over to you. Do we need a formal motion? Motion to receive as moved by Councillor Starr, seconded by Councillor Raz. All those in favour? Is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, that carries. Brings me to 22.1, notice of motion. 22.1 is waiving of a service connection fee for an indoor bocce court being constructed at 125 Pembroke Street, town of Caledon, Ward 5. And I apologize if there was confusion on my part. I, I don't know if it was Councillor Groves or Councillor Pileschi that wished to speak to this. Um, Councillor Groves, I'll acknowledge you first. Councillor Groves. Thank you. Uh, can you discussion? Um, uh, I, Councillor Groves, did you wish to speak to the matter first? Mr. Chair, hello. Y yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, the motion is brought forward with, uh, we've got a, um, a donor who is donating an indoor facility for our seniors um, because they do not have any space in, in Caledon to play and they go outside of the community to um, to play. We've had a, uh, one had an accident going out there, driving out there because they're driving in the winter time and they're driving in the dark. And so um, I've been trying to raise funds as well for this um, this um, indoor bocce court. It's a donation of one million dollars, and um, this is just a small fee for the um, I, the hookup of the water meter. And so, I'm asking council if they would consider waiving it, and then in the future, looking at other um, community projects and fees that we can waive. Um, the reason it is here is because it's uh, it's in our bylaw and council has to um, waive the fees, staff cannot do that. And it's a small amount, it's uh, just over $1,200. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pileschi, did I have you next? Councillor Pileschi? There, Mr. Chair, my hand's up. Oh, very good. Um, Councillor Daskal. Hi. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say, actually, I, I missed out on, uh, I guess, councillor inquiries. So I just wanted to make, mo uh, make, make a note of that. I'll come back to you for a councillor inquiry when this is done. Mayor Thompson, I see your hand up. Did you wish to speak to this? Yes, this is something uh, that uh, is going to be a, a product of the town. So I was surprised that we even had to do that. I thought that we had a, a working relationship between... Uh, uh, municipalities on this and I think the reason why we caught it is because it's a, a donation of a private consortium that's uh, you know a whole bunch have come together to donate this so I'll gladly uh, second Councillor uh, Groves motion on this and uh, to me I, I think normally when it's you know a municipal structure we, we're not even discussing this and this is what it's going to become so to me it's straightforward I, I don't think council needs to be really concerned what we're doing here it's just how we got here and it's just on a technicality. So I think that's why I think Councillor Groves, what she's asking is, is very legit. So I'm just supporting it. Okay, thank you. If I have no other speakers, Madam Clerk, it's been moved by Councillor Groves and Mayor Thompson. What do you require? Sorry, Mr. Chair, now I jumped on. Oh, uh, uh, my apologies, Councillor Pileschi, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, just to try and get everything straight, because I, I had asked the question at City Council, um, yesterday, if uh, if we had ever asked for um, 
for any kind of service like this to be waived in, in Brampton. Um, we got an email back today uh, stating that no, we hadn't um, ever uh, had anything waived from the region uh, any time in Brampton as far as they can go back. So I'm just trying to see if maybe my line of questioning to, to city staff was a little bit different than what the ask is um, here today. So uh, just to get this right, it's 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 twelve thousand dollars, not not that much money. Um, there's a connection. What what connection is 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 being waived? It's twelve. Alan, Alan, I see 12, you. Sorry. Uh, it's what what what? what, what perhaps if I could. Yeah, yeah, it is oh. it is twelve hundred dollars, but perhaps okay. the commissioner Farr and I went right by him. A Andrew, you may have some background that might benefit us all. Here. Why don't you speak to that? Then we'll go back to Councillor Pileshi. Commissioner Farr. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Chair Unica. So through you, um, Councillor Pileshi, you're correct. This is the it's twelve hundred dollars. They've already paid um, some of the permit fees and other things. This is the final cost for the water hookup, and most of that twelve. It's actually twelve hundred dollars. Sorry. Um, it's for the cost of the meter and uh, some of the labor to install it. Um, you, you're correct. This is not something that I recall doing. Certainly in the year and a half I've been doing this job and in the past in my experience in the water uh, division. But um, that's the motion in front of us. Um, if you'd like, uh, you could refer it to us and we could bring you back some more just information on the context um, of what this is, how often they come up, and uh, a path forward if you'd like. So I don't mind doing that, but then I would look to the mover of the motion to say, or ask you, Andrew, what what are the timelines that we're looking for? Is this something that um, they need to uh, they need done right away, the waiver, or um, can we go ahead and do the hookup pending uh, a, the council decision once we get more information coming back? Um, I, I would assume, and maybe Councillor Groves can help me out here, I would assume that the applicant is losing, uh, looking to do this rather quickly. Um, we could turn around a report very quickly. Um, the 24th might be a stretch, but I'm sure we could have information no later than the 8th as well. Okay, I, I, I'm just thinking, and I, uh, I, I, listen, I want to be able to help, um, but at the municipalities, we're looking at ways that we can we can cut costs, and and especially in this time, uh, you know what we're living in now. Twelve hundred dollars isn't that much, and and I would look to Councillor Groves, and you, Councillor Groves, you've probably already fundraised um, a lot of money. Uh, Mayor Thompson, I look to you as well, and maybe the other councillors. Are, are you are you not able to to maybe fundraise the uh, the additional twelve hundred dollars rather than you know this coming to to the region? Mr. Chair, may I address that? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Councillor Pileshi, I've raised about $80,000 towards this project as well uh, already. It is a project, probably it's about a million dollar donation to our community. So asking for $1,200 to waive this hookup fee, I, I really don't see an issue with it. I've had conversations with staff. Um, in fact, the motion I've uh, I drafted that motion with the assistance of our staff. If you read the motion, you will see that we are asking also for staff to um, come back with something on how we deal with this in the future, should this be, um, should this come before us, whether it's from the city of Brampton or Mississauga. So um, the, the, um, the Bocce Court, it's already behind schedule. And I know that the seniors um, they're asking whether they should be registering in Brampton to play in your indoor facility, um, or is this going to be ready? So I'm just trying to get this facility uh, ready so that the seniors don't have to drive over to Brampton in the dark or in, this, in, in the wintertime and put there and risk safety. So it, again, it's $1,200. Um, staff is going to be coming back and addressing this if, if should the need arise in the future from other municipalities. Yeah, and for sure, Councillor Rosen, and, and I absolutely respect what you're doing for for your community. Um, you're right; it is only twelve hundred dollars that um, your community is going to benefit from. Is this a uh, is this like a, a private club, or can anybody um, 
come and play bocce ball there. I love playing bocce ball. So oh, can... Councillor Pileshi, you're more than welcome to come. And they're looking for young folks to join, actually, because they're all seniors and they want to have, they want to recruit some younger folks. <laughs> Very good. Um, so, so it is it is open to the public. Then anybody can come and 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 play. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, so, just going back and 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 I understand again, and um, I, I I don't want to be the person that's throwing any negative on something great that a councillor is doing in their area. I'm just trying to look at the bigger picture here at the region, at the municipalities, we do a lot of stuff for community members, community groups, um, you know, and, and sometimes we do bring it up to the region to kind of check the waters, see what's happening, see if we can get anything. Typically the region are the ones that all collectively, um, we kind of say, no, we're not going to get into that as of as of right now. You know, in terms of sometimes we we look at waiving DC charges or or the bigger the bigger uh, ticket items, but this to me says um, it it starts that it it opens the door it, it starts you know the potential for other community groups now to come to the region to look at other opportunities. Um, and it could be a, a water service here, a, a new pipe here, a, a connection, uh, something in terms of, you know, when, when community groups come together. So um, I, I don't know if this is the time, given the, the, the world we live in right now, it's only $1,200. If, if, it was, if it was me, and I'm not telling you what to do, but if it was me, I would ask you know, maybe my municipality to to support the twelve hundred dollars, or or you've raised so much money so far, uh, eighty thousand eighty thousand dollars. That's a huge number. Congratulations, Councillor Groves. Maybe the twelve hundred dollars is something that you can just go back to and see if you can you can raise rather than us starting something that we don't know what it's going to look like down the road when other community groups are now going to come to each councillor and, and, uh, and we're all going to have to, uh, or some may want to come back to the region to ask for, for any kind of relief. So, um, so maybe Andrew, in your, the indication of you uh, going back to look at maybe the other opportunities or, or what have we done in the past, the referral back to staff for, for something to come forward is something that I would put on the floor, um, Mr. Chair, if there are more speakers. And there are, but Andrew's on my list perhaps for some more clarity. Commissioner Farr? Um, I, I'm okay, I, I can uh, wait till the end of the speakers. I was going to reiterate what Councilor Palashi just said. Thank you, Councilor Sato. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have some of the same concerns that Councilor Palashi just raised. And, you know, just earlier today, we deferred the, um, the rebate for people getting rid of rats in their community to get more information. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not something we have done before, but uh, a question to, uh, to the Caledon, uh, to the councillor, I guess it would be Councillor Groves. Is this a town owned facility and operated by the town? Um, Councillor Sado, yes, it is. It's a public-private partnership. Um, we have a donor from the community. It is built on town-owned land and will be turned over to the town of Caledon. Um, and it will be, the programs will be um, run and scheduled by staff at the town. Okay, so every every recreational facility that we have built in the city of Mississauga, it doesn't matter what it is, um, the city of Mississauga has paid for all hookup fees. Um, it, it's, I don't think we've ever come to the region, um, at least not in my recollection. I think what Andrew just said, not in his either, um, asking for fees that the town would normally be required to pay for a city or town owned facility uh, to be waived. And, you know, I, I, t I tend to agree that, you know, we could get in line and uh, we have a few facilities being built that we're going to be paying a lot of money for hookups to regional water and, uh, and other services that, um, you know, are just, uh, just as worthy. They may not be as much. Um, 
I, I'm going to suggest that we do wait for Andrew to come back on the 8th with more information, but also that the payment of the fee be deferred until we've had an opportunity to um, to move ahead on this so that, um, you know, I think if they need to get the hookup done, we could uh, do what we've done through COVID and just delay the payment without interest. But, um, and then if council decides to waive the payment, that's one thing, but I don't think they should count on it, but at least being waived. And I have another suggestion that I would like to make to council, which again, maybe we need to discuss it at our policies and procedures committee, although it's not quite in the same category, and that's with the expense accounts of regional councillors. In the city of Mississauga, we are allowed to use our expenses for community benefits up to a certain amount. So if we wish to donate an amount of money to an organization, I think it's, I think the max is $500. But if I wanted to donate $500 to an organization to help them either build a facility or pay for services such as this, um, I could do so out of my expense account. Um, if we put that same policy, amended our expense policy at the region to enable members of council to use their expenses over the term of office for that type of use as well, um, then our, you know, any of us that we're facing with the same thing could use those funds to assist the community rather than coming back and having something waived that, quite frankly, is going to set a precedent. We all know that. There will be a lot of other requests. We've turned down a lot of requests from various organizations for waiving fees over the years at council. So, um, I, and, and I'm kind of concerned of the fact that the town owns the building and, you know, we'll, we'll get this and they're asking the region to waive a fee when we've never done it for any other, any of the other municipal recreational facilities. So I can't support it today. Um, I would ask that Andrew bring some more information back and I, and I think you're going to find that we've never done it before, that we've all paid our bills <laughs> and I'm sure our municipal staff could, uh, could list the hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees from both Mississauga and Brampton that have been paid in. But also I would ask um, if direction be given to staff to, um, to maybe bring back something on the expense accounts that would, uh, would look at an amendment. It's not, it does, as I said, doesn't really fall under policies and proceed, well, might fall under policies. So maybe it should be referred to that committee and we can deal with it at the next meeting, Councillor Parish but I, I think it's something we should look into. Thank you, Councillor Parrish, you're next on my list. I'd like to call the vote. A motion to call the question, Madam Clerk. Uh, if I may, Councillor, but the only other speaker was Commissioner Farr. I don't know if he had a clarifying point. No, I'm calling you know, the vote. Fair enough. I'm never getting those 10 minutes back. Yeah, th thank you, <laughs> and, and rightly so. Madam Clerk, over to you. Okay, so this is the uh, motion to call the vote on agenda item. And, and actually, just maybe just to clarify, or is it to call the vote on the referral or on the actual motion? On the motion, okay. Sorry, uh, no, no. Chair, no. I think it was Sorry. referred. Yeah, it yes. was referred. And I don't think you need okay. to call a vote on calling the question because I don't think there's any more speakers, okay. but I leave that up to you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Councillor Parrish, how do you wish to deal with it? If I really tell you yeah, how I'd I... like to deal with it, I'll be thrown out of the chamber for bad language. Um, I will vote opposed to the referral, and then we will put the motion on the floor. Madam Clerk, over to you. So we're going to do the... the referral is what's on the floor, and we need a vote that you're going to conduct on the motion to refer it back to staff. Motion to refer does, is, does not require a recorded vote, right. so we would ask if there's any objections. Um, because I, it hears, I hear that there may be some, what I'm going to do is call the list. Exactly. <laughs> Mayor Brown. No. Councillor Carlson. No. Mayor Crombie. 
I support the original motion, so I guess I, I'm against the referral. Okay. Councilor DeMurla? Councilor DeMurla? Councilor Dasco? I'll support the referral. Councilor Dillon is not uh, in the meeting. Councilor Downley? In support of referral. Councilor Fonseca? I'll support the referral. Councilor Fortini? I'm not gonna support the referral. Councillor Groves? Not in support of the referral. Councillor Ennis? Support the referral. Councillor Kovac? Not support. Councillor Mahoney? I support referral. And Councillor McFadden had to leave the meeting. Councillor Medeiros? Not support the referral. Councillor Pileshi. Yes. In uh, favor? John Bill Ford. Yeah. So um, that was actually included in Schedule 3. Um, Councillor Parrish. Like Thank you. you. Just to ensure everybody's got their mics muted because I'm getting background noise. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Raz? Uh, yes. Thank you. Councillor Sato? Yes, I support the referral. Councillor Santos? No. Councillor Sinclair? No. Councillor Starr? Yes. Mayor Thompson? No. Councillor Vicente? No. Just one moment to total the votes. Heard. So the no's have it, so the motion to refer fails. So it has not been referred back, but do I still have to deal with the motion itself now that can be put, of course. Okay, do I have a mover and a seconder for that motion? Councillor Groves? Yes, and Mayor Thompson. Chair. And Mayor Thompson was seconding that. So it's duly before me as moved by Councillor Groves and Mayor Thompson. Madam Clerk, to conduct the vote over to you. Uh, since the motion's up, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to say just a quick comment. Um, I'll allow, um, we called the vote on, yeah, I, I'm going to rule that, that we've had our, our, our say on it, and the, the vote's been called, and I'm going to leave it at that. The vote was on the referral? I'm, I'm going to rule that, um, that we've exhausted all our discussion, and I'm going to go to the vote. Because Councillor Parrish is in the chambers, and she said she, does, she wants to be done with it, Mr. Uh, Chair? No, I just think we've had an exhaustive conversation on it, and I'm satisfied that all sides have been heard. That's my ruling. Madam Clerk, over to you. Thank you. The motion before Council, whereas a new indoor bocce court is being constructed in Potts Park at 125 uh, Pembroke Street in Caledon as a community initiative funded by donations. And whereas the Region of Peel's current user fee bylaw requires a fee of 1000 $235 be paid by the applicant for the installation of a new 38 millimeter water meter, the Potts Park installation fee. And staff does not have the authority to waive this fee. And whereas the indoor bocce court is a neighborhood led project that will create additional recreational opportunities for residents of all ages that will have community benefits in terms of physical health and mental well being. And whereas regional council has determined that not requiring payment of the POTS installation fee is an appropriate measure supportive of the public interest in enhancing the availability of a recreational facility in that public park through a community initiative. Therefore, be it resolved that the payment of the POTS park installation fee of $1,235 
for water meter installation not be required or collected for the indoor bocce court being constructed at 125 Pembrook, Pembroke Street, and further that staff be directed to further investigate the implications of amending the regional user fee bylaw to eliminate or reduce service connection fees for neighborhood-led projects and community benefits in terms of the health, mental well-being, provision of recreational opportunities for the community. And further, that staff report back to Regional Council with the results of the investigation, along with updates to the Development Services Fee Review in 2022, ahead of amending the 2023 Regional User Fees Bylaw. Now I'm going to call the vote. Do you need two thirds to reopen the bylaw? No, we're not reopening the question. The referral was defeated and the matters before us first go around. Madam okay. Clerk. Right. Mayor Brown. Yes. Mayor Brown in favor. Councillor Carlson. Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie. Yes. Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor DeMurla. Councillor DeMurla. Councillor Dasko? No. Sorry, I could not hear. Uh, can you repeat, please, da Councillor Dasko? Certainly. It's a uh, no. No. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Dillon is not here. Councillor Downey? In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca? Yes, in favor. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini? Yes, in favor. Councillor Fortini in favor. Councillor Groves? Councillor yes, Groves? In Council yes, in favor. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes? Yes, in favor. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac? Yes. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney? No. Councillor Mahoney opposed. Uh, Councillor McFadden has left the meeting. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi? No. Councillor Pileshi opposed. Councillor Parrish? Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz? Yes. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato? No. Councillor Sato opposed. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair? Yes. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr? Yes. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson? Yes. Mayor Thompson in favor. favor. Councillor Vicente? Yes. Councillor Vicente in favor. And the motion carries. Okay, thank you. That brings me back to 21 other business and councillor inquiries. Councillor Dasko. Thank you through the chair. I just had a question from some residents with regards to uh, Dixie Road. The uh, railway underpass uh, was going through some rehabilitation work. Uh, it seems to have either stopped or it's hit some kind of impasse, but it's quite dangerous. And I'm just wondering if we could get uh, an update on what the status of that bridge repair is, especially with um, the inclement weather right around the corner. If I could ask that of, uh, of Commissioner Farr. Andrew. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your question, Councillor Dasko, and, and through the chair. Um, so that, that project there is correct. We are rehabilitating the sidewalks and the, some of the uh, slopes around the CN tracks, uh, Dixie, just north of Lakeshore. Um, the work that you have seen ongoing of late is the relocation of uh, an Enbridge gas line. Um, they are completed the work. What they're not completed is the uh, temporary restoration they're supposed to go through. We are pursuing them quite heavily, and what I can commit to you is if they are not um, moving by this time next week, we will go in and complete the work ourselves and uh, charge them back. And uh, then you will see now that we know what is in the ground and what we've moved, we will be pursuing with uh, tendering the final um, work like we've discussed with you that'll take place over the next year or so as we rebuild both sides of that road. Thank you very, very much. Very good. Any other inquiries uh, from members of council? Councillor Sato, I see your hand. Please proceed. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and sorry, I wasn't going to ask this, but Councillor Daskell kind of put it into my head. Um, when the region, or sorry, when MTO is doing work on um, that impacts a regional road access, um, it, it was brought to my attention that the region has no control over um, closures, blocking sidewalks, closing lanes, et cetera. Um, this is a situation where it's for the widening of the 401 and uh, they're rebuilding the bridge over Derry Road. And I knew that there were going to be lane closures for up to a two year period of time. But uh, then I found out that uh, MTO contractors had closed the sidewalk. So residents, and there's only one, <laughs> and residents couldn't get to the business park. Um, now they, they did manage, we did manage to get it open, but it was closed for some time. But what concerned me was the response from staff that we have no control over um, what the province does or what MTO, I guess it would be, does in situations like this. So I'm really concerned about that going forward that, um, you know, we, we should have a lot more say. And it almost sounded as if staff hadn't, well, I know staff had not checked to ensure that access was maintained. So Andrew, could you maybe comment on that for me? Uh, thanks for your question, Councillor Sato, and through the chair. Um, I'll admit I'm not familiar with that particular issue, but uh, I'm glad you brought it to our attention and brought it up today, because that sounds um, like not a result we're looking for. So no. I'd be happy. <laughs> no, and I'm, and I'm trying to be uh, a little bit less dramatic than I want to be. Um, but certainly let me take that offline with you, and I'd be happy to discuss a little bit further and get a little bit more info so we can work on it. Okay, I just want to be assured because it, it took, um, and, and I, I staff got onto it right away once it was brought to my attention, but, um, you know, I had people tweeting about the fact that, uh, that the sidewalk was closed. I didn't know. And then staff had said, well, we can't do anything about it initially because it's MTO. Um, but then they did go and contact MTO and the contractor. And, but it still took a couple of days before we got that uh, sidewalk opened meantime people couldn't get to work and the detour for traffic was um around the block all the way over to Aaron Mills Parkway and you know it probably would have been a one hour walk because there's no other access route so um I just want to make sure going forward that regional staff double check when there's projects that someone else is doing that they double check and confirm that access for pedestrians uh, cyclists and traffic is maintained at all times. Yeah, Thank you. So certainly, uh, while we may not have ultimate control over what right. they do, we can certainly, uh, it sounds like we can do a better job on influencing what they do and making sure we are uh, doing our best to make sure they respect um, the needs of our road going public as well. So thanks for bringing it up. Well, I, I, I guess too, part of my concern is that, you know, we can't require them to continue pedestrian access. And that really bothered me, you know, that, that we could not require an access for pedestrians to be maintained for, uh, you know, and this is a two year project. It's not like they were closed overnight or for a weekend. Um, and this goes, you know, this in particular case goes into my major business park, but even if it didn't, people still have to have to get places and, you know, someone in a wheelchair couldn't get along through there, you know, so maintaining the access, I don't think is optional. And so I would like to see us as a region, um, you know, really, really stress more that we, we need to have that authority. I don't care if it's MTO or the federal government, whatever, you know, they, they can't come in and do that. <laughs> Agreed. Okay. So we'll, we'll, uh, I'll take it offline and we'll uh, have a further discussion on that. Thank you. If there are no other councillor inquiries, Madam Clerk, that brings me down to the bylaws over to you. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Kovac, seconded by Councillor Sinclair, that the bylaws listed on the September 10th, 2020 Regional Council agenda, being bylaws 19, 2020, and 15, 57, 2020, be given the required number of readings, taken as read, signed by the Regional Chair and the Deputy Regional Clerk, and the corporate seal be affixed thereto. Are there any objections? If there are no, there are no objections, objections, that is carried. Right, hearing none, it, it carries. Thank you. 
Okay, and with that, we're down to in camera. One matter, 24.4, proposed property acquisition in the city of Brampton, town of Caledon, and city of Mississauga. And Madam Clerk, over to you to properly take us into in camera. Councillor Carlson, do I see your name on my on this, on this matter? Very good. So we'll wait till we're properly into camera. Madam Clerk and the team, if you can properly have us behind closed doors. Okay. I have a motion moved by Councillor Carlson and seconded by Councillor Santos that council proceed in camera to consider reports related to the following. Propose, proposed property acquisition in the city of Brampton, town of Caledon, and city of Mississauga. A proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. I'm just gonna give staff a few minutes. Yep. Next item. Uh, the next item is to extend the curfew. Do you want to yes. I've already asked, but to formalize the fact that under section 4.212 of the procedure bylaw 56 2019 as amended be waived in order that the September 10 2020 regional council meeting continue past 3:30 something that was acknowledged at 3:30 moved by Pelleshi and Downey all those in favor seeing none opposed that is carried okay all right so the next item uh, agenda item 24.4 moved by councilor Sinclair seconded by councilor Dasco that the Direction given in camera to the interim commissioner of public works and the interim commissioner of corporate services related to item 24.4 on the September 10th, 2020 regional council agenda be approved and voted upon in accordance with section 239 6B of the municipal act 2001 as amended. And this does require recorded vote. Mayor Brown. No, Mayor Brown uh, was going to step out for a few minutes. Uh, back. Councillor Carlson. Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Uh, Mayor Crombie has left the meeting. Councillor uh, Demerla. Councillor Demerla. Councillor Dasco. Yes. Councillor Dasco in favor. Uh, Councillor Dillon had to leave. Councillor uh, Downey. In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca. Yes, in favor. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini. Yes, in favor. Councillor Fortini in favor. Councillor Groves. Yes. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes. Yes. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac. In favor. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney. Councillor Mahoney. Councillor McFadden had to leave. Councillor Medeiros. Councillor Medeiros. Councillor Pileshi. Yes, in favor. Councillor Pileshi in favor. Councillor Parrish. Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz. In favor. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair? In favor. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr? In favor. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson? In favor, and I'm going to have to leave in another minute. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente? Yes. Councillor Vicente in favor, and that passes. Sorry, uh, I, I, Councillor Fortini, Martin texted me, lost connection, he's in favor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Pass accordingly. The next matter before me is a motion moved by Councillor DeMerrill, seconded by Councillor Starr, that bylaw 58 2020 to confirm the proceedings of regional council at its meeting held September 10, 2020, and to authorize the execution of documents in accordance with the region appeal bylaws relating thereto, be given the required number of readings taken as read, signed by the regional chair and the deputy regional clerk, and the corporate seal be affixed thereto. All those in favor? Uh, Any oh, opposed? Mr. Chair, I don't think Councillor DeMerrill is on the meeting, so she can't oh, move my that apologies. Motion. Moved by Councillor Raz. Thanks. And seconded by Councillor Starr. All those in favor any opposed that is carried and now I need a motion to adjourn from Councillor Kovac oh sorry that the September 10 regional council meeting be adjourned moved by Councillor Kovac seconded by Councillor Pelleshi all those in favor any opposed carried thank you to all